Hello to all you Franco-Prussian War history buffs out there. I just wanted to let you know that we're going to be publishing a companion book based on our YouTube documentary, Glory and Defeat, about the Franco-Prussian War. It's going to include all the bonus content that was not in the YouTube series, and you can order it by clicking on the link below. It's July 1870, and in Europe, there's been no great power war since 1815. But now, the growing rivalry between the French Empire and the German Kingdom of Prussia is set to explode. And all it will take is one telegram. Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander, and welcome to Glory and Defeat, the story of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. In July 1870, Prussian Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck has dreams of a united Germany under Prussian leadership. Prussia already dominates the northern German states in the North German Confederation. But to bind the southern states to Prussia, he needs another war. And he has the largest army in Europe to fight it with. French Emperor Napoleon III and Empress Eugenie also have dreams of a glorious French empire. But the rise of Prussia in recent years is a threat to France's position. Continued French dominance in Europe and a Germany united under Prussia. To achieve these dreams of glory would also mean risking defeat. All the two sides need is an excuse to fight. And as strange as it may seem, the crisis that starts the Franco-Prussian War begins in Spain. The Spanish throne has been unoccupied since the 1868 revolution deposed Queen Isabella II. After much debate, the new Spanish government chose Leopold von Hohenzollern Sigmaringen to be their new king. Leopold belongs to a branch of the Prussian ruling house of Hohenzollern, but he isn't a Prussian, and he only accepts the Spanish throne after three separate offers. Bismarck is delighted. But when the news arrives in Paris on July 3, 1870, it's so explosive, it's dubbed the Spanish Bomb. For Empress Eugenie, Prime Minister Émile Olivier, and Foreign Minister the Duc de Gramont, it's unacceptable that the Prussian royal house might also rule Spain. Gramont, though, senses a win-win opportunity. He reasons that Prussia can be humiliated and forced to back down, or there will be a war which France will win. Gramont makes his case in a fiery speech to the French Parliament. We do not believe that respect for a neighboring people's rights obliges us to suffer that a foreign power, by placing one of the princes on the Spanish throne, can disturb the current equilibrium of the forces in Europe to our detriment, and put in danger the interests and the honor of France. Gramont also sends Ambassador Count Vincent Benedetti to Bat Ems, where Prussian King Wilhelm I was spending his holiday. Benedetti demands that Prussia force Leopold to refuse the Spanish offer, which outrages Wilhelm. He doesn't recognize Gramont's ploy and blames Bismarck for the crisis. The king does ask Leopold's father, Karl Anton, to renounce his son's candidacy on his behalf, which he does. But Gramont is still not satisfied, and now insists on a declaration that no Hohenzollern will ever claim the Spanish throne again. On July 13th, in a serious breach of courtly protocol, Count Benedetti approaches King Wilhelm on the spa promenade and relays the new demand. Wilhelm refuses to make the declaration and asks his advisor to inform Bismarck about the events in Bad Ems by telegram. This message to Bismarck is the original Emsa de Peche, the Ems Dispatch. Bismarck now sees his chance to provoke war with France. He modifies the dispatch's wording to make it seem as though King Wilhelm had disrespected the French ambassador, and has it sent to all Prussian diplomats. His Majesty the King then refused to receive the French envoy again, and informed him through an adjutant 
that His Majesty had nothing further to say to the Ambassador. The provocative Ems dispatch, as manipulated by Bismarck, reaches French newspapers on July 14th, of all days, the French national holiday, and it works exactly as Bismarck intended. The Ems dispatch shocks the French government of Emperor Napoleon III. The Council of Ministers meets on the 14th, and Gramont is forced to justify the demands that he made of the Prussians, since the Council had never approved them. The ministers are divided, but eventually accept the Emperor's proposal for an international conference to resolve the crisis and avoid a war. But Empress Eugénie and War Minister Edmond Leboeuf then pressure Napoleon III to scrap the conference and mobilize the army and he gives in. This is an informal declaration of war against Prussia. The next day, the French Parliament meets. After fierce debate, members resolve that war will be declared and vote for war credits. The mood amongst many Frenchmen was heated, as Private Serpollet describes. Everyone here is fired up. All are shouting, Prussia, Prussia, Yesterday, the band played La Marseillaise. Everyone was jumping in spite of the 60 pounds we had on our backs. I wish you could be here when a new dispatch arrives. We don't hear each other. We all run to the weapons rack. We overturn the beds. We fight. We roll. The sergeants want to intervene, but we slam the door in their faces. Discipline is relaxed. We no longer see so many punishments. When you talk to the French soldier about war, he wants to massacre everything. Le soldat français, quand on lui parle de guerre, veut tout massacrer. Prussian writer Théodore Fontana isn't in Paris, but he later records what he'd heard. Countless bands, some more than a thousand strong, marched through the streets, often led by soldiers and preceded by the tricolore flag. They constantly shouted, long live the war, down with Bismarck. Thousands more joined them, applauded, or sang along to the Marseillaise. The police let everything go. Then torches appeared, and others lit street brooms on fire. The drunks swung and hurled them into the trees, so that some began to burn along the boulevard. Then they went home at dawn. France is about to declare war on Prussia, and the press and many Frenchmen are infected with war fever. These developments are also being reported in the German press, and Prussia and its allies are ready to react. On the 15th, King Wilhelm I leaves Bad Ems to deal with the crisis from Berlin. Crowds of Berliners cheer his carriage from the station to his palace, and in the streets, thousands more sing patriotic songs like the Wacht am Rhein and the Preussenlied. The night of July 16th, Prussia and Bavaria mobilize their armies. On the 17th, in the Bavarian capital of Munich, 30,000 people gather to cheer King Ludwig II, and the state parliament meets on the 18th. The debate is lively. Some members support going to war under the defensive alliance with Prussia, while others want Bavaria to only maintain armed neutrality. Some Bavarian lawmakers oppose joining the war because they're worried about the safety of the Palatinate region, which borders France. Pastor and parliamentarian Anton Westermeyer shares those fears. Die spanische Thronfolge habe mit Deutschland nichts zu schaffen. The Spanish throne question has nothing to do with Germany. It's merely a question of dynastic interests. Both sides made mistakes, and now peoples must bleed for the sensitivities of their princes. I do not want the Palatines to suffer the horrors of war. But if a thief gets into the neighbor's house, I must lock up my own house and cannot bring help to the neighbor. 
When the dust settles, Bavaria has voted for war, and King Ludwig telegraphs the decision to the Prussian king in Berlin. The southern kingdom of Württemberg is also less than enthusiastic. Its leaders fear the Prussification of the kingdom and endangering their good relations with neighboring France, but they mobilize anyway. The Grand Duchy of Baden also borders France, but has good relations with Prussia. If there's war, only Prussia can protect Baden, so the Grand Duchy mobilizes. Once the Grand Duchy of Hesse mobilizes, Prussian King Wilhelm I is now in command of an entire German army, and there is still no official declaration of war. This week, the famous Ems dispatch has given those who wanted war in France and in Prussia the honorable excuse that they need. The French war party rallies around Empress Eugenie, who also wants to preserve the throne of her ailing husband for her son. Bismarck plans to use the coming war to unite Germany under Prussia. And unlike the failed revolution of 1848, Germany is to be created not by the people, but by princes and generals. In his eyes, North and South Germans are now marching together against their old enemy to create a new Prussian Empire. The fact that Napoleon III and King Wilhelm I hadn't actually wanted war was now irrelevant. And next week, the Franco-Prussian War will officially begin. On July 19, 1870, the North German Confederation's parliament meets in Berlin for an emergency session about the imminent war. King Wilhelm I opens the session with defiance. Following the example of our fathers, we will fight for our freedom and for our righteousness against the violence of foreign conquerors. And in this struggle, in which we pursue no other goal than to permanently secure the peace of Europe, God will be with us as he was with our fathers. At 2 p.m. the French declaration of war arrives. The Imperial French government accuses Prussia of trying to upset the balance of power in Europe by putting one of its own on the Spanish throne, and of insulting its honor with the Ems dispatch. The result is war. Consequently, the French government considered itself obligated to provide, without delay, for the defense of its honor and its injured interests. Determined for this final purpose to take all the measures offered to it by the situation created, it considers itself from now on to be in a state of war with Prussia, en état de guerre avec la Prusse. The declaration of war is announced to Parliament after the King finishes speaking. Emotions are running high in Prussia, not least because July 19th is the 60th anniversary of the death of King Wilhelm's mother Louise, who enjoys cult-like reverence in the Kingdom. The next day, Parliament responds with an impassioned message to the King. We trust in God who punishes bloody outrages. From the shores of the sea to the foot of the Alps, the people have risen up at the unanimous call of their princes. No sacrifice is too great for them. The public voice of the civilized world recognizes the justice of our cause. The German people will finally achieve the peaceful and free unification valued by all peoples at the place of its choosing. Your Majesty and the allied German governments may consider us and our brothers in the South ready. Our honor and our freedom are at stake. Es gilt unsere Ehre und unsere Freiheit. King Wilhelm I is less enthusiastic about war than his own parliament. Despite his age, he'd only ever fought two wars and did not want this one now and he belatedly recognizes how Bismarck and the Duc de Gramont each had their own agendas for bringing it about. Prussian Karl Marx also takes a more sober view of events than many of his countrymen who are caught up in the war frenzy. He wants a Prussian victory, but for reasons different than those of many other Prussians. 
Die Franzosen brauchen Prügel. The French need a beating. If the Prussians win, the centralization of state power will be useful to the centralization of the German working class. The German preponderance will also shift the center of gravity of the West European working class movement from France to Germany. And the German working class is theoretically and organizationally superior to the French. The die has been cast and the Franco-Prussian war has begun. The princes of the German states prepare to defend their national honor, and Emperor Napoleon III prepares to defend that of France. The French Empire is also preparing for the start of the fighting. On July 23rd, Napoleon III issues a dramatic proclamation to the nation. There are solemn moments in the life of a people when national honor, violently aroused, imposes itself as an irresistible force, dominates all interests, and takes in hand the direction of the destiny of la patrie. We are not making war on Germany, whose independence we respect. We wish that the peoples who make up the great Germanic nationality freely determine their destinies. As for us, we demand the establishment of a state of affairs which guarantees our security and assures the future. The French authorities see their cause as just and are trying to win over the other European powers. But public opinion has turned against France, which doesn't have any allies. In 1868 and 1869, there had been talks with Italy and Austria about potential alliances, but no treaty has been signed in 1870. Napoleon III does have letters from Austrian Emperor Franz Josef and Italian King Vittorio Emanuele II in which they promise not to negotiate with third parties without French consent. The French Emperor sees these letters as an expression of moral obligation to help France in case of war, but the governments in Vienna and the Italian capital of Florence disagree. Serious talks do take place in July 1870 between France, Italy and Austria-Hungary, and they don't go well. The Italians demand passage through Austria to attack Bavaria, but the Austrians refuse. If it enters the war, Italy also wants France to end its protection of independent Rome and the Pope, so that Italy can annex the city and make it into the country's capital. But the Church is a pillar of support for the Second Empire, so the French aren't in a hurry to abandon the papacy. Plus, the French feel that Italy still owes them for French assistance in the Sardinian War of 1859, so they won't make the Rome deal the way that the Italians want it. Austria-Hungary is hesitant about fighting on the French side for a few reasons. The government is worried about the many German speakers in the empire who are sympathetic to the so-called German cause against France. The Austro-Hungarians also fear that if they intervene, Russia might come in on the Prussian side. This is not actually so far-fetched, since King Wilhelm is the Tsar's uncle. Russia might also decide to join Prussia because the Prussians offered to help the Tsar against Polish rebels back in 1863. As for the United Kingdom, they stay out of the war as well. Relations with France have been strained since they fought together in the Crimean War, and Queen Victoria is the mother-in-law of the Prussian Crown Prince. France does make a very ambitious plan with Denmark, which lost the war to Prussia and its allies in 1864. The idea is for a French expeditionary force to land on the North German coast or in Denmark and advance into the North German Confederation alongside the weaker Danish army. But this plan also falls through after Britain and Russia pressure the Danes to remain neutral. France is now fighting the largest army in Europe alone. While the French are canvassing Europe for allies but finding none, the mobilizations which started even before the declaration of war are bringing troops to the battle zones. Both the French and the German armies feel prepared for war, but one is much larger. 
The Germans are moving about 460,000 men to the front, while the French figure is about 300,000. Before the main forces reach the battlefields, skirmishes are already breaking out along the border. Mostly these are cavalry reconnaissance patrols, and they usually don't get far. On the 19th, French chasseurs d'Afrique cross the Prussian border at Saarbrücken and capture some customs officers. The same day, the Prussians also take their first prisoner, a Zouave who had allegedly fallen asleep over white wine in an inn on the German side. The first official deaths of the war come on the 24th. A squadron of Baden Dragoon officers led by Württemberg General Staff Officer and later airship inventor Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin runs into French troops at Schielenhof. Claude Ferréol Pagnier, quartermaster in the 12th Mounted Chasseur, and William Herbert Winslow, a lieutenant in the 3rd Baden Dragoons, are both killed, the first men to die in this war though it's possible that a few French soldiers have already been killed. 27-year-old Winslow is from Scotland, ironically making a British native the first fallen German. This week, the French declare war on Prussia, but fail to find any allies. There's nationalist rhetoric on both sides, and the Franco-Prussian War claims its first lives. Those two men have died because the diplomats, generals, and politicians have allowed themselves to rush into war. These elites have used emotional terms like nation and honor to stir the passions of the people and manipulate the press. At this point, the storm they've unleashed is beyond control of even Napoleon III and Wilhelm I. And next week, the storm will only grow stronger. On the German side, mobilization is going well. Thanks to precisely timed train schedules, the German armies reach their starting positions less than two weeks after mobilization began. A Russian observer views this German efficiency with a bit of sarcasm. Even the ox destined for slaughter seems to know in advance in which cooking vessel it will end up. Some men do in fact die of heat stroke on the march. Huge logistic centers supply the gathering German armies with the food, fodder, weapons and other supplies that they need. 518,000 men and 2,000 guns assemble into three armies. General Steinmetz's first army around Trier and Prince Friedrich Karl of Prussia's second army near Mainz are made up of troops from the North German Confederation. Third Army, called the German Army, concentrates around Speyer and includes units from Prussia, Bavaria, Württemberg and Baden, all under the command of Prussian Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm. French mobilization is not going well. Some regular units have to travel from their garrison town to their bases at the other end of the country, or even Algeria, before heading to eastern France. Other units are rushed to the concentration areas before they've been brought up to strength and fully kitted out. The result is chaos, as General Alexandre Michel reports when he arrives in Belfort. Didn't find my brigade didn't find the divisional commander. What shall I do? The French plan is to supply their armies from prepared depots close to the expected combat zone. Minister of War Edmond Leboeuf has even stated, the army is so ready that we don't even have to buy a single gator button. But now the chickens of the corrupt system of the Second Empire come home to roost. Incompetent and unscrupulous officials have lined their own pockets instead of filling the depots. And there are serious shortages of food, equipment and even ammunition. French generals send desperate telegrams to Paris, but there's not much that can be done now. In the midst of this mess, the French Army of the Rhine, totaling some 300,000 men and 3,000 guns, takes shape. 
one wing in northern Alsace under Marshal François Achille Bazin, and one along the border with the Bavarian Palatinate under Marshal Patrice de MacMahon. Both commanders are experienced and decorated veterans of the campaigns in Italy and North Africa. The armies of France and the German states now face each other in tense anticipation of the decisive confrontation. But before the main battles begin, let's take a look at how war is waged in 1870. The Franco-Prussian War is a conflict of the Industrial Age, the age of the first mass military forces. So let's talk about how those forces are organized. The largest formation is an army, which numbers up to about 150,000 men. These armies are further subdivided to allow commanders to move them and use them more efficiently in battle. An army consists of up to four corps. Corps are made up of divisions, and divisions are formed from brigades. Armies, corps, divisions, and brigades are commanded by generals. Brigades are then divided into regiments, each of which is commanded by a colonel. Prussian infantry regiments have about 2,900 men, and French régiments de ligne have about 2,500. A regiment has three or four battalions, and each battalion is commanded by a lieutenant colonel and has three or four companies under a captain. Each company is divided into platoons under a lieutenant. During the actual fighting, orders are usually given to the men at the regimental or at the battalion level, so these levels are quite important from a soldier's point of view. Below the regiment, subunits might be different amongst the different branches of the service. For example, the infantry have companies, but the cavalry have squadrons, and the artillery have batteries. On the German side, there are also infantry regiments of musketeers, grenadiers, and fusiliers, but these are just traditional designations. French marines are an elite ground unit. Chasseurs are light infantrymen, and the Zouaves and Turcot are colonial troops, mostly from North Africa. Both sides also have elite guards units. One major difference is that the German army is made up of conscripts, led by professional officers, while the smaller French army is nearly all professional soldiers. Napoleon III had urged the creation of a mobile guard of conscripts since 1868, but the Loi Niel hasn't been passed by Parliament. The Germans, therefore, have a significantly larger pool of trained manpower than the French, now and for the foreseeable future. These massive armies that take to the battlefield in 1870 are also armed with the latest technical advances in weaponry, thanks to industrialization. Arms manufacturers like Schneider Creusot and the Krupp Works have equipped the French and German armies with mass-produced weapons of unprecedented killing power, especially needle guns and artillery. It's the infantry that will do the bulk of the fighting and the dying in this war, and they're particularly exposed to danger when fighting in the open or in urban areas. Their modern breech-loading needle guns have moved tactics away from the lines of the 18th century. The guns can be loaded lying down or kneeling rather than standing up, which allows troops to make better use of natural features or buildings. The Prussian Dreise rifle had helped win the war against Austria back in 1866, but in 1870 the French Chassepot outclasses it in range and accuracy. Hello folks, this is Captain Wolf from Hungary, in beautiful, bright, Hanglish language, your favorite gun channel on YouTube. I have two interesting 19th century military rifles from you today, from the beginning of the breech-loading era. The one is a Prussian Dreiser rifle, it's a needle-fire rifle, and the other one is the French Chassepot rifle, which is also a needle-fire rifle.
Let's talk about the development of the two rifles. Nikolaus Dreyse started working on his breech-loading concept in the 1820s. He presented his first model to the Prussian Ministry of War in 1827. And after a long development and trial periods, in 1840 December, the ministry finally made the final decision and ordered 60,000 pieces, and they also offered Dreyse some funds to establish a factory for producing the new rifle. But most of the new rifles were stored in the arsenals in Berlin and Magdeburg. Magdeburg. They did not go to the units. And uh, the debut of this rifle was actually against the German people. In 1849, May 6 to 9, it was used against the rebels protesting against the government. The father of the French needle rifle was Antoine Alphonse Chaspeau. He was clearly inspired by the most modern army of its age, Moltke's Prussian army. He started working on the breech loading concept in the 1850s. Seeing the benefits of the bolt-action breach of the Dreiser, he copied and perfected the system. The Prussian performance in the War of 1864 and 66 proved the French that to counter the Prussian threat, the development of the infantry arm was inevitable. The breech loader concept was on trial for a long time here as well, and finally in the August of 1866, the new rifle entered service. Although a large production capacity supported the quick rearmament, it took nearly three years to change from muzzle loaders. Well, both rifles are needle firing breech loaders, however, it is easy to see that the Dreiser is, let's say, a transition from muzzle loader to breech loader, while the Chassepot is rather a transition towards the modern military rifle. The needle rifle system is an early breech loading system. The heart of the rifle is the needle, an early version of the firing pin that has to penetrate the cartridge case brought from paper to reach the priming compound integrated into the cartridge itself. Its rate of fire was two, three times more than the rate of fire of the muzzle loaders. And it could be comfortably loaded in kneeling or prone position on behind the cover as well, which was a great advantage. Here are some 50 meter range tests with the two cartridges made according to the original military specifications. I've been shooting these rifles for a long time now. And although I know that the Chassepot is superior I also know that the Dreiser can also hit a man-sized target up to two, three hundred meters. The Prussian army had the advantage of the long service time behind their rifles, while the French were just getting used to the new system. The Dreiser is a bit clumsy, but it is not especially complicated to operate. In fact, it needs much less training than a muzzle loader. The Chassepot is comfortable and surely feels stronger than the Prussian rifle. Action can be hard to close if some paper remains in the chamber, but it still works. I did not have any misfires with any of the rifles during my shooting tests. It was also interesting to see that nearly the entire paper casing of the cartridge left with the gases of the powder through the muzzle. The most important difference between the two rifles is the caliber itself. When Dreiser designed his rifle, the caliber of a standard infantry arm was between 17 to 18 millimeters, and they fired heavy lead round balls. This was his guideline in selecting the 15.4 millimeter caliber for his concept. The Chassepo has a clear advantage here. The caliber is only 11 millimeters, while the bullet was also lighter, resulting in better ballistics performance and a flatter trajectory. Let's talk a bit about external ballistics. The result of the small caliber and the lighter bullet was the increased range. First, the trajectory of the Chassepot rifle is much flatter, meaning that the ballistic curve of the bullet will cover a much larger portion of the battlefield, but also the maximum range is increased dramatically. A good proof of this are the sights on both rifles. The Chassepot sights are much taller. But to tell you the truth, this range is over-optimistic. By the time both rifles were accepted, the closed combat formations were still part of the manuals, so the military leaders were convinced that the rifles will be effective against columns, masses and squares at larger distances as well. But they were wrong. As from the 1866 war, each army is understood that the closed formations have to be broken up on the battlefield to avoid losses. The bayonet of the Chassepot rifle was also a quite modern design. 
The Yatagan was attached to the muzzle with a rail and a bayonet lock, much more advanced than the socket bayonet of the Dreiser rifles. The solution for gas sealing the action is also different. The original model 1841 Dreiser lacked any seals. The face of the bolt was cone-shaped that fitted to the breech and directed the gases away from the face of the shooter. This was later improved by rubber seals in later models, but it was never perfect. A good amount of gases always escaped at the joint of the breech and the bolt. The chassis was sealed with an ingenious solution. A rubber seal was compressed by the gas pressures, pushing back a piston that completely sealed the action. This rubber seal had to be replaced time by time, as by the use the rubber hardened and then it lost some gases. But with a fresh new rubber seal, this concept was completely gas tight. The heart of the needle rifle is the firing pin or needle. The Dreiser rifles seems to be long and fragile. It is really not how we imagine a firing pin of a modern military rifle to look like, and it is often repeated that this was the weak point of the Prussian rifle. I only partially agree with this. First, it takes much more to break this needle than what we think. The needle serving my rifle is now five or six years old, and it's okay, it did not break. Of course, it needs some proper care because the needle penetrates the powder container of the cartridge to reach the priming compound, therefore it is stressed by the burning gases. This is true, but it is very easy to replace and the soldiers always carried some spare needles in their backpacks. The needle of the chassepo is shorter and thicker. Well, this concept is much closer to the modern firing pin concept. And as the percussion cap is on the back of the chassepo cartridge, it is not penetrating into the burning chamber where the powder is exploding, so it will last much longer. Let's compare the two cartridges as well. Both cartridges are paper cartridges and both hold all the components of the charge like the black powder charge, the projectile and the primer as well. This is why we can call them self-contained cartridges. However, there's a great difference in the bullets. The Dreiser bullet has 13.6 mm diameter, it has a raindrop fall. It is called a long blade bullet and its weight is 33.2 grams. This bullet was much smaller than the bore, so it was inserted in a carton bed called the Spiegel, creating a sabo. So the bullet itself did not engage the rifling directly. Understanding the benefits of the smaller caliber bullets, in the spring of 1870, the transition to a smaller 12 mm 21 gram bullet started, but as large quantities of the old cartridges were on stock, both the actions in the wars of 1870 and 71. The carton weather Spiegel was the main reason for the long range inaccuracy of the Dreiser. The muzzle velocity of the long blade was around 300 meters per second, so it was very slow. The trajectory was highly curved. The bullet of the Chassepo rifle was a much better design. It was longer, it had a better ballistic form and engaged the rifling directly, resulting in increased accuracy. The muzzle velocity of the bullet was also higher. It was around 400 meters per second. However, the French cartridge itself is far more complicated than the Prussian. It needs nearly three, four times more to make one French cartridge compared to the Prussian cartridge. And it also needs much more components. There was a great difference in the terminal ballistics as well. In 1868, a French surgeon made experiments with exhumed human bodies to compare the wounds caused by the small caliber Chassepo and the larger caliber Dreiser bullets. The small caliber was under attack by many, as they believed that the stopping power of the larger caliber heavy lead slugs was much better. The test, in fact, proved the opposite. In all distances, the high velocity chassis per round inflicted much severe damage than the slow lung bed bullets. This was the result of the larger impact velocity and the better energy transfer. The wounds caused by the chassis per rifle were, in fact, deadlier than ever in history. A good proof of this are the ballistic gelatin tests. 
The long blade bullet cuts a straight hole with minimal energy transfer. The entrance and exit wounds are nearly the same in size and the permanent cavity, the permanent wound channel, is moderate. The Shasapu bullet's effect is much different. It has a large temporary cavity as well, causing a strong damage to the surrounding tissue. Due to this effect, even if the entrance wound was smaller, the exit wound of the Shasapu bullet was nearly 7 to 13 times larger than the entrance wound. The combat experience shows that this bullet caused explosive displacement of surrounding tissue and bone, horrific wounds never seen with musket balls. But in 1870-71, both rifles were already obsolete. The metallic cartridge was the future, and many of the main military powers already made the transition, like the Austro-Hungarian monarchy adopting the center-fire metallic cartridge Werner rifles. The Dreiser rifle reached its limits in development. Its most important drawback was the large caliber. On the other hand, the Chassepo, it was much easier to convert, and the caliber was good as well. This also proved the superiority of the French rifle. But seeing the outcome of the 1870-71 war, we can also understand that it is not enough to have a better rifle. You must have proper training and, more importantly, proper leadership behind it to seize the opportunities offered by the increased firepower. And even if the Chassepo was capable of remarkable long-range accuracy compared to the Dreiser, the firefights were still fought at a distance where the difference between the two rifles vanished. So dear all, thank you very much for watching. If you want more from the military rifles and tactics from the black powder era, please visit the Cap and Boy YouTube channel. Until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry. In addition to rifles, bayonets are also an important weapon for close combat. This places an incredible strain on the men involved, as one French soldier will report. It was like I'd gone mad. I was foaming at the mouth. Oh, how many a poor man and father of a family I might have run through. It's the field artillery, though, that is the king of the battlefield. Modern field guns are the incarnation of the brutality of industrial weapons, as a single shell might kill or maim dozens of soldiers. One witness will soon describe their effect to Prussian Julius Plug Hartung. The most ghastly injuries are caused by shells. Half or completely torn off heads, open skulls showing the bare brain. If a shell hits the chest or abdomen and stops there, it sometimes tears everything out so that one can see the spine openly, from the front. Artillery tactics and movement on the battlefield will be critical in the coming battles, and here the Germans have the advantage. The Prussians have the excellent C-67 breech-loading cast steel gun from Krupp, while the French are still using bronze muzzle loaders. The bronze deforms quickly when in use, and the French cannon do not shoot as far or as accurately as those of their enemies. One weapon the French do have that the Germans don't is the mitrailleuse, an early machine gun. Its 25 barrels within a barrel are mounted on a wheeled frame and operated by a rotary crank that allows rapid fire. But since it couldn't easily swing from side to side, its effect is somewhat limited. Psychologically though, it will unnerve the Germans who will soon report their fear upon hearing the distinctive rattling of the firing crank. The cavalry, whether cuirassiers, dragoons, hussars, lanciers or uhlans, no longer plays the decisive role that it once did. Horsemen can't charge infantry who are armed with modern needle guns, but they're still useful in pursuit, rearguard actions, reconnaissance or escorting prisoners. To be a cavalryman, though, still carries much prestige. In 1870, uniforms are colorful rather than camouflage, and designed as much for looks as functionality. The colors help soldiers to distinguish friend from foe in the fog of war, but the red French trousers will be a problem. German riflemen can better target them, and the French will suffer a disproportionate number of abdominal wounds. French colonial uniforms are also political statements to highlight their empire, 
like the turquoise turbans, which were impractical in European conditions. The famous German Pickelhaube is already an anachronism in 1870, even though it will last until 1916. These then are the armies and weapons of France and the German alliance that are now ready to launch into modern war. On July 28th, Emperor Napoleon III boards a train for the fortified city of Metz in Lorraine to take command. He declares that French civilization will triumph and brings along his 14-year-old son, Lulu, to witness the coming victory. Meanwhile, German commander-in-chief and Prussian king Wilhelm I is also on a train. He's heading to the French-Bavarian border along with his son, Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm and Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. This week, the French and German armies have reached the combat zone along with their imperial and royal commanders-in-chief. Next week, they fight. The first battle of the Franco-Prussian War begins on August 2nd. Napoleon III hopes that his armies can roll through the Rhineland and on to Berlin and divide the North German Confederation from its South German allies. He orders Marshal Bazaine to advance on the Prussian town of Saarbrücken to start the offensive. But there's no real plan. Bazaine thinks the attack is useless since his army lacks supplies and thousands of soldiers still haven't located their units due to the chaotic mobilization. Some have even deserted. Extra French units are on the way from North Africa and Rome, where they've been protecting the Pope, but they haven't arrived yet. The Emperor's illness and indecisiveness have undermined his authority, so Bazaine changes his orders. The Marshal only sends three divisions under General Frossard across the Saar River. They attack a small German outpost west of Saarbrücken, defended by a Fusilier regiment and a squadron of Ulan cavalry belonging to the 1st German Army. After a three-hour firefight, the French are victorious, and the Germans leave behind eight dead and 68 wounded. 23 French guns then bombard Saarbrücken, even though the Germans have already left and declared it an open city. The German press is outraged, but the French press couldn't be happier. The newspaper Le Gaulois reports breathlessly about 14-year-old Prince Lulu firing off one of the guns. Louis has just received his baptism of fire. He was admirably cool, and was unimpressed by the danger, as befits his name. Son sang froid devant le danger a été digne du nom qu'il porte. After the bombardment, 1,000 French troops enter Saarbrücken, but they withdraw on August 5th. In his post-war memoirs, Bazaine is very critical of his orders. Operations are useless if one does not also seek to assert the captured points when hostilities begin, especially one such as Saarbrücken. This insignificant battle at Saarbrücken will be the only engagement on German soil in the entire war. The same day that the French attack at Saarbrücken, King Wilhelm I takes supreme command of the three German armies. He also sums up the German case for war. To the army, all of Germany stands united in arms against a neighboring state that has declared war on us surprisingly and without reason. It is a matter of defending the threatened fatherland, our honor, our own hearth and home. The Lord God will be with our just cause. Gott, der Herr, wird mit unserer gerechten Sache sein. Just as the French abandon Saarbrücken in the north, the first major battle of the war begins in the south. The Germans realize that the big French offensive is not coming, so they go over to the attack.
The town of Wissembourg, or Weissenburg, is a key railway hub at the junction between Bazaine's northern and MacMahon's southern French forces. The sous-préfet of the town has begged for protection, so MacMahon obliges. But now, these units are without clear orders, in a position where neighboring forces can't support them. If the German Third Army can take Wissembourg, they'll dominate the local railways and split the French army in two. 40,000 Prussians and Bavarians are ready to cross the border and attack the 5,000 French infantry and tirailleurs algériens defending the town. On a rainy and stormy August 4th, the German attack begins with a bombardment by Bavarian artillery. When German troops reach Wissembourg, they report that they surprise the French over their morning coffee. There's fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting as the Algerians defend the train station, and German troops capture the Geisberg Hill and take Wissembourg by storm. French General Abel Douai is killed when a nearby mitrailleuse explodes. His body is left behind by the fleeing French units, and the Battle of Wissembourg is over by 1.30 in the afternoon. German losses are 1,500 killed, wounded and missing, while the French lose 2,300 men and 700 prisoners. The Germans have won the battle, but they've taken heavy losses at the Geisberg, a pattern that will repeat itself in the weeks to come. Time and again, the French entrench themselves on the high ground and wait for the Germans to come into the range of their chasse rifles. Although it should be noted that some French units were still using the tabatière. The chasse is a problem for the Germans. Since their Dreiser rifles can't shoot as far, they're forced to attack just to get into range. The German commanders reckon with up to 50% losses before their men can come into direct contact with the enemy. Prussian officers, in particular, try to lead by example and, as a result, suffer extremely heavy casualties at the head of their units. Third Army Commander Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm writes of the problem in his diary. We lost a conspicuously large number of officers and enlisted men, whose impetuous desire to get at the enemy simply caused them to refrain from taking the necessary precautions. Bavarian infantryman Florian Kuhnhauser's description is far more vivid. There were often whole rows of corpses already giving off an unbearable smell and thousands of flies busied themselves with the blood, which had already turned black. Hi everyone, Jonathan Ferguson here, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery for the Royal Armouries Museum here in the UK. Now, you'll be familiar by now with the French Chasse Quite a celebrated early bolt action rifle. Um, relatively small bore, high velocity, precise, powerful, relatively quick to load. It's a breech loader, which is critical at this period in history, um, certainly if you're a soldier using it. What you, will, you may well be less familiar with is the backup option, which is the Tabatier system. I say system because this is a conversion system applied to muzzle loaders. So a whole family of, of weapons, primarily the model 1853, infantry rifle, um, chasseur rifle, so light infantry, um, and then various carbines as well. And even um, later on, uh, 1822 model, formerly flintlock, percussion muskets, all of those converted using this system. Really quite clever, uh, it's called tabatier, which is um, in reference to this door in the back of the, of the barrel where, in, where the breech is, which is reminiscent of, or so, so they thought, of a snuff box, which is what tabatier means. Why is there a door in the back of your rifle? Well, if you are planning to equip as many troops as you can 
not just your frontline troops, but those that might be fighting um, on your own ground, for example. You look at what you have in stock and how you can convert it. The British did this with the Snyder. The Americans did this with the Trapdoor Springfields. And it's very simple. All you do is chop the back end off the, off the barrel. You obviously have to rebuild the, the rifle, um, reshape or potentially restock it. But um, economically speaking, it's a lot cheaper than all new chassepots. And you put a door in the back, which allows you to exploit the relatively new technology of the self-contained cartridge with a primer in the base and a rim for yanking out the case. Essentially, in that respect, the Vatier is more modern than the Chasseau. Um, the Chasseau system was chosen for very specific reasons to that period and was great, but within a, within a few years, really, it's clear that it's the self-contained cartridge system that's the way forward. Um, now, the French were quite happy with the Chasseau at that time. That's not why they went for this system. This was just the easiest way to convert muzzle loaders to breech loaders. So let me show you how it works. You'd put your hammer at half cock. Instead of a nipple, you have a, a piston, essentially, plunger. You have a little hatched thumb platform here and you flick that open. You load your cartridge from your pouch, close it up, full cock, present and fire. Really pretty quick, pretty rapid to use. When you fired, you put the weapon on half cock again, flick open your door again, and you give it a good old yank to the rear against spring tension, and a, a, a big extractor, similar to the extractor on a modern shotgun, pulls that rim to the rear and hopefully get, overcomes any black powder fouling and gets the case out of the breech. And if you're lucky and you do it hard enough, that empty case will come scooting out through this, this ramp that's been cut and, the, and the, barrel, the, actual, the tang of the barrel has been lowered right down, which A, gives you better access to the breech for loading, and B, means, as I say, in theory, you can get some ejection going on, move your head out of the way, and the case should at least trickle out of the back of the gun, if not shoot out of the back of the gun. In that respect, it's superior to the British Snyder, which is essentially an identical system other than that. If I show you the face of the breech, there's the firing pin hole. And if I hit that piston, that plunger, you see the firing pin stick out the back. That hits the cap on the back of the cartridge and away you go. So that is the Tabatier system. I hope you enjoyed that, everybody. Um, we will be having a deeper dive into the Tabatier system, uh, family of weapons, and its immediate predecessor from which it was converted, the Model 1853 series, in this case, the muzzle loaders. Um, we should have quite a good selection to show you. That's over on our YouTube channel, the Royal Armouries, and I'm also doing a weekly series on uh, essentially random firearms from the collection and you might well find that enjoyable as well. Thanks guys. The German victory at Wissembourg carries the war onto French soil and splits the French army in two. Just two days later, the Germans attack again, twice. The next target of the German offensive is the town of Wörth. It's defended by MacMahon's army of 50,000 men, including the survivors from Wissembourg, who dig in on the hills west of town. After heavy rain on the night of the 5th, 88,000 men of the German 3rd Army attack on the 6th. French soldier saint Genet describes his experience under fire from German artillery. C'est une tempête de feu. Les houblonnières se remplissent de cadavres. It's a storm of fire. The hops fields fill with corpses. When I can at last see clearly, I settle down and look. Not an enemy on the horizon. It's just like before. 
tall dark fir trees and still poplars. Bavarians, Prussians and Württembergers storm the heights from three sides. Attacking uphill yet again, the Germans suffer heavy losses but successfully drive the French from the hilltop villages of Elsasshausen and Frischweiler. The Württembergische Feldbrigade has orders to cut off the French retreat, but Generalmajor Gustav Freiherr von Starkloff decides instead to join the attack on Frischweiler, which is already won. His decision to ignore orders causes some on the general staff to question the reliability of the South Germans, and this will be hotly debated after the war. Von Starkloff's mistake and German exhaustion allow the French cavalry to launch a desperate charge to cover the infantry's confused retreat. French officer Gustave de Boisseillot from the Douai division describes the bleak mood. In our poor, twice mauled division, only our battalion, which escaped the demoralization of defeat, maintains sufficient order and poise. MacMahon telegraphs the news of the defeat to Paris from his headquarters in Reichshofen, which is why the battle is known as Wörth Reichshofen in French, but Wörth Frischweiler in German. German losses are about 10,500, while the French lose about 10,000 killed and wounded and 6,000 prisoners from their much smaller force. To make matters even worse for the French, General Pierre de Failly's 5th Corps is stationed only 40 kilometers away at Beach, but for reasons that are still unclear, he fails to march on Wörth despite his orders. On the German side, the battle is celebrated since it marks the first time that Prussians, Bavarians and Württembergers all fought side by side. This symbolism was not lost on local pro-German pastor Karl Klein. Wirt Frischweiler is where North and South German Brotherhood of Arms was cemented in blood. As the Germans charge up the heights west of Wirt, another bloody battle is raging further north at Spichern. 25,000 French troops under General Frossard are entrenched on the ridges north of the village following their retreat from Saarbrücken. The Roterberg Hill is a nearly impregnable fortress on the high ground, and French troops there begin to fire down on the 20,000 advancing Prussians below. Prussian General von Kameke mistakenly believes that the hill is weakly held, so he orders a direct attack, which turns out to be a near-suicide mission. The cliffs are so steep that German soldiers remove their boots so their feet can better grip the rock. Despite being a tactical mistake, the attack succeeds because German commanders don't hesitate to sacrifice their own men. It also succeeds because of the absence of Dufay's French 5th Corps, which is also within 40 kilometers of this battle, but does not intervene here either. The attack on the Roterberg will later be lionized in Germany, but many German officers are horrified by this week's tactical mistakes. 4,866 Germans are killed, wounded or missing at Spichern, along with about 4,000 French. General Konstantin von Feuchtsrätz describes Kameke's attack as, quote, unbelievable and appalling, and he criticizes his fellow general for dispersing his men and needlessly widening the attack. French soldier and future historian Arthur Chuquet will also criticize German tactics after the war. Despite their contradictory efforts, and although the action was haphazardly carried out, with no plan, the Germans had the advantage, thanks to their audacity, martial confidence, and their selfless camaraderie. The Prussian dead covering the slopes near Spichern are buried in mass graves at the foot of the Roterberg to save time and effort. This now overgrown cemetery can still be visited today.
Despite these problems, the German armies are victorious in every major battle this week. French General Trochu reports on the state of French troops. Four days suffice to lower the morale of our troops, to proportionately increase the confidence of the enemy, and to unsettle the Emperor. This week, the French abort their offensive, and the Germans are victorious in three major battles. When the news reaches Paris on August 7th, writer Edmond de Goncourt notes in his diary, there's a terrifying silence, and on the horizon, a Paris where noise seems to have died away. The French armies are divided, demoralized, and in retreat, but they're not defeated yet, and the guns will break Goncourt's silence again next week. Let's start with the military situation after last week's fighting. The double German victory on August 6th had come at an incredibly heavy cost. Nearly 16,000 Germans and 20,000 French have been killed, wounded, or gone missing. German commanders recognize that the French are using the superior range of the Chassepot rifle, which forces the Germans to make risky attacks on fortified positions. But it's also clear to the general staff that German discipline and morale are strong enough to achieve tactical victories in spite of the high cost which will lead to more suicidal attacks. Commanders on both sides have also noticed that the German artillery is dramatically outperforming the French. The German high command, though, is worried about decision-making. Chief of Staff of the Prussian Army, Helmut von Molke, for example, was quite upset when General von Steinmetz didn't stick to the plan at Spichern last week. On the French side, the defeats of August 6th and the ongoing retreat of the French army is having a serious effect on the morale not only of the soldiers, but also of the civilian population. After just a few days of fighting, there's already a crisis. Some soldiers desert, and the remainder are exhausted from fighting and marching. There's also a change of government in Paris on the 9th, as Liberal Prime Minister Olivier is forced out, and the Bonapartiste Comte de Palicao takes over. The French plan to fight on and across the Rhine has failed, and it's now obvious that the war will be fought in France. The Army of the Rhine is also split in two. In the north, four corps are nominally under Napoleon III, but in practice are under Marshal Bazaine. In the south, Marshal MacMahon has parts of two corps plus a cavalry division. These two forces are now operating without any direct contact. MacMahon moves his forces southwest to Lunéville, which he reaches on the 9th. The Emperor and Bazaine move their army west towards the fortified city of Metz, and by August 11th are just east of it. Sixth Corps leaves MacMahon to join up with Bazaine, and MacMahon now begins to organize his remaining units, plus a new corps of mobile guardsmen at chalon sur marne As the French retreat, the 3rd German army shadows MacMahon to the north, and the 1st and 2nd German armies both follow Bazaine towards Metz. Friedrich Engels summarizes the disastrous situation of the French for his British readers in the Pall Mall Gazette, on August 9th. The superiority of the Germans in numbers, morale, and strategic position must now be such that they can instantly do almost anything they want with impunity. Napoleon, however, has to all appearances almost hopelessly fragmented his troops after two days of fighting, and cannot allow himself to dare a main battle. The French army now stands outside of Metz, and Marshal Bazaine wants to continue the retreat to reunite French forces. But Napoleon III wants to protect Paris, and he isn't ready to abandon the East.
On August 13th, the first German army arrives east of Metz, but the second army lags behind. Neither the Germans nor the French are quite sure where the other's forces are, until a squadron of Prussian dragoons stumbles upon a French camp to the surprise of both sides. At the same time, Bazaine is worried about crossing the Moselle River, but the Emperor changes his mind and orders a dangerous retreat even though the enemy is close. The French withdrawal across the Moselle is made all the more difficult because of the recent heavy rains, and bridges put up by engineers are clogged with baggage trains. While the main French force is trying to get away, the rearguard clashes with the advancing Germans on the 14th, in the Battle of colombie neuilly The French Third Corps under General Claude Théodore Decain is between the villages of Colombie and Borny. They hold a strong defensive position on high ground, anchored on a stream, trench system, and some high buildings. Nearby is a division of 4th Corps between May and Neuilly. Opposing them is the Prussian 26th Brigade under Major General Kuno von der Goltz. Even though he's badly outnumbered, that afternoon von der Goltz decides to attack without waiting for orders. Neighboring forces from both sides are drawn into the fighting, with 83,500 French troops and 67,500 Germans eventually involved. Again, the Germans attack entrenched French defenders on the high ground, and as a result, they suffer heavy casualties in the back and forth fighting. But the French do not mount what might have been a decisive counterattack. General von Steinmetz orders some German regiments to pull back to their positions that night after they suffer 5,000 casualties and inflict just 3,400 on the French. There's no clear-cut victory for either side at colombie neuilly which is the first battle of the Metz trilogy. The French hold off the Germans and lose fewer men, but the Germans do delay the urgent French retreat across the Moselle. What is clear is that the Germans still hold the overall operational advantage. Marshal Bazaine does score a modest political victory, though. He takes advantage of the intense situation while the battle is raging, and he convinces Napoleon III to leave the area. The Emperor and his son flee towards Verdun and are nearly captured by Prussian cavalry patrols near Mars la Tour. Napoleon III is also suffering badly from kidney stones, and the journey on horseback and hard third-class train benches is a painful one. While the Germans are pushing the French back at colombie neuilly further south, the Baden Field Division is sent to besiege the imposing fortress city of Strasbourg. Strasbourg is considered one of the strongest fortresses and most well-defended cities in France, but it's not standing in the way of further German operations to the north. German leadership instead decides to attack Strasbourg to prevent unrest in the area and because of the city's symbolic importance. The city became a part of the Holy Roman Empire back in the 10th century before King Louis XIV incorporated it into France in 1681. Now, the Germans want to reaffirm their claim to ownership. The fortress is under command of city governor General Jean-Jacques Ourich. On August 12th, lead elements of the Baden Field Division, supported by Württembergish fortress artillery, reach the outskirts of Strasbourg. The German troops cut off rail and telegraph lines, and the city is now isolated. Inside are 85,000 civilians and 15,000 French soldiers, of which 4,500 are stragglers from the defeat at Wörth, and 3,600 are inexperienced mobile National Guardsmen. The French also have 1,200 mostly obsolete guns and, for the time being, adequate supplies. At first, the French did not expect an attack, so they're not well prepared. They only start flooding the trenches and preparing the southern forward defenses after the arrival of the first German troops. The fortifications at Strasbourg are also outdated. 
Unlike newer fortresses like Metz or Paris, Strasbourg doesn't have detached outer forts to keep the attackers at a distance. Prussian General August von Werder is in command of the Baden division, and he hopes to force Strasbourg to surrender with a few cannon shots. But the city is also symbolically important in France, and German emissaries looking to discuss surrender terms are turned away several times. General Urich informs city residents of the military's intention to resist. If Strasbourg is attacked, Strasbourg will defend itself to the last soldier, biscuit, and cartridge. Good people can be reassured. As for the others, they've only to leave. Les bons peuvent se rassurer. Quant aux autres, ils n'ont qu'à s'éloigner. On August 15th, the Germans begin to bombard the city with heavy artillery. Buildings catch fire, and frightened residents take shelter in the cellars. French artillery returns fire, and General Verda now realizes that capturing Strasbourg will take longer than expected. This week, German and French forces clash in the first Battle of the Metz trilogy at colombie neuilly and the Germans besiege Strasbourg. Back in Berlin, some of the 8,000 French prisoners taken last week arrive in boxcars, and nearly 100,000 curious Berliners turn out to see them. At the front, the separation of the Army of the Rhine is a disaster for the French, since the Germans have already begun to attack its two parts separately. But Marshal Bazaine's retreat across the Moselle will not earn his troops much rest, as next week we'll see the bloodiest battles of the war. After the fighting of August 14th, the French complete their retreat to the left bank of the Moselle the next day. Bazaine has also convinced Napoleon III to join MacMahon at Chalon, which frees up Bazaine to command without the Emperor's constant and indecisive advice. But getting the Emperor out of his hair doesn't solve Bazaine's problems. He tries to withdraw his forces along the road to Chalon-sur-Marne, but French troops are exhausted from the fighting and the river crossing, and they need to rest. This delay gives the Germans a crucial extra day to catch the French, who are encamped on a ridge west of Metz. The German Second Army takes up a position along the Metz-Verdun road. If the Prussians can take the road, they'll cut off the French line of retreat and trap them in Metz. There are about 90,000 German troops available for the attack, and 140,000 French to defend the road. On August 16th at 9 a.m., the Battle of vionville mars la tour begins. The German Third Corps attacks towards the road between mars la tour and Gravelotte, where Bazaine has his headquarters. There they smash into the French Second Corps under General Frossard, which is blocking their path. The fighting takes place in a relatively small area of rolling fields and woods. Combat is brutal, and the losses are extremely heavy on both sides. At about 11 a.m., the Germans take Vionville and turn towards Raisonville, where they run into the French 6th Corps under Marshal de Camp Robert. The fighting now centers on the Tronville Wood, and losses mount quickly. The 4th Brandenburg Infantry Regiment No. 24, for example, loses a third of its men and half of its officers in the forest. To buy time to bring up reinforcements, the Germans decide to send in the cuirassiers and uhlans of the Bredo Cavalry Brigade. Commander Adalbert von Bredo knows that this is a suicide mission, and he only accepts to carry out his orders after repeated and furious instructions from the general staff. The cavalrymen draw lots to decide which squadrons will join the charge. The unlucky squadrons ride pell-mell into the forest, and two-thirds are lost. The doomed attack will become known as the Death Ride of the Bredo Brigade, and later becomes a key part of the militaristic culture of remembrance in the Kaiserreich. The battle drags on throughout the day, and ebbs back and forth in the afternoon. 
General Bourbaki's French guards threatened to surround the Prussians at Mars La Tour, but another Prussian cavalry charge saves the situation. Chancellor Bismarck's two sons, Herbert and Wilhelm, are both part of this action. The decisive moment comes at 7 p.m., when the German 8th and 9th Corps attack Raisonville and break the French defenses with a final cavalry attack at dusk. After 12 hours of intense combat, the Battle of Mars La Tour is over. German forces are now in possession of the vital road and have cut off the French line of retreat. Bazaine's army is trapped. 33,000 French and Germans are dead or wounded a very high total which worries Chancellor Bismarck, who shares his concerns with his wife Johanna. The 3rd Hussars and 16th Uhlans lost a third of their men and more than half of the officers in senseless and impossible cavalry attacks. The leadership of the 1st and 2nd Armies is clumsily abusing the death-defying bravery of our people. It's all brawn and no brains, and yet we are victorious. Nur Faust ohne Kopf, und doch siegen wir. For the French, Mars La Tour is another defeat, but one that will inspire pride in the months to come. A newspaper report from 1871 explains why. All the Prussian officers, after paying homage to the brilliant courage of our soldiers, are unanimous in declaring that our army fought with a rage of which nothing can give an idea. Notre armée s'est battue avec une rage dont rien ne peut donner une idée. After the German successes at Colombie Neuilly on the 14th and Vionville Mars La Tour on the 16th, soldiers on both sides get only one day of rest before the final battle of the Metz trilogy begins. The German army command expects the French to attack right away on the 17th to reach the Etain Verdun road. But by noon, it's clear that the French are pulling back along the line from Gravelotte to the heights at saint privat la montagne Bazaine decides not to attack because his men are exhausted and short on ammunition and food. The retreat is chaotic, but German troops are equally spent and can't really take advantage of the confusion. By the end of the 17th, the French have shifted to a strong defensive position along a road embankment and there, they wait for the Germans to attack. On the 18th, the Battle of Gravelotte saint privat begins, one of the few battles in this war that is planned by both sides. The German 1st and 2nd Armies, plus the Guards Corps, field 170,000 men and 732 guns, while the French defenders of the Army of Lorraine have about 130,000 men and 520 guns. The Germans begin by attacking the French positions on the high ground. This is a costly tactical mistake. The fighting rages in woods, on hills, and around farms. In particular, around a farm known ominously as the Ferme de Moscou. In the evening, German 1st Army Commander von Steinmetz decides to renew the attack in the north with the elite Prussian Guard. He and Guard Corps Commander Prince August of Württemberg are supposed to wait until Saxon reinforcements arrive, but thanks to a communication error, they start the assault an hour ahead of schedule without any detailed plans. The Germans don't have enough artillery support, and they need to cross open terrain to reach the village of saint privat la montagne which sits on a fortified hill. The French troops up on top of the hill are protected by walls and bushes, and they use the longer range of their chassepot rifles to rain fire on the exposed Prussians. They also bring into action the mitrailleuse, a forerunner of the machine gun, with devastating effect, but for the only time in this war. The Prussians suffer 5,000 dead and wounded on the slopes beneath the village and so many officers have fallen that some units are under the command of sergeants. 
these losses in such a short period of time are unprecedented in Prussian military history and make this assault the most controversial of the war for the Germans. One Prussian guard sergeant describes the moments after he was hit. There I lay, one of the victims of this bloody day. My first feeling was indignation at being hit. My second was that I expected to explode, because after the rumbling of the bullet, I was convinced I had an artillery shell in my body. Then came the pain, and with it, helplessness as I fell down. I watched as the battalion left my sight, and saw myself lying alone on the ground, amidst the terrible howling and whistling of bullets constantly smashing into the earth all around me. For the first time in the war, it looks like the French are about to stop a major German attack. Bazaine even reports to the Emperor that victory is at hand. But just half an hour later, Saxon reinforcements join the Prussian guards and the German artillery opens up again. That evening, saint Privat falls to the Germans after bloody house-to-house -house combat. They've now outflanked the French right wing, which makes the French position untenable. Bazaine orders a retreat east to the fortress at Metz. On August 18, 1870, more than 20,000 Germans are killed or wounded, along with nearly 12,000 Frenchmen. The Metz Trilogy has turned the fields around the city into a single, giant field of corpses, and both French and German newspapers publish long lists of obituaries. French troops are frustrated with repeated defeats and senseless sacrifice, as one officer makes clear in his report on morale. On nous mène à des boucheries inutiles. We are being led to needless butchery. A German officer expresses similar feelings to his wife about the mistakes of German commanders in the three Metz battles. Our beautiful, brave army, four such victories, and she is no more. This week, the Germans win very costly victories at vionville mars la tour and gravelotte saint privat the Metz trilogy ends with more German success, and now half of the French army is besieged in Metz. We'll find out more about their fate next week. Two clear defeats in the Metz trilogy have put the French in a catastrophic position. Marshal Bazaine's army is surrounded, and rejoining with Marshal MacMahon's forces seems impossible. As of August 20th, 170,000 combat-ready French troops are cut off in the Metz pocket, along with 18,000 wounded and sick, 700 German prisoners, 60,000 residents, and 20,000 refugees. More than a quarter of a million people who will have to be fed for an unknown period of time. The threat of starvation is real. But Bazaine is not ready to quit. Metz is a formidable defensive position. The city has lots of fortified 17th century buildings, it's surrounded by earthworks and trenches, and there are five new forts outside the city walls, even though they're only partly completed. Despite the marshal's resolve, the effects of the siege begin to make themselves felt in the coming weeks. Diseases like typhus and cholera start to spread, and hundreds of wounded die because of lack of medical care. Medicine and bandages are in short supply, but most importantly, so is food. French soldier Clovis Hardy of the 63e Regiment d'Infanterie describes the situation. We now had enough arms, but as far as food supplies were concerned, the situation was not the same. Rumors were going around that there were only 14 days worth of grain, flour and sugar left. Coffee was only available for three weeks, meat for six days, not enough bacon and hardly any liquor. 
Horses had to make do with only a small amount of oats, enough for 14 days. The French situation in the Met's pocket is serious, but the Germans besieging the city are facing difficulties of their own. They requisition what they can from surrounding villages, but the 200,000 besieging troops need more than they can take from the French peasants. German soldier Albert Böhme of the Infanterie Regiment 92 has been camped outside of Metz for five days when he writes to his wife Friederike. There's little bread and little meat and bad water. Everywhere here, settlers have nothing left to sell. They're partly sold out in France. If you happen to get anything, you have to pay more than you can afford. Wenn man was kriegen sollte, muss man mehr bezahlen, wie man könnte. Settlers, by the way, are civilian merchants who follow the armies and sell the soldiers food and other goods. German supply difficulties are partly related to the rail system. They can run trains into France right up to Remilly and Courcelles to unload supplies east of Metz, which horse-drawn vehicles then move up to the front line. This system allows food, weapons, horses, livestock for slaughter, ammunition, gifts from home, and fresh reinforcements to reach the German units. West of Metz, across the river Moselle, German logistics have a much tougher challenge. Prussian pioneers build a 37-kilometer rail link, including wooden viaducts, to get the trains over to the western bank. But the line is laid in a rush over fields and meadows, and it's not properly shored up with ballast. That means that the heavy rains over the past few weeks have turned the earth soft, so the trains are reduced to a snail's pace. Once they reach Pont-à-Mousson, everything moves by horse cart. The siege of Metz puts enormous pressure on German logistics, and German supply officers requisition from French civilians to achieve their objectives. German High Command has issued orders that anything taken from civilians must be done legally and be paid for, but the reality of war is often different. German violations cause resentment amongst the French, and the Prussians gain a reputation as barbaric plunderers. From now on, French newspaper cartoons will often use the image of an unkempt and dirty German soldier stealing grandfather clocks. Bazaine and his exhausted army are now trapped in Metz by a larger and stronger German force. The last hope for the surrounded French army is Marshal MacMahon. From August 20th, about 200,000 German troops from the 1st and 2nd armies are tied up besieging Metz. Their objective is to avoid costly attacks by bombarding or starving the city into surrender. They set up triple siege lines, artillery emplacements, fortifications, trenches, and ramparts. They lay telegraph lines and build bridges across the Moselle for resupply and badly needed fresh conscripts and reservists to top up depleted units. Along the 10-kilometer ring surrounding the city, there are also observation and alarm posts, who are to report any signs of a French breakout attempt. But the Germans can't be everywhere, and quite a few Frenchmen are able to smuggle messages in and out of Metz. Those the Germans catch are condemned as spies and shot on the spot. The German command now is able to withdraw 90,000 men for use elsewhere. These form the Fourth Army, or Mass Armee, under the command of Crown Prince Albert of Saxony, and it marches off to the Argonne to join the Third Army's advance. One of the Fourth Army's soldiers is 22-year-old Prussian Guard Lieutenant Paul von Hindenburg. The Third Army is moving through the Vosges Mountains in pursuit of MacMahon's army. On the way, the Germans capture some smaller fortresses, but the farther they get, the more the men suffer. Long columns of wet, exhausted, and hungry troops, along with weapons, horses, carts, and cannons, struggle ahead. 
tensions and confrontations with the civilian population only add to the misery for both sides. There's not enough food, it's constantly raining, the nights are chilly, and many men get sick. The German command knows by mid-August that MacMahon's army is encamped at chalon sur marne But on August 21st, French forces leave the camp and begin to move. Although at first, it's not clear to either side where they're headed. Back on the 17th, a French war council struggled to decide whether MacMahon should defend Paris or fight in the east. Now that Metz is surrounded, Empress Eugenie and the war party fear that leaving Bazin to his fate will bring revolution. So Minister for War Count Palikao tells MacMahon to relieve Metz. And once again, confusion reigns in the French high command. Finally, MacMahon begins to move north, but there are still debates about whether he should turn east to Metz or west to protect the capital. The German Third Army is only 90 kilometers away from his former camp when a cavalry patrol discovers that it's empty on August 24th. MacMahon, though, does not see much chance for success. His army is a slow-moving, demoralized mix of exhausted troops and inexperienced replacements. Upon leaving Chalon, MacMahon seems resigned to his fate. Well, then let us have our backs broken. Palikao and Eugenie are insistent, and they send him a message in the name of the Emperor. Si vous abandonnez Bazaine, la révolution est dans Paris. If you abandon Bazaine, there will be revolution in Paris, and you yourself will be attacked by the full force of the enemy. I consider it urgent that you quickly reach Bazaine. On August 25th, the Germans decide on a maneuver that has gone down in German military history as the Great Right Turn. Once the 3rd German army reaches Chalon, they execute a difficult mass maneuver and turn north on the 26th. A quarter of a million men abruptly change direction to try to head off MacMahon's forces in case they turn east towards Metz. As the Germans pivot, MacMahon does turn east from just north of Reims. If the Germans are going to catch up and stop him before he can relieve the Metz pocket, they're going to have to hurry, and their route along the Argonne Heights is a tough one. Meanwhile, at Strasbourg, the Baden Field Division begins a four-day bombardment of the besieged city on the 23rd. Whole quarters go up in flames, civilians are killed, the cathedral is damaged, and some of the library's valuable historic manuscripts are destroyed. The Germans hope the shelling will shorten the siege, but the international press is quick to condemn it as a moral outrage. This week, the Germans besiege half the French army in Metz. Marshal MacMahon marches to relieve the city with a German army on his heels, and Strasbourg burns. Back on July 13th, Minister Ignace Plichon made a prediction to the Emperor. Sire, you and the King of Prussia are not on equal footing. The King can allow himself to lose several battles, but for you, Sire, defeat means revolution. Pour vous, Sire, la défaite, c'est la révolution. Next week, the coming battles will indeed decide the future of the Second Empire. The German Third Army and MacMahon's Army of Chalon have been marching parallel to each other for weeks. But that changes when the French turn east to relieve Metz. On August 29th, though, a German vanguard intercepts them at the Battle of Noir. On the 30th, they clash again at Beaumont. French General Failly's V Corps is encamped after retreating from Noir, but he fails to post troops around the camp to protect it. He's already shown his incompetence at Wörth and Spichern on August 6th, and now his negligence will cost the French again. 
The Prussian and Bavarian troops can hardly believe their eyes, and they take the French completely by surprise. Reportedly, Fayy is still at the dinner table when the German attack begins. Artillery shells crash into the camp and throw it into chaos, but the French troops mount a stubborn defense for the whole day until the Germans finally prevail. About 5,000 French soldiers are killed or wounded, and 3,000 made prisoner. The Germans lose about 3,300 killed and wounded. Bavarian soldier Florian Kuhnhauser takes in the carnage. Nearby, two dead Frenchmen lay in a pool of their own blood in the gutter. One was a Turcot, the other was a younger, beardless man his face distorted with pain and partly covered in blood. The fires cast an otherworldly, ghostly light on them that made the scene even more hideous. The look of this unlucky pair deeply impressed me. Years after, their gruesome figures still visited me in my dreams. MacMahon hopes to regroup his forces at the town of Sedan, but discipline is starting to crack. Lieutenant Jean Guinaudot of the 46e Regiment de Ligne struggles to control his men. With a few men, persuasion is enough. With many more, it is necessary to use threats, and more than once, we've been obliged to raise our canes or to show the muzzle of our revolvers to disobedient men. MacMahon's attempt to relieve Metz fails, and a belated breakout attempt from the pocket by Bazaine also fails at the Battle of Noisville on August 31st and September 1st. MacMahon telegraphs Empress Eugenie that he has no choice but to fall back to Sedan. On August 31st, after the German victory at Beaumont, MacMahon's French army turns towards Sedan, still accompanied by Emperor Napoleon III. The German Third Army's pivot a few days before means it's not far behind, and the German Fourth Army is closing in as well. General von Moltke could not be more pleased. Now we have them in the mousetrap after all. Nun haben wir sie doch in der Mausefalle. The old fortress town of Sedan near the Belgian border is home to 18,000 residents. The soon-to-be battlefield is characterized by the Meuse River, which runs through the city, as well as several villages and streams around a triangular plateau. Most importantly, a series of wooded ridges allow any force on top of them to fire down on exposed positions below. General Ducrot reportedly sees the problem this way. Nous sommes dans un pot de chambre, et nous y serons emmerdés. We are in a chamber pot, and in it we shall be shit upon. On September 1st, some French units are in Sedan, but most are on the plateau and north of the town. The German 3rd and 4th armies approach from the east and the southwest. Two corps march west of Sedan, bypassing the French positions and cutting them off. The Germans have moved far quicker than the French expected, and now Napoleon III and his army of 120,000 men are trapped by a German force of 250,000. The Germans plan to fully encircle Sedan and smash the helpless French below with artillery fire. At 4 a.m., the 1st Bavarian Corps attacks French forces in the village of Bazay. The Bavarians attack ahead of schedule before reinforcements arrive, and now they're locked in battle with elite French Marines. Extremely bitter house-to-house -house fighting goes on for hours. In one house, the French fight on until they run out of ammunition, an event which becomes the subject of the famous painting Les Dernières Cartouches, The Last Cartridges. Bazay is in flames, and the Germans send in reinforcements. 
The fighting is so fierce that both sides commit war crimes. Non-uniformed French civilians fire from houses on German soldiers and wounded. French civilians and German soldiers even report after the battle that villagers throw wounded Germans into burning houses. Bavarian soldiers later say that they react by executing suspected franc and setting fire to houses. 39 civilian men, women and children are shot, killed in the crossfire, or die in the flames. By 10 a.m., Bazay is in Bavarian hands, and the Germans move on to Balan. Almost as soon as the Battle of Sedan starts, the French command realizes they have no chance if they stay on the defensive. So MacMahon orders a breakout at Bazay in the hopes of then retreating to Metz. He refuses to withdraw towards Belgium since he sees it as dishonorable. But at 6.15 a.m., MacMahon is severely wounded by a shell splinter and hands over command to General Auguste Alexandre Ducrot. Ducrot realizes that a breakout via Bazay is impossible, so he orders a fighting retreat through the village of Illy, the last opening in the German ring. If his plan succeeds, the army can take shelter at the fortified town of Mezières, 20 kilometers away. But once again, the command system and the political culture of the Second Empire fail. Eugénie protégé General Emmanuel Félix von Vinfen insists that he should be in command based on seniority and starts issuing counter orders. In the middle of the battle that will decide the fate of the empire, with German artillery shells crashing down around them, the two generals argue, and the sick emperor does little. At 9 a.m., Benfen takes over. He thinks the situation can still be saved and orders withdrawing units to turn around. The emperor, who has predicted defeat since late July, resigns himself to his fate. Three commanders and three battle plans on the same day simply hasten the French defeat. All around Sedan, German troops are on the attack. Saxon soldiers, along with the Prussian guard, advance through the woods towards the Givonne Brook. The 11th and 5th Corps swing to the north to fully seal off the town and attack the French between Fluin and Illy. Around noon, the Germans close the ring around Sedan. 500 German guns fire relentlessly on the completely defenseless French from all directions. Prussian Guard artillery officer Prince Kraft zu Hohenlohe Ingelfingen watches as French artillery attempts to respond. A battery horsed entirely with greys trotted up and tried to take up its position between Givonne and the Bois de la Garenne. As soon as it appeared on the hill, our three batteries opened fire on it. It fell to pieces, as it were, and its ruins remained where they fell. It did not fire a single shot. A second and a third battery met with the same fate. The outcome is no longer in doubt, but the French cavalry repeatedly charges the Germans near Fouin. Journalist William Howard Russell watches the scene unfold. Never can I forget the sort of agony with which I witnessed the Prussians who first came out on the plateau, raising their heads and looking around for an enemy. Suddenly, the first block of French horse, in beautiful order, rushed up the slope. The Prussians were caught en flagrant délit and were swept away. But the impetuosity of the charge could not be stayed. Frenchmen and horses came tumbling down into the road, where they were disposed of by the Prussian infantry hidden in the gardens. Around 2 p.m., the French army starts to disintegrate. Some soldiers throw down their rifles and flee to the relative protection of the fortress, while others continue the unequal fight. In the late afternoon, Napoleon III orders the white flag to be raised to spare the lives of his men. 
Observing the battle from a nearby hill, King Wilhelm also decides to stop the bloodshed and orders a ceasefire at 6 p.m. He sends a messenger to Sedan, who returns with French General André Rey, who hands King Wilhelm the Emperor's handwritten note. Monsieur mon frère, not having been able to die in the midst of my troops, I have only to place my sword in your majesty's hands. Il ne me reste qu'à remettre mon épée entre les mains de votre majesté. Sedan is another costly battle. 3,000 French soldiers are killed and 14,000 are wounded. The Germans suffer about 1,600 killed, 6,500 wounded, and nearly 900 missing. Napoleon III and his army entered German captivity on September 2nd, 1870. Bismarck rides out to meet him, and the two chat in front of a cottage by the side of the road. King Wilhelm also meets with Napoleon and expresses his sympathy before the emperor heads off for a comfortable captivity in a German chateau. The fate of the emperor's 80,000 soldiers, though, is not as comfortable. Once their commanders accept the German terms, they spend days outdoors in terrible conditions before the Germans gradually transport them east. French Corporal Louis Oberhausen helps other starving soldiers to slaughter their horses. Killing them was doing the beasts a favor, since they were even hungrier than the men. The Battle of Sedan is a crushing victory for the Germans. King Wilhelm's officers are overcome with joy because they think the war is over. But they are mistaken. Peace negotiations begin right after Sedan, but they don't get far. The Germans demand Alsace and part of Lorraine, which the French generals refuse. So German troops begin to advance towards Paris on September 3rd, and there's precious little to stop them. Back in the French capital, news of the catastrophe at Sedan and the capture of the emperor unleashes the political tensions of the Second Empire. Tens of thousands take to the streets in passionate and violent demonstrations in favor of a return to a republic, and the imperial regime collapses. Some opposition politicians set aside their differences and declare the Third Republic on September 4, 1870. Citizens of Paris, the Republic is proclaimed. The government calls on citizens to remain calm. The people must remember that it is in the presence of the enemy. The government is above all a government of national defense. The government of national defense has three key members. Paris military governor and Orléanist General Jules Trochu is the president of the Council of Ministers. Moderate liberal Jules Favre is the foreign minister, and leftist lawyer Léon Gambetta is minister of the interior. Favre and Gambetta are political opposites, but they're also the driving force behind the creation of the new republic. If they want to consolidate the fragile young republic and silence its many critics, they'll have to end the war while avoiding a dishonorable peace. Since German demands are unacceptable to them and the old French army has been destroyed, this means carrying on the war in a new way. Until now, the war has been more of a cabinet war between princes than a war of extermination between nations. That is about to change, because the nationalist government of the Third Republic is prepared to fight the hated German enemy by any means necessary. Gambetta announces la guerre à outrance, all-out war. This week, the Germans deal the French a catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Sedan, the Emperor is captured, and France becomes a republic. When Empress Eugénie learns that her husband has been captured, she faints. For her, 
The situation is hopeless. Most of the French army has been destroyed or captured, and the Republicans are now in control. Her only chance is to attempt a daring escape. The Third Republic that is desperately trying to defend itself is largely the creation of liberal and left-wing intellectuals who see the capture of Napoleon III at Sedan as a historic opportunity. After the revolutions of 1789, 1830, and 1848 all eventually resulted in monarchy, they're determined that this time France will remain a republic for good. Moderate liberal foreign minister Jules Favre and leftist lawyer and interior minister Léon Gambetta are the two most prominent figures in the new government of national defense. The first priority this week is indeed military necessity. On September 9th, preparations for the defense of Paris begin, and on the 11th, a delegation arrives in Tours to coordinate the war effort in the countryside. This week, the government also starts to raise a new citizen army on the model of the 1793 Levée en Masse. Gambetta pushes verbally brutal anti-German propaganda that foreshadows the venomous language of the 20th century with slogans like this. We must kill everything. We must murder, strangle, shoot from windows and cellar holes. If we have no guns, we take pitchforks, sabers, and pikes. No matter how, it is only a matter of killing. Many Germans express their animosity privately and in milder terms, like General Staff Officer Julius Verdi du Vernois. The French must be made to feel what it means to challenge a peaceful neighbor to a struggle for life or death. The whole French nation must be made sick of fighting, no matter whether a Napoleon reigns, or an Orléans, or a Bourbon, or anything else. In September 1870, the Third Republic is the first state to attempt to activate all economic, industrial, and intellectual resources of society for the fight against an external and dehumanized enemy a concept later known as total war. Not all French citizens support the Republic, though. Upper-class and conservative writer Edmond de Goncourt is bitterly against last week's Paris riots and the regime change that they helped bring about. His diary is full of insults directed at the revolutionaries. It seems to me that amongst this lewd rabble, the first good men of the old Marseillaise are not to be found. It seems to me there are only skeptical thugs whose politics is smashing things. They haven't got anything under their left nipple with which to make grand sacrifices for la patrie. Goncourt's criticism is not surprising given the social class difference between him and most of the revolutionaries. But Goncourt overlooks the fact that the Second Empire's crushing defeats in recent weeks laid bare the corruption and nepotism of a hollow system. The social problems that drove working class people onto the streets last week are only hearsay to someone like Goncourt. While the Republic is being founded, the main figures of the imperial regime are either in German captivity, like the Emperor and Marshal MacMahon, or they flee abroad. And the most prominent fugitive is former Empress Eugenie. The Empress had gotten the war that she wanted back in July, but instead of stabilizing the imperial regime and her son's succession, it led to defeat. When she learns of Napoleon III's capture on September 3rd, she is desperate and furious. No, a Napoleon ne capitule pas. No, a Napoleon does not surrender. Why didn't he get himself killed? Didn't he feel 
that he was dishonoring himself. After a fit of screaming, Eugenie regains her composure and summons her ministers to work out a plan to save the empire. But it's too late. The surrender at Sedan now puts her in danger. The Republic is proclaimed as crowds march to the Imperial Palace, demanding the death of the Spaniard. And Eugenie de Montijo is Spanish-born. The crowds also destroy symbols of empire, like the large golden letter N, which was all over the city. And there are even a few red flags raised. The Empress does not want to suffer the same fate as Marie Antoinette, who was beheaded in 1793. She flees the palace dressed in simple clothes and hidden in a carriage, without even packing a suitcase. Her priceless collection of clothes, jewelry and ornaments remains in the palace. She manages to get through the crowds without being recognized and with a few close confidants in tow. The group's first stop is the home of Eugenie's longtime dentist, American Thomas W. Evans. On September 5th, Evans, the Empress, and a few others leave Paris in another carriage headed for the English Channel. The exhausted party changes horses and companions and end up in a farm wagon on their way to the coast. They stay the night in a cheap flop house and miraculously no one recognizes them. On September 6th, filthy and drenched from the constant rain, the ex-empress reaches Deauville, where she embarks for England the next day. She sails on a small yacht called the Gazelle, which is caught in a storm but manages to stay afloat. On September 8th, a seasick, exhausted Eugenie, on the verge of a nervous breakdown, finally reaches the safety of English shores. The same day, she reunites with her son, Lulu, who ironically has just landed at Hastings. While Eugenie flees France for England, the battlefields of the war that she helped to start are still covered in corpses, and her former subjects are the ones doing the cleaning up. The fields around Sudan are strewn with dead Frenchmen, Germans and horses. But so are the sites of the great battles of August. The princes may have started the war, but the people living near the battlefields are the ones who are doing the gruesome work of clearing away the carnage. Alsatian pastor Karl Klein lists just some of the items that litter the battlefield next to his home. Broken wagons, rifles, bayonets, sabers, torn and bloody clothes, tents, shakos, knapsacks, prayer books, photographs, half-eaten animal carcasses, dead chickens, spilt food, cooking utensils, barrels, and sacks. In short, everything an army can have and lose. The dead lie one by one and in heaps, already bloated and swollen. The sons of both nations lie thick in some places, mown down in the strength and flower of life. Dahingemäht in der Kraft und Blüte des Lebens. When the armies move on, the locals, with some help from the German army, have to bury the dead. Usually they place 60 to 80 bodies in a mass grave in two layers. Sometimes, like at Sudan, the bodies of men and horses are also burned to prevent disease. Prussian Friedrich Nietzsche, who's a professor and a volunteer medic, helps out clearing the battlefield at Wörth at the end of August. His task is to find the grave of a Bavarian officer who's to be exhumed and brought home, which was a common practice for families who could afford it. Repatriating the fallen is not pretty as Major Hans von Kretschmann describes. Frau von Röder has asked the king for the body of her fallen husband. The bodies were only buried two or three feet deep and were badly decomposed because of the rain. All the pioneers contracted typhus from the work and some died. Incidentally, consider that there are often several in one grave, 
so one can no longer recognize a man's features. We must then carry out an investigation of the worst kind. Even veteran war correspondent William Howard Russell is shocked by the battlefield at Sudan. I do not remember ever having passed through so horrible a place, having beheld so much that was disgusting and hideous. The stench was terrible, truly a place for vultures. This week, the new French Republic prepares for total war, Empress Eugenie and the Prince Imperial flee to England, and the gruesome cleanup of the battlefields continues. The Republic is committed to waging war with far greater tenacity and brutality than the corrupt empire it has replaced, but the task will not be easy. On September 12th, the last day of this week, the first German cavalry scouts are sighted near Paris. By the middle of September 1870, German forces have been marching towards Paris for two weeks. Inside the city, President of the Government of National Defense, General Louis-Jules Trochu, organizes the city's defenses. He has the 13th Corps, which escaped the disaster at Sedan, as well as General Auguste Alexandre Ducrot's new 14th Corps. Ducrot had been released by the Germans after Sedan and has now broken his word of honor not to fight them again. There's also a mixed force of mobile guards, elite marines, and unreliable national guards. Meanwhile, starting on September 16th, the German 3rd and 4th armies arrive and begin to stretch a 48-kilometer long siege ring around the city. 300,000 German troops are facing about 450,000 French soldiers, but many of the French units are poorly trained and inexperienced new conscripts, or irregular armed civilian francs-tireurs. The French also have 3,000 guns to defend Paris and its 2 million civilians, who are now at risk of being trapped in a siege. The Germans now have several options. They can try to take Paris by storm, but this would certainly be costly because of the strength of French fortifications, and it might even fail. They could also bombard the city into submission, but this would cause heavy civilian casualties of the kind that previously earned international condemnation at Strasbourg. They might also starve the city into surrender, but the chief of the general staff, von Molke, thinks that Paris will quickly give in. King Wilhelm is much more skeptical, and he tells that to von Molke. Just wait. Now the war is just beginning. Whatever option the Germans choose to take Paris, they still need to wait for the heavy guns to arrive. The armies have moved faster than the siege artillery, and German troops only occupy one suitable hill at Châtillon. And even this position is eight kilometers away from the city center. As the Germans surround Paris with superior forces, the French make a desperate attempt to stave off encirclement southwest of the city, at the Battle of Sceaux. On September 18th, the Germans have not yet completely surrounded Paris. To stop them from closing the ring, General Ducrot's corps launches an attack on Sceaux so before the German Third Army can take up its positions. But Ducrot's 30 to 40,000 men are mostly mobile guardsmen, new drafts, and inadequately trained volunteers. Many of the soldiers were only conscripted earlier this week, and there's a shortage of weapons and uniforms. Despite these problems, the French assault begins at 5 a.m. the next day from Viry-Châtillon. Their artillery shells two Prussian regiments entrenched in the forest before the infantry engages in close combat. Losses are heavy on both sides, and the Prussians hold the line. Once the French retreat, several Bavarian regiments arrive, bringing the German numbers up to about 15,000. But they're still outnumbered by more than two to one. 
The Germans move their artillery into position on the French left flank and open fire with explosive shells. By 9 a.m., Ducrot's forces are in retreat or flight, and the Battle of Sceaux, also known as the Battle of Châtillon, is over. The German ring around Paris closes, and the siege of the City of Lights begins. The day after the battle, Irish war correspondent William Howard Russell visits the battlefield with Prussian Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm. His observations reflect his depressed mood after observing weeks of slaughter. To be obliged to direct my horse carefully through the turnip fields outside Paris, lest he should trample on a dead Frenchman, causes me some natural dégoût. Why will not people stay at home and not go out of their own country to kill each other? It is because of that French mania for la gloire that the sedate German is now on the road to Versailles, concocting noble vengeances for what the ancestor of his fallen foes did to his grandfather, if not his grandmother. French writer Edmond de Goncourt is shocked to see the defeated French troops fleeing from Sceaux at the Point de Jour gate in Paris. Another platoon of Zouaves near the Madeleine Church. One of them, laughing nervously, told me that there was no battle, that it was immediately sauve qui peut, every man for himself. He did not fire a round. Goncourt also notices the mounting tension in a city that knows it's now under siege. Nervous crowds in the streets are quick to panic or violently turn on alleged thieves or spies based on nothing more than rumors. The people of Paris are afraid. The German victory at Sceaux marks the encirclement of Paris and allows the German army to occupy the French royal palace at Versailles. German wounded are treated in the famous Hall of Mirrors, while their leaders begin to discuss a future German Reich. Although Bavarians, Württembergers, Hessians, Badeners, and the members of the North German Confederation are fighting side by side in this war, German political unity is still far off. Otto von Bismarck wants to transform the Prussian-dominated North German Confederation into a Prussian-dominated German Empire by adding the South German states. Initial talks had taken place back in August, but have started to gain momentum after the victory at Sedan two weeks ago. Bismarck has the complicated task of overseeing the war and trying to create a new empire but he's helped by the president of the Chancellery of the North German Confederation, Rudolf von Delbruck. Another difficulty is that many Prussians look down on their southern allies, including Bismarck, according to Saxon writer Moritz Busch. In German papers, one reads that boss Bismarck said that at the Battle of Sedan, Prussia's allies performed best. He actually said that they helped as best they could. The southern states are definitely the weaker partner in these talks. Baden had been close to Prussia since 1848-49 and wants to join the Confederation. Hesse also agrees to join as it is too small and weak to resist the political pressure. In the larger kingdoms of Württemberg and Bavaria, the ruling groups realize that they cannot preserve their independence. German patriotism fired by wartime victories and common sacrifice is too strong to resist. And the two kingdoms now hope to get special rights in exchange for joining a new empire. On September 12th, Bavaria rejects a simple accession to the Confederation and asks to begin negotiations about special rights, probably to avoid appearing pushed into things by Prussia. The next day, Delbruck presents the southern states with a program approved by Bismarck. The proposal goes a long way towards meeting the demands of the southerners, especially Bavaria. The new Reich would be a federal union based on the North German constitution, which the southern Germans would join while keeping their formal independence. The emperor, however, would always be the king of Prussia. 
a conference on the future constitution, is scheduled for next week in Munich. Bismarck also has his hands full on other diplomatic fronts this week. He's trying to stop his generals from deliberately humiliating the French, and he's also engaged in difficult negotiations with French Foreign Minister Jules Favre. On September 19th, Bismarck informs Favre that Alsace and Lorraine must be given to Germany as part of a peace deal. Favre refuses and insists that the French Republic is not responsible for the war started by the former empire. But Bismarck is unmoved. The French also suffer a diplomatic setback, as newspapers report that British attempts at mediating a common position for peace talks have failed. The French press also publishes German preconditions for armistice talks. The surrender of besieged fortresses, Strasbourg's garrison to be made prisoner, and giving up a key fort outside Paris. The Journal Officiel is outraged. Que l'Europe soit juge, may Europe be the judge. For us, the enemy has revealed himself. He forces us to choose between duty and dishonor. Our choice is made. This week, the Germans defeat the French at the Battle of Sceaux, the Siege of Paris begins, and the German states begin to discuss a future empire. The Battle at Sceaux reveals the dark side of the People's War proclaimed by the young French Republic. Inexperienced amateur troops without properly trained officers have little chance against the battle-hardened and well-led Germans. The result is not a glorious liberation, but a brutal defeat and heavy casualties. Paris now awaits its fate, while German leaders forge a plan for a new empire outside its walls. In September 1870, the German states fighting against France are only starting to discuss unifying into a single nation state, which will later earn Germany the nickname the Belated Nation. Italy is another latecomer to the nation-state club. In the first half of the 19th century, the Italian peninsula was also divided into various kingdoms, duchies and counties. By 1861, most of today's Italy was united under the leadership of the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont and King Vittorio Emanuele II. This unification followed several wars, a process known as the Risorgimento, which also made a national hero of revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. The success of Italian Prime Minister Camillo Benso Conte di Cavour in the Risorgimento served as an inspiration for Otto von Bismarck's hopes to unify Germany, which were now being put into practice. In the eyes of the Italian king and his prime minister, their nation-state is not complete in 1870. The Papal States are still under the control of the papacy. And even though Italian forces had taken much of its territory in the wars of unification, Rome and Lazio are still ruled by the Pope. In the years before 1870, Napoleon III provided military support to help in the unification of Italy, including in the Sardinian War against Austria in 1859. But he also protected the independence of the Papal States, which was guaranteed by French troops stationed in Rome. Napoleon III had helped Italy to become a nation-state, but the French garrison in the Papal States is a thorn in the side of Italian nationalist dreams. They see Rome as the true capital of Italy, and with cries of Rome or death, have been demanding the end of the Papal States since 1861. The collapse of the French Empire after Sedan gives them the chance they've been waiting for this week. When the Franco-Prussian War broke out back in July 1870, Emperor Napoleon III withdrew the French forces that had been protecting the Pope in Rome since they were badly needed in France. Pope Pius IX is now left with a small, poorly trained army, which includes about 3,000 papal zouaves. These fiercely Catholic volunteers have come from all over the world to protect the head of their church. 
There are papal zouaves from the Netherlands, the southern German states, Ireland, France, the United States, Austria, Spain and Canada. Once the French imperial troops leave Rome, there's little hope that the Pope's ragtag army can resist the Italians. So on the night of September 11th to 12th, 1870, the Italian army invades the Papal States at Ponte Felice in the Tiber Valley. The Pope wants to fight, but his 13,000 fighters under Baden General Hermann von Kanzler are poorly equipped and outnumbered three to one. At first, there's hardly any fighting, but this changes on September 20th, when Italian troops storm Rome. Nationalists like Giuseppe Gerzoni are enthusiastic. The legs dance, the ranks form by magic. The weapons are seized in a flash, the cavalry leads the way. The artillery lines up in its place, and the infantry marches in unison. Viva Roma! Italian Commander-in-Chief General Raffaele Cadorna orders the attack to begin at 5.15 a.m. Artillery opens fire on the Eternal City and breaches the city walls at the Porta Pia Gate at 9 o'clock. There's a short fight for the breach, but at 9.50 Pope Pius IX raises the white flag. The brief battle costs the lives of 60 men, and surrender negotiations are over by 3 in the afternoon. The papal troops are dismissed and the Zouaves released to return to their homelands. The majority of Romans welcome their Italian conquerors, according to the envoy of the North German Confederation, Harry Count of Arnim. The number of those who really regret the fall of the Pope's temporal power is vanishingly small. The hatred against the foreign regiments, against the police, against the whole old system of government is too general and too deeply rooted. Celebrations in Rome go on for several days and nights, and General Cadorna publishes an exuberant proclamation. Romans the morning of September 20th, 1870, marks one of the most memorable dates in history. Rome once again has forever returned to being the great capital of a great nation. And September 20th is still a national holiday in Italy today. Meanwhile, some of the former papal zouaves don't actually go home. Instead, they decide to head for France on September 25th and join the French Republic in its fight against the German alliance. As staunch Catholics, they're no fans of the Liberal Republic, but they do want to fight against the hated Protestant Prussians. The Zouaves renamed themselves the Volontaires de l'Ouest and joined the French forces on the Loire River. Events in the Franco-Prussian War lead to the fall of the Papal States to the Kingdom of Italy this week. But the battlefields in France are relatively calm. The Siege of Paris began on September 19th, but French troops and civilians in Metz have been besieged now for weeks. Marshal Bazaine's Army of the Rhine has been trapped in Metz alongside the civilian population since August 19th. They're surrounded by the forces of the German Second Army, including Staff Officer Major Hans von Kretschmann. Kretschmann writes nearly daily to his wife Jen and reports on daily life with the besieging army. He complains about supply shortages, the difficulties of siege logistics, but also about hygiene problems. On September 21st, he writes from the village of Verneville outside Metz. The place has been disinfected with chlorine and carbolic acid, and it's taken on a certain chic. But imagine a village of 750 inhabitants where about 12,000 men are quartered. Any soldier who relieves himself in a spot not meant for this purpose is arrested. But this is the only way to avoid epidemics. Doch nur so kann man Epidemien vermeiden. He also writes of the constant rain, the spread of dysentery, and that he considers himself to be in a Pestloch, a plague pit. Kretschmann experiences the siege from an officer's point of view, 
but he also writes about the problem of camp prostitution, which he considers a lower class issue. The men have been away from their wives and fiancés for eight weeks, and Kretschmann is disgusted by what he sees. We are now beginning to get to know a part of the French population that I thought existed only in Paris. Elegantly made up French women, all pretending to be the wives of officers, prowl about everywhere. But the trappings of their social position are not to be overlooked. Naturally, precautions are taken to put an end to this business. The officers order constant drill and occasional gymnastics in the hopes of channeling the men's sexual energy elsewhere. This week, another task keeping the men outside Metz occupied is digging up dead officers for transport to their families in Germany. Inside Metz, more than 250,000 French soldiers and civilians are suffering from overcrowding, food shortages, and a lack of medical supplies for the 20,000 wounded and sick. Conditions in the hospitals are catastrophic, and many wounded die of diarrhea and typhoid. Belgian Red Cross nurse Ida de Cronburg describes the stress experienced by a fellow nurse separated from her child who stayed behind. She tells me that her only son, age 12, is currently trapped in Metz. Like many other mothers anxious for their own children, she said the only thing that stilled her anguish was the relief she provided for the poor wounded soldiers. Some residents feel that Bazaine and the army should be doing more to break the siege. On the 27th, the mayor receives a call to action signed by 800 Messins. We believe the army gathered beneath our walls is capable of great things, but we also believe it's time it actually did such things. Nous croyons aussi qu'il est temps qu'elle les fasse. This week, Rome falls to the Kingdom of Italy in the absence of French support, and the brutal siege of Metz continues. The French Empire's collapse earlier this month not only contributes to events in Italy. When news of the Third Republic reaches the French-held island of Martinique this week, black residents rise up against the French colonial system. But few in war-torn France pay them much attention. In Paris, in Metz and other surrounded cities, the besieged and besiegers alike suffer, and there is no end in sight. Many cities in eastern France have been encircled by German forces since their advance in August. Toul surrendered last week on September 23rd, but others are still holding out. These include Strasbourg and its garrison of about 18,000 troops alongside 80,000 civilians. The Germans have about 50,000 men and made preparations to take Strasbourg by storm earlier this month, but they want to avoid a costly attack and hope to starve and shell the city into surrender. The French garrison tries several times to destroy the Germans' parallels, or jumping off trenches, outside of the city walls but without success. The French do manage to flood the southern apron defenses and deny the Germans this potential avenue of attack. German General von Werder stops the bombardment of the city itself with its historic buildings because he's keenly aware of its symbolic importance back home, and because of the international condemnation of the initial shelling. But Prussian siege mortar fire does gradually destroy parts of the fortress walls, bastions, and lunette fortifications. The shelling and the starvation of French troops and civilians in Strasbourg is effective from the German point of view. On September 11th, Red Cross delegates from Switzerland evacuate the elderly, the sick, and the wounded from the city. Only now do the people in Strasbourg learn about the defeat at Sedan, the capture of the Emperor, and the Third Republic. French Commander General Jean-Jacques Ouriche now knows that there's no hope for relief. 8,000 people have been made homeless by the shelling, which has destroyed 500 houses. 
The destitute live on the streets, in huts, in holes in the ground, or in schools or churches. But Urich does not want to surrender and refuses to negotiate with the Germans. On the 23rd, Grand Duke Friedrich I of Baden writes to Urich, imploring him to surrender on humanitarian grounds. Mon Général, you no longer have a legal government to which you're responsible. You have only one responsibility, the one before God, celle devant Dieu. The Germans have resigned themselves to an eventual assault on the city when on September 27th, Strasbourg suddenly surrenders. The city walls are breached in numerous places from the shelling, and Urich decides, after all, that he wants to spare bloody street fighting the French are bound to lose. He informs Paris of his decision and then writes to General Verda. La résistance de Strasbourg est arrivée à son terme. The resistance of Strasbourg has come to an end. I will ask for the gentlest possible treatment for the city, which has already been so cruelly tested. The next day, Urich informs the city of his decision. Let us close our eyes, if we can, on the sad and painful present and turn them to the future. There we will find the support of the unfortunate, hope, l'espérance. Urich sacrifices his personal gloire to spare unnecessary death and suffering, a courageous act which will later cause him to be accused of treason by the Republic. On September 30th, the 189th anniversary of King Louis XIV's disputed incorporation of Strasbourg into France and the birthday of Prussian Queen Augusta, the Germans enter the historic city. General von Werder and his staff enter the town on foot rather than on horseback to show their respect for Urich's determined defense, and Werda embraces his defeated enemy to console him. The siege of Strasbourg costs the French 562 dead and 17,000 prisoners, along with 1,277 artillery pieces, 140,000 rifles, and 50 locomotives. 341 civilians die, and up to 2,000 are wounded in the bombardment. The Germans lose 177 men killed, 715 wounded, 44 missing, and 78 horses. In all the German states, people take to the streets to celebrate and light bonfires. Prussian Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm confides his joy and his concerns to his diary. I told everyone in the streets, the troops on drill, and everywhere else there were cheers. The surrender of Strasbourg is an extremely weighty success. In my opinion, we must immediately provide proof that we want to make up for the destruction that was unfortunately unavoidable during the war. In this way, one achieves moral conquests. Auf solche Weise erzielt man moralische Eroberungen. Strasbourg has fallen to the Germans, and General von Werder's troops now move on to reduce other French fortresses that are threatening the German communication lines in the east. Meanwhile, outside besieged Paris, French forces make another attempt to break the siege at Chevilly. Since September 20th, German headquarters are located at Louis XIV's palace at Versailles to direct the siege of the capital. The French desperately want to smash through the German ring around the city, but their weaker forces face long odds. During the night of September 29th to 30th, General Joseph Vinois's French 13th Corps prepares for an assault south of Paris with about 20,000 men. They're up against the about 60,000 Germans of General Wilhelm von Tümpling's Silesian 6th Corps and parts of 5th Corps. The French attack begins at dawn, 
and in the center of the line, they run into Prussian troops entrenched in a walled farming area in the hamlet of Chevilly. The strong walls and the thick lime trees offer excellent protection for the Prussians, and they're able to hold their positions without significant losses. By the time the French withdraw, Chevilly is destroyed, and 2,120 French soldiers are killed, wounded or captured, along with 441 Germans. For the Germans, the French sally out of Paris is a minor affair. Bismarck press chief and propagandist Maurice Bush's diary entry is simply matter of fact. Man will aus der Gegend von Paris her wieder Schüsse gehört haben. Shots are said to have been heard again around Paris. And in the evening, the chief has me telegraph this with the addition that a sortie has taken place and that the French have been driven back into the city with heavy loss and in wild flight. As Strasbourg falls and the noose around Paris tightens, the German literary and artistic interpretation of the war has already begun. Painters, journalists and writers are already with the third German army to sing its praises. But now a well-known Berlin author decides to join them. Theodor Fontana is a well-known Prussian theatre critic and journalist. He hasn't written his most famous novels yet in 1870, but he is working on a history of the 1866 Austro-Prussian War, when the war with France begins in July. His publisher at the Königlich Geheime Oberhofdruckerei, which is also responsible for publishing Prussian casualty lists, asks him to switch his writing efforts to the current war. He somewhat reluctantly agrees, not knowing that this time his life would be in danger. On September 27th, he takes the train to France to see the battlefield for himself. On the 29th, he arrives in Vissembourg and visits the destroyed train station and Geisberg Hill. On the 30th, he stops in Wörth-Frischweiler and stands on the hill from which the Crown Prince had directed German troops. A few days later, he shares his impressions with his wife, Emilie. The whole trip is instructive, interesting, and downright uplifting to the highest degree. Everything is full of character. Our advance is an organized migration of peoples. Ever new masses flood the country, whose population is amazed and shakes its head but is unbroken in its conceit and in its childish hope for victory. On October 3rd, Fontana visits the recently surrendered fortress of Toul, where his son George had been part of the besieging army. On the train to Toul, Fontana meets a hussar who knows George and tells him that his son is safe, even though Fontana himself won't be safe for long. This week, the Germans accept the surrender of Strasbourg, the French fail to crack the German lines at Chevilly, and Theodore Fontana arrives in France. With the fall of Strasbourg, the Germans have won a politically symbolic victory. Curious German tourists begin to arrive in the city, which is in German hands again after nearly two centuries. As for the citizens of Paris, the failure of their army at Chevilly is a sign to come for the hard months ahead. By this week, the beginning of October 1870, the Germans essentially see the war as having been decided. Paris and Metz are under siege, symbolically important Strasbourg has been captured, and the French Empire and its army no longer exist. The French Republic has barely any armies outside of Paris, but the days of traditional battles and clear-cut German victories are over. The war is becoming a bitter series of partisan raids and revenge attacks fueled by chauvinistic hatred. The war could be ended, but the German demands for French territory mean that the Third Republic has to continue fighting if it wants to preserve its legitimacy. Outside of Paris, the French government is building up new armies to continue the struggle, 
and clings to the hope that Marshal Bazaine's forces might somehow break out of Metz. But to most, the cause seems lost. Both sides' decisions mean that this war won't be over any time soon. On October 5th, the Germans establish their grand headquarters at Versailles. The 3rd German Army Command is already there, but now they're joined by Moltke, King Wilhelm, Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm, and of course Bismarck. It's lesser-known Prussian politician Rudolf von Delburg, though, who's preparing the groundwork for the planned unification of the German Empire. The possibility of a single Kaiserreich is foreseen in the constitution of the North German Confederation. The relations of the Confederation with the South German states shall be regulated by special treaties to be submitted to the Reichstag for approval. The entry of all or any of the South German states into the Confederation shall be effected on the proposal of the Federal Presidium by way of federal legislation. Delegations from Württemberg, Baden, Bavaria, Hesse and Saxony arrive at Versailles to discuss the terms and to extract concessions from the Northerners if they can. Bismarck rarely has time to write to his wife Johanna, but he does manage an apology this week. So don't be angry with me. The ink-stained world of business has caught up with me on my journey and overwhelms me such that I hate the inkwell from which it flows. While the internal German political horse trading is going on at Versailles, on October 7th, French Interior Minister Léon Gambetta is charged with organizing the military resistance in the provinces outside of Paris, and he promptly takes flight. Over the past few weeks, famous photographer Nadar oversees the manufacture of hot air balloons in Paris that can be used to observe German positions or fly out carrier pigeons. Since the balloons fly out but not in, the pigeons' return trips are the only way that information can reach Paris from the outside world. The balloons also fly out more than two million letters during the siege, and they often have messages for the Germans too. French balloon operators drop tens of thousands of propaganda leaflets over German lines to remind them of their fatherly duties and encourage them to desert. In any case, the siege will last a long time, and already one sees Germany far from home for the entire winter, the flower of her people far from wife and child, wailing in misery for their breadwinners. Not all balloons reach their destinations, though. The Germans shoot down many of the mail balloons, and letters from Paris were a coveted souvenir to send back home. The same day that the leftist and nationalist minister Gambetta becomes responsible for the war outside of Paris, he uses one of Nadar's balloons to make a spectacular escape from the blockaded capital. At 11 o'clock, he takes to the air in a balloon named Armand Barbès from the Place Saint-Pierre at the foot of Montmartre. But there's no clear plan. The group simply hopes to land where there are no Germans. His and a second balloon are fired upon as they cross over Prussian lines, including by the first ever anti-aircraft guns used in history. Gambetta is lightly wounded on the hand, though the French press exaggerates with claims of 100,000 bullets fired. Around 4 p.m., Gambetta's balloon lands in Epineuse, about 100 kilometers north of Paris. The mayor of the small town guides Gambetta through the Prussian lines undetected, and he safely reaches the French-held city of Tours. Tours is the center of the government's plan to form new armies outside of Paris, forces that are being armed mostly with weapons imported from the United States. On October 9th, Gambetta issues a proclamation preparing the public for mass conscription. We must finally put all our immense resources to work and at last inaugurate national war. Let us rise en masse and die 
rather than suffer shame and dismemberment. Levons-nous donc en masse et mourons plutôt que de subir la honte et le démembrement. Gambetta also meets with Italian nationalist hero of the Risorgimento, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who puts himself at the service of the French Republic along with his troops. The 180 formal papal zouaves who have fled Rome since its capture by Italy also arrive in Tours this week under the command of the anti-Prussian arch-Catholic Comte Athanase Charles Marie Charette de la Contrie. Gambetta is now leading French efforts at rearming for all-out war. What this guerre à outrance actually means in practice is experienced firsthand by German soldiers and French civilians this week at Abli. One element of Gambetta's national war to the extreme are the irregular francs-tireurs, or free shooters, who only wear partial uniforms and sometimes none at all. They operate in small units to engage in partisan-style attacks and are able to melt into familiar terrain and civilian surroundings. The Germans don't recognize them as regular combatants and execute any that they capture. Villages or towns where francs-tireurs attack German troops are forced to pay large fines, and if they refuse, the Germans set them on fire. From the German point of view, these are legitimate wartime measures, but others consider it targeted terror. The difficulty in identifying irregular troops means that German authorities also execute some innocent Frenchmen. These policies lead to criticisms of Germany abroad, and increasing hatred in France. Journalist Friedrich Engels paints a stark picture for his British readers in the Pall Mall Gazette. A Bavarian officer writes from the vicinity of Orléans that his unit had burned five villages in 12 days. It is no exaggeration. Wherever the German flying columns march into the heart of France, their path is all too often marked with fire and blood. Even if the Front tireurs pose a serious threat to the German army, which is far from clear, there's a legitimate debate about whether German retaliatory acts can be considered war crimes. On the other hand, although the Hague land warfare regulations are not in force in 1870, Front tireurs guerrilla warfare is also problematic. On the night of October 7th to 8th at Abli, Front tireurs ambush a unit of hussars from Schleswig-Holstein in their sleep. The French then execute at least one of the surviving prisoners. According to German reports, Prussian infantry swiftly takes revenge. The order was given to loot and demolish. All food and provisions were taken out, as well as livestock and then the whole place was set on fire and turned into a pile of ashes. The women, children and old people were given time to leave. Men were mercilessly shot or cut down. Männer wurden erbarmungslos erschossen oder niedergehauen. The German report gives the impression that all the men are killed, but the Abli memorial plaque only lists six civilian men who were shot. It's not clear whether the Germans have evidence that these men are francs-tireurs. If they do, it's arguably justifiable according to the thinking at the time. If they don't, it's pure terror. Burning villages was common in the American Civil War just a few years ago, but is no longer customary in Western Europe in 1870. One German hussar, at least, is uncomfortable with retribution. Although the population deserved this punishment for their hostile attitude, the scene that met the eyes was cast in a ghastly light. The wailing of the women beside their men who'd been shot created such an embarrassing impression that one wished never again to be forced to order a similar execution. This week, the German states continue discussions on forming a German empire, 
Léon Gambetta floats out of Paris to organize a people's war, and Franc Tireur ambushed the Germans at Abli. The attack at Abli and the resulting German retribution are the consequence of Gambetta's fanatical determination to exhaust all the intellectual, material, and propaganda resources of the nation to fight on. The Germans refuse to recognize this new kind of war and find no other response than brutal retaliation, a pattern that will continue next week and beyond. By the second week of October 1870, it's clear that German hopes for an end to the war after Sedan are pipe dreams. Paris is besieged, but resisting, and in Tours, Gambetta is rapidly raising new French armies in the provinces. The Armée de la Loire in the west, the Armée du Nord in the north, and another force in the east. The French plan is for the fresh armies on the Loire and in the north to relieve Paris in conjunction with a breakout by the besieged garrison. But these are a far cry from the professional forces of the Second Empire. The new army's weapons are obsolete or British or American imports, the troops are raw, and many are teenagers. The Eastern Army also includes 4,000 international volunteers under Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. His optimistically named Armée des Vosges has fighters from France, the US, Italy, Hungary, Poland and Spain, all united in their hatred for Protestant monarchical Prussia. The Armée de la Loire wastes no time in moving on Paris to break the narrow German siege ring surrounding the city. The Germans realize the danger, so they send a Bavarian corps under General Ludwig von der Tann, along with a North German division and some cavalry, towards the city of Orléans. On October 10th, the two forces clash at Artenay, and they do so again on the 11th at Orme where the former papal zouave in French ranks receive their baptism of fire. The Bavarians get the better of the French, whose army was still in the process of organizing, and 3,000 French troops are made prisoner. Prussian Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm confides his impressions to his diary. Among the French prisoners are youths of 16 and 17, who sobbed when they were brought in. Such forced recruits are found among the line troops as well as the Franc Tireur. What a pity. Es ist zum Erbarmen. The Germans occupy Orléans and throw a bridgehead across the Loire River to spoil any further French plans. But the victorious German troops are by no means comfortable. Bavarian infantryman Florian Kuhnhauser recalls his first thoughts when entering Orléans. Jetzt kam die Magenfrage. Now came the stomach question, because it had been neglected for two whole days. But where to find something edible when faced with empty streets and closed doors? Necessity and hunger make one resourceful. Everyone knew enough French to figure out which shops stocked food. So there we knocked and made a ruckus until the door was opened voluntarily. If it wasn't, the store was often broken into by force, followed by a fire sale at the expense of the owners. Prussian and Bavarian units that were not needed to hold Orléans now made their way back towards Paris clearing the route of snipers and mobile guard stragglers who the German command sees to be threatening the rear of the armies besieging Paris. Meanwhile, the heavy guns in the many large forts surrounding Paris are firing on German positions. Fort Montvalérien has been shelling the Prussian and Bavarian troops stationed in Saint-Cloud since October 12th, and on October 13th, Napoleon III's private castle in the town burns to the ground. This shelling is in support of an attempted French breakout. The French at first push back the second Bavarian Corps, but the Germans recover and hold the line.
Hi guys, Jonathan Ferguson, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery here at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK. Thanks very much for having us on again to explore another lesser known small arm of the Franco-Prussian War. This time it's the Bavarian Verder, which I have an example of here. Um, there are three main variants of this thing. This is the type that would have seen service in the war, hence showing it to you today. The best way to spot one is this traditional rifle musket style rear sight on the back, which tells you that this is still chambered in 11 millimeters uh, by 50 um, case length, which is the original chambering. That said, this is for 1868, when it started development, introduced in 1869, this is a very modern system. It's a cartridge breech loader, proper self-contained metallic cartridge. It's 11 millimeter in caliber, so it's still quite chunky, um, not, not sort of proper high velocity yet, but this is the 1860s, of course. So we're getting there if we view technology as a linear progression. Um, Sighted up to 1,200 meters, now at that distance you're lobbing shots in as you were with a rifle musket. So, not a, not a, in some ways not a dramatic improvement, but it's, it's pretty, um, it's 11 millimeters, same as the Chaspo, so it's pretty analogous to the Chaspo. Um, so on, on paper, Bavaria would have been going into the Franco-Prussian War ahead of the game, but we're coming to that. Brief word on the, on the mechanics of it first, what makes this special? And it's this humpback receiver. So it has this, this hammer arrangement, but it's sort of largely internal. What appears to be two triggers, which are not two triggers. So rather than the Martini, which is derived from the same rifle, the, uh, the Peabody, same system, tilting block, rather than the Martini where you drop the lever, cartridge in, close it up, which cocks it as well, and you fire it, with this one, you start with the block dropped, that's its rest state, that's eased springs, as, as they say in the, used to say in the British Army, still do. Um, so you insert your cartridge in that condition, you then cock it, which also closes up the breech block, you then fire it, and we will dry fire for the rest of the wants there, so that's in the fired state, you don't then re-cock it to drop the block, in fact we can show that does nothing to the block doesn't drop the block because we have compressed a second spring inside here. Why? You might ask. Well, so that when you hit the front trigger, it's not really a trigger, the block drops under spring pressure and the case, the fire case, is chucked out of here with quite a bit of force. So it's a bit of a one-trick pony in that it's very positive extraction and ejection for a manually operated single-shot rifle but it does that very well. Um, and that would increase your effective rate of fire. Downside, mechanically complex, therefore expensive, and time consuming to produce. And unfortunately for Bavaria, they did not manage to get enough of these produced to see service across the board in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, I think only four battalions were equipped with these um, out of a pretty sizable army. The others would have been stuck with the 1858-67 um, Podewils, forgive my pronunciation, Lindner rifle, which is, was a capping breech loader conversion, not, not this high-tech um, shenanigans, but a simple percussion cap breech loading rifle that came into service in 1867. So they were effectively relying upon their stopgap rifle for the first phase of the war, at least. Um, perhaps we'll find out more about that as the guys here at Real Time History dig a little deeper into the military history. So that's the Verder, not to be confused with the Austrian Verndel, uh, which is a very different rifle. Against this was actually trialed along with the Russian Verdan before it was, uh, this was selected for service in 1869. Um, this is the Bavarian Verder. So thanks again for having us. Uh, do head over to our own channel over at Royal Armouries. We'll be doing a, our own deeper dive into this rifle, and we have our other um, firearms-related content there. And you'll also find me over on the GameSpot video game channel as well. Thank you again for having us, guys. Appreciate it.
The French attempt to push to Paris from the west had been defeated at Orléans, but the situation in and around the city was far from quiet. As conditions in the French capital continue to deteriorate after three weeks of siege, foreign diplomats gradually leave the city. Though politics is still alive and well at German headquarters in Versailles. Former French Prime Minister Emile Olivier writes to King Wilhelm asking him to renounce territorial claims in the event of a German victory. But the Prussian king refuses. Prussia's answers aren't so simple in the negotiations between Bismarck and the South German states on the unification of the empire. This week, Bavaria and Württemberg continue to try to get the best possible deal. But the Grand Duchy of Baden's pro-Prussian position prevents the Southerners from adopting a united front. In fact, the Badeners already asked to join the North German Confederation two weeks ago. So little progress is made. The Germans also can't agree on what to do about Paris. Bismarck wants the war to end as soon as possible, so he argues in favor of bombarding the city. He's worried that the longer the war goes on, the more likely other powers like Britain and Russia might get involved and disrupt his plans for German unification and territorial annexations from France. Two of his key commanders, though, disagree. Moltke opposes bombardment on military grounds, and the Crown Prince rejects the idea for humanitarian reasons, and because he fears that shelling civilians and cultural monuments like Notre Dame Cathedral could damage German prestige. King Wilhelm, who is formerly the Commander-in-Chief, wavers between the two sides. The fact is, the Germans still don't have enough fortress artillery to carry out a decisive bombardment. But Bismarck, who is not a professional soldier, refuses to believe it. Instead, he gets his press agent, Moritz Busch, to stir up German newspapers in support of shelling Paris. Negotiations between the Germans and the French also continue this week, including through an American intermediary. Former US Civil War General Ambrose Burnside is in talks with the French to sound out a possible peace between the warring parties. He makes the journey from Paris to Versailles in a rowboat, since the bridge at Sèvres has been destroyed. But his efforts bring no results. The Comte de Rissant also crosses the river as he accompanies French emissaries to Versailles. He records the procedure at the checkpoint where signal horns announce the arrival of the negotiating parties. The two bells could be heard from a great distance in the pauses between the shooting, for there reigned in these parts an extraordinary, solemn, mournful silence. In some supernatural way, the silence of death. The silence that came before the appearance of life on Earth. Between the advanced sentinels posted on the two banks, one could have heard a pin drop. And it seemed that the Seine itself, sliding slowly through this desolate landscape, had smothered the murmur of these waters. La Seine elle-même, glissant lentement dans ce paysage désolé, avait assourdi le murmure de ces eaux. While the Germans negotiate their future empire and peace talks are going nowhere at Versailles, a Prussian writer and history buff accidentally gets himself into a world of trouble. Prussian journalist Theodor Fontana arrived in German-occupied France last week on a fact-finding mission for his new book on the war. Since he's a keen student of history, he decides to travel from Toul to Domremy to visit the birthplace of Joan of Arc on October 5th. But he doesn't realize that Domremy is still in French hands, and as soon as he arrives, Franz Hirer arrests him as a spy. This week, he's transferred to a prison at Besançon, and the French threaten to execute him. 
Fontana looks down on the franc-tireur, but unlike many other Germans, he also feels sympathy for them. Many had a sense of how pretty they looked and never walked past the large mirror in the waiting room without glancing at themselves with satisfaction. All ages were represented, and next to rosy-cheeked youths, there were white heads, old troupiers who were obviously glad for a break from boring daily life. There was no thought of hatred or scorn for the Prussian they saw in me. They were too good-natured for that, and perhaps too busy with themselves. His French captors allow Fontana to write to his wife Emilia, which he does on October 14th. I am hoping for the best. Soon my complete innocence will be proven. But for someone like me, who has so far been pampered by luck, it remains a very difficult situation. Oh, Joan of Arc, I must pay dearly for you. Ich muss teuer für dich zahlen. This week, the Germans defeat the French at the Battle of Orléans and maintain the ring around Paris, and peace negotiations remain deadlocked. The French Republic's plan to pursue all-out war has brought no results so far, and the Germans are secure enough to be able to spend their time haggling over the shape of their future empire. As Theodore Fontana awaits his fate in his prison cell, he is not the only one who will fear for his life in the coming weeks. After the Battle of Orléans last week, Prussian and Bavarian units moving towards Paris are mopping up resistance from French snipers and mobile guards. On October 18th, they encounter fierce resistance at the town of Château d'Un. About 1,200 irregular franc-tireurs and National Guardsmen are entrenched in the town, even though it's been officially declared an open city, which means that it shouldn't be defended or attacked. The two sides shell each other until nightfall, when the Germans storm Château d'Un. There's bitter house-to-house -house fighting in the darkness, and the Germans are furious at the civilians and franc-tireurs. As at Bazay in September, German troops take revenge by shooting residents and setting fire to 235 buildings. Thuringian soldier Karl Zeitz struggles to understand the violence all around him. I don't know how it started. Our soldiers advanced one by one, rifle in one hand, burning brushwood in the other. They shouted at the French, so you want to defend house by house? Light them up, burn them out. Repeatedly, I tore the torches out of their hands and said, shoot, but don't burn. They answered, the French would burn us if they could. Civilians, even women, took part in the battle. They were found killed with shots to the head. No one who fought in this battle will ever forget it. Wohl jedem, der diesen Kampf mitgekämpft hat, wird er unvergesslich bleiben. Zeitz is an educated man, and he recognizes these events as a break with the civilized values of the time, like reason, religious faith, and progress. He does feel that the civilians deserve their fate, but he also has a conscience, and he writes that every time his unit passes through the town later in the war, the men stop singing their cheerful marching songs and trudge along in silence. Zeitz experiences a new kind of warfare at Châteaudun, one that will rear its head again in the 20th century. In fact, some Nazi war criminals on trial for executing hostages later used the precedent of Châteaudun in their defense. The French consider the burning of Châteaudun as German revenge for the spirited nighttime defense, as historian Arthur Chuquet writes later. To avenge the unexpected resistance, General von Wittich burned the town. Pour se venger de cette résistance imprévue, 
le général von Wittich brûla la ville. As late as the 1960s, French historians will praise the front tireurs' heroism, even though their resistance has no hope of succeeding and dooms the town to destruction. Hello, this is Sur le Champ from France. This battle of Châteaudun is an excellent opportunity to talk about the French troops that fought it, the front tireurs which you could translate by free shooters. But I'll keep saying front since this term applies explicitly to this French troop during the Franco-Prussian War. These front are essentially volunteers organized in corps francs. Free corps, that is to say they are irregular troops. In order to lead a war of partisans on the rear of the Prussian army. Nowadays we'd say guerrilla warfare. Simply said, the front must avoid open battles with well-organized troops, attack convoys or isolated forces, destroy infrastructures, etc. Anything to disturb the Prussian organization. But in Châteaudun, we do see some front fight directly with the Prussian troops. So what happened? First, we need to understand how the front were created. Even if these irregular troops appeared in a pretty chaotic situation in 1870, they do not come of nowhere. In 1867, Marshal Niel created the Garde Mobile in order to create a reserve of patriotic volunteers and so have more troops available for the Imperial Army. The idea was to form them quickly in order to have some irregular troops more or less ready to support the professional army. But this reform was never really financed. It just gave the administrative context for departmental regiments. After the defeat at Sedan, the idea of corps of front reappeared, but with a new cutter reference, the levée en masse. It's a bit complicated, but in short, the levée en masse was the response that the French Revolution found in order to strike back against the coalition armies invading France in 1793. After the Battle of Sedan, this idea is invoked by Gambetta and the newly proclaimed French Republic in order to defend the nation. The idea is simple. Every citizen must take up a rifle and defend the country. The German invasion, the end of the Second Empire or the Young Republic threatened, all of this creates a clear reference to the revolutionary times justifying a new levée en masse. If a part of the effort is put in raising new armies, the frontier corps appeal local fighters either to help the new government, in this case they are even organized and paid by the state, or to organize a local defense around a village, in which case it's almost purely a local initiative. In the end, the frontier may have numbered up to 70,000 combatants, mostly in the invaded north and east with diverse social origins. Students, workers, aristocrats, bourgeois, even some women in combat and command roles. In fact, the front essentially appealed to patriots. But were they effective? Well, the fact is that their effectiveness was pretty unpredictable. Yes, some corps have achieved their infamous exploits, like the destruction of the Fontenoy viaduct, but in the end, their impact was pretty weak. In some regions, like in the Vosges, they threatened some railways and depots, forcing the Germans to adapt and to leave some troops for supply trains protection. But in general, the frontier did nothing more than defend a few villages, or were just bandits. More dangerous for the locals than for the Germans. Since they lacked organization and weaponry, most of them using their own hunting rifle, the real consequence of their existence was a more brutal repression by the Germans. Their retaliations were harsh and the population wasn't keen on supporting some front who would never be able to stop the invading army. Guerrilla warfare in the long term may have brought some results, but the front quickly lost their independence and were merged to the regular army at the end of September, that is to say just one month after Sedan. This decision by Gambetta, which effectively took away the front only strength, has two interpretations, one military and one political. Militarily speaking, 
The defense of Paris quickly became the priority and Gambetta may have been looking for all available troops in order to oppose the siege or even break it. And this is more or less what we observe in the Battle of Châteaudun. During one week, 700 francs-tireurs harassed the German army between Paris and Châteaudun. And in the end, the corps that were in the city fought in order to slow the enemy advance, showing their strength, but also their weaknesses. They did inflict heavy losses considering their numerical inferiority, but they proved absolutely unable to stand their ground against the German army and didn't modify the ratio of power. So the military reason is a bit weak. If we want to understand Gambetta's decision, we need to turn to political explanation. After the Battle of Sedan, social tensions are pretty strong in France, leading to the end of the Second Empire. But at that time, the workers were organizing and some revolutionary groups were getting more and more active, especially radical socialists, communists and anarchists. Which in the end would lead various cities to rise up and found a commune, like the Commune de Paris, but that's another story. So you can understand that letting the people arm itself in a revolutionary context may have worried the government, which was more conservative. Which explained that Gambetta may have wanted to take back control of the frontierer, unpredictable troops that may have other political agendas. Government stability could have been a priority over the efficiency of a guerrilla warfare. Which led to the frontierer ending up in engagements they weren't fit for, like Châteaudun. These irregular troops had no major military impact, but they did traumatize the German troops. Blurring the frontier between civilians and soldiers, creating a constant threat, the frontierer forced the Germans to control the population with more and more force. This trauma outlasted the war, and the fear of the frontierer will be remembered by the German troops at the beginning of World War I. For more military history, you can check my channel in French at Sur le Champ. As Châteaudun burns near Paris, German and French forces in the east are also on the move. Along France's eastern border, both German and French troops have been maneuvering. The Germans occupy Schlettstadt, burn Neubreisach, and they capture Epinal. These advances forced the French to retreat to the fortress of Belfort and the town of Dijon, but not before several smaller battles like the one on the Ognon River on October 22nd take place. There, the Baden Field Division defeats newly raised French units, who are forced back to the town of Besançon. They're joined by Garibaldi's Armée des Vosges, part of the motley crew of French units operating in the area, which also include the Polish legion stationed at Lyon. Prussian writer Theodore Fontana is also in Besançon, where he's being held in the citadel, awaiting trial on charges of spying. He and his fellow German prisoners fear Garibaldi's arrival, but they're also worried that they might be in danger if German artillery bombards the prison. Fontana shares his concerns with the fortress commander. The commander answered, yes, these upper vaults will be blown away in five minutes. The comfort that flowed to German prisoners in response was understandably small, given the prospect of being shot to death by their own countrymen's shells. The fighting in the East is small scale for now, but that will change in the months to come. The main French concern at the moment is Paris, and this week, the French launch another attempt to break out of their besieged capital. Paris has been encircled for a month, and on October 21st, French troops try to break through the German ring again. General Ducrot's 10,000 men advance under the covering fire of the guns of Fort Montvalérien against General Hugo von Kirchbach's 5th Corps. 
This is one of the weaker spots in the German lines around the capital, so attacking here in conjunction with a relief assault from outside the city would make sense. Except that there is no help coming for Ducrot from the outside, since the Armée de la Loire is still too far away. The French Republic does need to demonstrate its will to fight, but the attack at Malmaison doesn't make military sense. Major Eugène de Serpent sees no point in the action. Could we hope that the 10,000 men of General Ducrot, young soldiers for the most part, would be vigorous enough to break through the enemy lines and fall, like an avalanche, on the German headquarters at Versailles? The battle does, however, cost lives. At first, the fighting is primarily an artillery duel, which is followed by a French attack. As the Germans sense their advantage, they successfully storm the castles at Malmaison and Buzenval. The fighting is so fierce at Buzenval that the French and Germans fight each other through the iron bars of the Long Boyau Gate. The French lose about 400 men and the Germans about 300. The Germans also shoot two French civilians as francs tireurs. Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm writes of the futility of the French effort in his diary. Der Feind vermochte nicht einmal unsere Vorpostenlinie zum Wanken zu bringen. The enemy was not even able to move our outpost line. French efforts at Malmaison and Buzenval have failed, and Paris remains surrounded. Just a few kilometers away at Versailles, German leaders argue amongst themselves as to whether Paris should starve or burn. Since the siege is dragging on, so do German discussions about whether Paris should be bombarded. Bismarck sees that the French Republic is using events like the destruction of Châteaudun for propaganda purposes, and international opinion is slowly turning against Prussia. He and Minister for War Albrecht von Roon argue for a massive bombardment to end the war. Bismarck's press secretary, Moritz Busch, succeeds in firing up German newspapers in support of a bombardment. He reasons that the French themselves are at fault. It was claimed that Paris, with its cultural collections, should not be bombarded. It was a crime against civilization. But why not? Paris is a fortress. If the French did not want their monuments and their collections of books and paintings to be endangered by war, they could not surround them with fortifications. But the Crown Prince and von Molke are still against it. They think a quick peace will benefit France and that starving Paris is a better option, as the Crown Prince notes in his diary on the 22nd. Today, the first work for the construction of the siege batteries began. Although I have ordered that the preparations for the siege be carried out with the greatest diligence and all possible prudence, I still hope that through hunger alone, we will force Paris to open its gates to us and that many lives will thus be spared. Journalist Friedrich Engels, who's writing in London, is also against the bombardment. He reasons that Paris is simply too large to be destroyed, since it would take one and a half million shells fired from 2,000 guns every day to bring the city to its knees. He also argues that the Germans can't afford to fail if they do try. If the mere bombardment of Paris did not force the city to surrender, and such a bombardment took place nonetheless, it would be a military blunder of a kind that hardly anyone would blame on Moltke's staff. One would say that Paris had been bombarded not for military, but for political reasons. This week, the war is deadlocked. The fighting at Châteaudun brings only death and destruction, as does the latest attempt by the French to break the siege of Paris. 
inflexible German territorial demands, and the French Republic's unbroken will to gain political legitimacy through resistance seem to leave little chance for peace. And at Versailles, the idea of crushing Paris under a hail of German shells is becoming more and more appealing. By the last week of October 1870, the fortress city of Metz has been under siege by the Germans for more than two months. The only major French breakout attempt at Noisville at the end of August failed. And since the defeat at Sedan, the 250,000 French troops and civilians trapped in Metz have no hope of relief. Food is in extremely short supply. French troops do manage to capture a few cows from the surrounding towns, but the main supplies of horse meat and salt are nearly gone. Despite the dire situation, Marshal Bazaine has not surrendered. In fact, he's still loyal to former Emperor Napoleon III. He doesn't want to sacrifice his army for a republic that he dislikes, and he even negotiates with the Prussians to restore the French monarchy. Two weeks ago, he sends General Napoleon Boyer, with German permission, to Versailles with an offer. If Bazaine and his Armée du Rhin can leave Metz, they could fight alongside the Prussians to destroy the Third Republic. Once the Germans and Bazaine had won, Bazaine would then create a new French army from the prisoners of war released from the German lands and restore Emperor Napoleon to his throne. Bismarck hears them out, but Bazaine and former Empress Eugenie refused to agree to the annexation of Alsace and Lorraine. By this week, it's clear that surrender is the only option in the face of hunger, disease, lack of medical care, and political inaction. The French try to negotiate better terms for two days, but the Germans don't budge. And on October 27th, Bazaine surrenders Metz and the Armée du Rhin unconditionally. The marshal tries to save face with a proclamation to his men. Defeated by famine, we are forced to submit to the laws of war by becoming prisoners. At various times in our military history, brave troops have suffered the same fate, which in no way diminishes military honor when, like us, one has performed one's duty so gloriously to the utmost human limit. Everything that could be done in good faith to prevent this end has been tried and has failed. I part from everyone with a broken heart. C'est le cœur brisé que je me sépare de tous. German officer Hans von Kretschmann takes a harsher view of the situation. The French surpassed what could be expected even from the bravest troops. However, had there only been a more intelligent leader in charge, the French would have broken out. Instead, they fired their cannons every day without achieving anything. They led their womenfolk up on the walls to show them a bit of the war and nothing more. The French soldiers were ordered to hand over their weapons intact, an emotional act for men like Clovis Hardy. Handing over everything without destroying it first was a complete humiliation. We refused. Whenever we could, we soaked the powder in water before delivering it to the arsenal so it could never be used against Frenchmen. I destroyed the butt of my chassepot out of anger and despair, under the eyes of an indulgent sergeant. Others did likewise. I even urinated in the powder kegs that I had broken open. 140,000 irreplaceable professional French troops are interned, but the Germans allow the French officers to keep their swords. Bazaine is even allowed to choose where he will be held, so he joins his emperor at Kassel. After the war, Bazaine will be convicted of treason and exiled to Spain. But already this week, many Frenchmen, including Clovis Hardy, consider him a traitor. 
When he left, no, in truth, when he fled, the Germans had to protect the wagon of the coward, this Bazen, from the stone throwing of the people of Metz. He left us to our fate, to the humiliation of losing. The sufferings of Ardi and others do not end with the surrender. Many die of illness or weakness on their way first to collection camps and then to the German states. Since many are still wearing their summer uniforms, the journey in open railway wagons also causes deaths from exposure. Back in Metz, French medical personnel like Ida de Combrugge and her fellow nurses are able to enter the city and provide care for the sick and wounded. Those who can be moved leave on October 29th and 30th in the pouring rain, and Major Hans von Kretschmann shares his impressions with his wife. You have no idea what the French must have suffered. Masses of dead horses along the road, soldiers living in earth huts made of excrement. The animals had eaten the leaves off all the trees and all the vines. A horse stands with its legs drawn together, then it collapses and dies of hunger. The surrender of Metz means the end of the belief in a miraculous French breakout and the loss of the last imperial army. At the same time, it frees two German armies and siege guns for operations elsewhere, including Paris, where the fighting continues this week with the Battle of Le Bourget. The fighting around the siege ring that surrounds Paris flares up again on October 28th at the village of Le Bourget. That night, several battalions of mobile guards and francs-tireurs attack the small Prussian garrison in the village. One of the francs-tireurs units, the francs-tireurs de la presse, is made up of newspapermen and led by popular author Gustave Aimard. The French managed to drive the Prussian guards' grenadier regiment out of Le Bourget by dawn. But this minor success is pointless, since the village has no strategic importance and General de Belmar ordered the attack without his superior's permission. The French victory also provokes a German response. They bombard the village at noon and the 2nd Kaiser Franz Guard Grenadier Regiment launches a counterattack in the evening. The 3,000 French defenders shoot down the Prussians as they struggle across the muddy ground and the French hold on to Le Bourget for now. This is the first success of French arms in the fighting around Paris, but the Prussians are not done. On the 29th, Prussian guns shell Le Bourget again, and on the 30th, nine guards battalions storm the village in the wet, cold and mud. The Prussian soldiers throw themselves into the mud to avoid French rifle fire and to regain their strength to continue through the muck. After 11 hours of fierce fighting and heavy losses, the Prussians retake Le Bourget and capture 1,300 French prisoners. Frenchman Louis Jezerski is highly critical of the action. There were three paths to take two good ones and one bad one. Naturally, we chose the latter. Instead of abandoning Le Bourget or making it defensible with artillery and massed infantry, we decided on an unfortunate middle course and tried it with a little infantry and even less artillery. Thus came what had to come. And once again, we had only the satisfaction of having effected a skillful retreat. Only in retreats, are we great? At German headquarters, the success barely registers, as Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm notes in his diary on October 31st. I'm not yet able to see the whole picture, but it seems to me possessing the village was not so important that it had to be retaken with such great sacrifices, especially as Le Bourget lies within our outposts and has only ever been occupied by half a company. This week has been another disaster for the French. 
they lose their last proper army at Metz, and they lose what was supposed to be their first victory at Le Bourget. But surrenders and defeats are not the only problem for the Third Republic's government of national defense. Many Frenchmen in Paris and the cities of the South can no longer stand the strain and are ready to rise against the government. The Commune is awakening. On October 31, 1870, Paris and several cities in the South experience another outbreak of revolutionary fervor by frustrated citizens. Tens of thousands of Frenchmen have been killed, hundreds of thousands taken prisoner, and a French victory seems even more unlikely after the surrender of Metz and the defeat last week at Le Bourget. These latest catastrophes are too much for many left-wing forces in the country who've had enough of the government of national defense. The so-called Red Quarters of Paris have been unhappy with the Third Republic, and leftists accuse Trachou's government of military incompetence, allying itself with French conservatives, allowing social injustice, and possibly surrendering to the Prussians. Charles-Louis de Lécluse's socialist newspaper Le Réveil even calls for the overthrow of the system and the establishment of a commune based on socialism and direct democracy. But these political factors are just the triggers. The real problem is the shortage of food and unequal access to it. Many Parisians are reduced to scavenging no man's land in front of the German siege ring for potatoes, an activity made possible because of sympathetic German troops often holding their fire. Wealthier Parisians, on the other hand, can still afford the high food prices. Citizens' anger about access to food is the main driver behind the uprising that breaks out on October 31st. A crowd of about 15,000 workers and National Guardsmen leave their working-class neighborhoods and Montmartre and push into the center of Paris. When they reach City Hall, they proclaim the Commune, and the crowd shouts out its political goals. Guerre à outrance, pas d'armistice, à bas les traîtres. War to the fullest, no armistice, down with the traitors. About 300 armed men storm City Hall and try to take the government prisoner. But President Trochu and his cabinet refuse to step down. Inside the building, historian and radical socialist Gustave Florence jumps up on a table and announces the new revolutionary government members. But Florence and the other radicals are not representative of most Parisians. Loyal mobile guards soon arrive and their very appearance ends the would-be revolution without any bloodshed. The ministers are freed, and Trochu promises to hold city council elections and a referendum on whether the government should be deposed. Police arrest the leaders of the revolt, and by the evening of October 31st, the first commune uprising is over. Conservative Frenchmen like the Comte de Risson are appalled and don't understand the social causes of the uprising. They are 200,000 individuals equally devoid of originality and virtues, incapable of thinking, but quick to fall in love with any idea, provided that it is violent and subversive, both cowardly and ferocious. A ready-made army for the unconscious or thoughtful villains who know how to lead it. It is the dregs of Paris. C'est la lie. De Paris. While internal French tensions are at boiling point, the situation on the front this week allows troops on both sides to dream of peace. In the first week of November, small-scale fighting and shelling continues across France. German batteries shell the besieged town of Neubreisach on the 2nd and surround Belfort on the 3rd. 
Franc-Tireurs clash with German troops near besieged Mézières, and outside Paris, the French gain a rare success on the 7th when they defeat a Bavarian reconnaissance party and inflict 337 casualties. By this stage, war weariness is setting in on both sides. At one location on the front lines outside of Paris, French troops and their officers visit the German unit opposite them. A German soldier recalls that they drank cognac together and shared cigars and food. We also let them taste the pea sausage we had just cooked, and it tasted excellent to them. They said they didn't see why we shouldn't correspond with each other and share news. They were tired of war and eagerly wanted peace. German soldier Albert Böhme of the 92nd Braunschweig Infanterie Regiment is also tired of the war. He's guarding French prisoners in the mud outside Metz, and he's short of food. On November 2nd, he writes one of his many letters to his wife Friederike. 20,000 Frenchmen came to our barracks. We had to go to the post office and patrols. It was a real shame to live in this filth. It lasted all day and night. During the day, there was also rain and the night was very cold. It was impossible to sleep. We had to camp in the open. I wish everything would soon be at peace and I would soon return to you. Ich wünsche mir, es wäre bald alles in Friede und ich käme auch bald zu dir zurück. Thousands of soldiers on both sides want peace, but some of their leaders want to continue the war. Gambetta continues to gather fresh troops for his guerre à outrance, though these units cannot make up for the over 300,000 French troops captured so far by the Germans. He also accuses Marshal Bazaine of treason for surrendering Metz. So Bazaine defends himself from captivity in Germany by writing letters to French newspapers. French General Urich, who surrendered Strasbourg just over a month ago, accuses Gambetta and the Third Republic of treason. Reputation is also more prominent than peace for the German leaders. A November 4th dispatch from the theater of war proudly announces the spoils of war taken at Metz. 53 eagles and flags, 541 field guns, material for more than 85 batteries, about 800 fortress guns, 66 mitrailleuses, about 300,000 rifles, great numbers of cuirass and sabers, and about 2,000 military vehicles. The war cannot end until the leaders on both sides agree to an armistice, but even fresh talks in Paris are on shaky ground. The hopes of millions in France and the German states depend on ongoing peace negotiations in Versailles. French liberal conservative politician Adolphe Thiers has spent the last few weeks on a diplomatic mission abroad to get international support for a better peace agreement for France. But leaders in London, Vienna and St. Petersburg are not interested, and France is still isolated. On November 1st, Thiers is in Versailles for talks with Bismarck. Thiers isn't part of the government of national defense, but he's acting on their behalf with permission. In theory, the talks are only about armistice terms, but in practice, they're a clash of irreconcilable political goals. The Germans insist on annexing territory, while the French still think that they can determine the conditions of a future peace. Both sides are so entrenched that agreeing on armistice terms is nearly impossible. Thiers asks for time to allow elections for a new National Assembly and food deliveries for Paris. Bismarck insists that German troops occupy key French forts during a ceasefire. For Thiers, the German demand to occupy the forts ends the talks. Bismarck sees things differently, as he writes to his wife Johanna on the 3rd. For three days now, three hours daily, tête à tête, with Thiers, and yet no truce will come out of it. They want to have everything and grant nothing. Sie wollen alles haben 
und nichts gewähren. It's not only the chief negotiators who cannot compromise. Prussian Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm complains about French stubbornness to his diary on the 3rd. Thiers demands for provisions show that the supplies must soon run out. And yet, according to the opponents, the French are to offer nothing in return. We all dread the moment of the outbreak of famine. And yet, the Parisians' delusions must necessarily drive them to it. Thiers consults with Foreign Minister Jules Favre and General Ducrot on the 5th. Despite his misgivings, Thiers considers accepting German armistice terms, but General Ducrot will not hear of it. We must defend Paris as long as possible to give the country the chance to form new armies. The resistance of Paris will make up for the shame of Metz and Sedan. If the material ruin increases, the moral ruin will decrease. Si les ruines matérielles s'augmentent, les ruines morales diminueront. That very same day, German soldier Alfred Böhme writes to his wife Friederike and tells her how much he wants peace and to see her again. He doesn't know it, but his hopes will be dashed when talks once again collapse on November 7th. This week is a week of failure. The revolutionaries in Paris fail to topple the Third Republic and establish the Commune, and the diplomats fail to agree on armistice terms. Revolutionaries and desperate citizens in Marseille and other southern cities also attempted to rise up this week, a sign that the Third Republic was on the edge, and that the Commune would rise again. The second week of November 1870 sees renewed fighting in the area around the city of Orléans. After the Germans captured it on October 11th, they stationed about 26,000 men and 110 guns in the area, mostly Bavarian units under General von der Tann. French General Louis Dorel de Paladin's Armée de la Loire now advances on Orléans again. The French hope to defeat the isolated Bavarians, recapture the city, and use it as a base to relieve Paris. Thanks to a steady stream of volunteers, the Loire army has grown to 200,000 men, but only 75,000 men and 160 guns are combat ready. The rest are still untrained, and there is a serious lack of officers and NCOs. But German cavalry notice the French on November 7th and evacuate Orléans on the 8th. They deploy in a defensive stance on a road passing through the town of Coulmier. The French attack begins early on November 9th. First contact is on the French right, but the fighting in the center of the line begins about 1.30 p.m. The French infantry nearly overruns the Bavarian lines until the German artillery moves up and stops the attack. The French try again at 3 p.m., but they're uncoordinated and the Germans are able to send in reinforcements at the decisive points in time to hold the line. The French mobile guards retreat in disorder, and their officers can only get them back under control with the help of regular army units. Eventually, French troops storm Cunier and force the Germans back. Von der Tann orders a retreat to avoid being surrounded and the French enter Orléans. They take 800 to 1,000 wounded Germans prisoner and free 2,000 French prisoners. The Battle of Coulmier is the first clear French victory of the war, and it costs 1,300 German and 1,500 French casualties. The French government portrays the victory at Coulmier and the recapture of Orléans as a turning point in the war. Foreign Minister Favre issues an exuberant proclamation to Parisians on November 14th. Thanks to the valor of our soldiers, fortune has returned to us, and your courage will retain it. Soon we will join hands with our brothers from the provinces and, with them, deliver the soil of la patrie. Vive la République! Vive la France! Interior Minister Gambetta has completely unrealistic expectations. 
he writes a letter to Aurel de Paladin that reveals a less than competent assessment of the relatively minor success at Coulmier. Paris is hungry and waiting for you. Paris a faim et vous attend. German High Command is not pleased with the defeat and hurries the westward march of the Second Army. Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm is irritated, as he notes in his diary on November 10th. According to a telegram, yesterday von der Tann fought for seven hours at Coulmier, then deliberately broke off the battle. This sounds as if he's putting the best face on a disadvantageous skirmish. The very next day, though, the Crown Prince decides that von der Tann had actually done a good job, and he attaches little importance to the loss of Orléans and a few German guns. As French arms triumph at Coulmier, two more French towns fall in the east. On November 10th, Neubreisach surrenders, two days after the capitulation of the fortress city of Verdun. Verdun, which has been surrounded since August, is historically symbolic since it was there in the 9th century that the Frankish Empire was divided into three kingdoms, which became the basis for the German and French medieval states. Like Strasbourg, King Louis XIV had claimed Verdun in the 17th century. But unlike in 1916, Verdun's historic symbolism has little political resonance in 1870. The German official dispatch this week is laconic. Verdun has surrendered. Verdun had capituliert. For the 8,000 civilians and troops on both sides, the siege and fall of Verdun is more than a one-liner. French and German artillery had dueled for weeks, and French sallies destroyed several German batteries on the hills around the town. As the Germans brought up more men and guns freed by the fall of Metz, the outcome is not in doubt. The Third Republic will later investigate the surrender and finds that General Guérin resisted bravely, but surrendered too quickly. In his history of the siege, Verdun clergyman Abbé Gabriel reflects on the defeat. Today we no longer besiege cities according to the rules of the ancient military art. We are satisfied with bombarding them from afar. Given that today the assault is no longer in style for our enemies, just as the arquebus à rouet passed out of style under François Ier, can we blame the commander of a besieged town for not having repelled an assault before surrendering? While there are French successes on the Loire and Verdun Falls, the war on the high seas reaches the Caribbean. The only naval battle of the Franco-Prussian War takes place this week on November 9th, of all places off the coast of Cuba. The Prussian gunboat Meteor is in Havana Harbor when the French Aviso Bouvet arrives on the 7th. The Prussian sailors are so happy for the break from their dull routine at port that they cheer the French vessel as it arrives. The Spanish make the rules clear. Combat must be in international waters, and the ships must leave port 24 hours apart. Captains Knorr and Franquet prepare for combat. The 700-ton Bouvet has one 16cm and two 12cm guns, while the 400-ton Meteor has one 15cm gun and two 12cm guns which are far more powerful than the French ones. The Battle of Havana lasts for two and a half hours and is largely a pro forma affair for the sake of honor. Two Spanish ships and Havana residents standing on the city walls observe the exchange of gunfire, turning maneuvers, and even rifle fire. The Bouvet eventually rams the Meteor, which damages two masts and gets Meteor's riggings caught in the ship's screw but the Prussian gunners score a direct hit on the Bouvet's boiler. Bouvet hoists her sails and makes for neutral Spanish waters before the Meteor can finish her off. But it's the Spanish who end the battle. 
At the edge of the neutral waters, a signal shot of a Spanish warship put an end to the battle at about five o'clock in the afternoon. A handful of sailors are killed or wounded, and although the meteor claims victory, the battle has no impact on the course of the war. But German businessmen in Havana do arrange a banquet for the meteor's officers. The same day as the Meteor and Bouvet clash off of Havana, on the other side of the Atlantic, German writer Theodor Fontana also arrives at the coast. Following his imprisonment at Besançon on espionage charges, French authorities move Fontana to the island of Oléron. He arrives on November 9th, and the good news for Fontana is that the charges have been dropped and he's no longer in danger of being executed or caught up in the fighting around Besançon. Fontana's German and French friends and his wife Emilia have been lobbying Bismarck for weeks, so the Chancellor puts a plan in motion to force the French to let the writer go. In the meantime, the French give Fontana the symbolic rank of officier supérieur, in the hopes that they could exchange him for French officers held by the Germans. But that never happens. His new status as an officer on paper entitles Fontana to a private cell, he gets his own batman, and he can enter and exit the Oléron fortress with relative freedom. On Oléron, Fontana has long chats with his fellow prisoners, and he later publishes their stories in his 1871 book Kriegsgefangen. These include the story of the capture of his Batman Razumovsky on the Loire. Razumovsky came under fire and shot the franc tireur who had missed him. As if from a beehive, the enemy riflemen swarmed. A hundred bullets whistled around him. One tore off his boot heel and smashed the stirrup to pieces. But he was unscathed. And the next moment, he was surrounded and trapped. A young French officer who spoke German jumped on him. Why did you shoot? What do I have my carbine for? We get the guns to use them. The officer laughed. What will become of you now? He asked. Well, I'll be shot. Don't be a fool. You are a good hussar, and not a hair on your head shall be harmed. This week, the French are victorious at Coulmier, Verdun surrenders, the war at sea reaches its unimpressive climax, and Theodore Fontana's odyssey takes him to Oléron Island. Coulmier shows that the Germans are not unbeatable. Though the French government and the German high command draw very different conclusions that will play out in the weeks to come. In the third week of November 1870, negotiations between the North German Confederation and the Southern German states about a joint empire enter their seventh week. The Southerners all accept there will be a united empire, but with different degrees of enthusiasm. The Grand Duchy of Baden has wanted to join for years and is unreservedly in favor of union with the Northerners, since it wants permanent protection from neighboring France and its own revolutionaries. The Grand Duchy of Hesse is split. Part of it belongs to the North German Confederation, and part of it does not. Hessian Prime Minister Reinhard von Dalvik prefers a greater German Union, including Austria. But Hessians in the northern part of the Grand Duchy oppose the Austrian option. In any case, Baden Prime Minister Julius Jolli wrote to his wife with a satisfied view of Baden and Hesse. The Hessians must endure and sign quite contre coeur. On the whole, however, the matter seems to me to lie well, and it lies well for us in any case. In the Kingdom of Württemberg, the ruling elite also favors union with both the Northerners and Austria, partly because relations with France had been good before the war. King Karl I and his wife, Queen Olga, even shed tears when the French ambassador departed at the outbreak of hostilities. Despite the royal couple's francophilia, the kingdom's national liberal German party and educated opinion caused the cabinet to send a delegation to negotiate terms of unification with the North. 
the Kingdom of Bavaria is by far the most hesitant about pan-German unity. King Ludwig II wants to keep Bavaria independent, but agrees to participate in negotiations anyway. Bismarck's diplomatic efforts weaken Bavarian resistance in October, and once Baden and Hesse submit applications to join the Union, the pressure on Bavaria and Württemberg increases even further. This week, on November 15, 1870, Baden and Hesse formally join with the North German Confederation, which changes its name to the German Confederation. They adopt a modified version of the old North German Constitution, though their parliaments still have to ratify the deal. Baden Prime Minister Jolli writes to his wife on the occasion. I had thought the moment in which this goal was achieved, which I'd striven for years to bring about with so much effort, would be more brilliant than it actually was. I always had only one wish in my mind, I wanted it to be over. And when, after three hours of tiring discussing all sorts of side issues, we finally got to Bismarck for his signature, he too complained of indisposition. His gallbladder was ruined, and so every nuisance hit him in the stomach. Baden and Hesse are in, but Bavaria and Württemberg are still playing coy. As for Bismarck, he is actually sick, but he also fakes being sick as a negotiation tactic. He's also stressed about international questions, as he explains on November 16th in a letter to his wife Joanna. The air is again so thick with attempts at mediation and dealings among the neutral powers that play into ours, and so many princely fantasies about Germany haunt the headquarters that I cannot part with His Majesty, as hard as it becomes for me to deny myself a break from my treadmill work. The German Confederation now includes Baden and Hesse, while Bismarck stresses in the comfort of Versailles. Just a stone's throw away, the soldiers and civilians in and around Paris are suffering far worse. The German troops besieging Paris since September 19th are feeling the strain of war. They are frustrated that the war is still going on, since they thought it was won about two months ago, but the French are still fighting. They have marched for days in the rain, fought numerous battles, and don't have adequate rations. Sometimes they go without food for 48 hours at a time. Albert Böhme of the Braunschweig Infanterie Regiment No. 92 writes to his wife Friederike on November 16th. She is supposed to send new boots to a relative, but Albert desperately wants them for himself, and he's awfully homesick. I wrote to Ernst that you could not give him the boots now. I had none, and would have to have others when God grants that I come back. If only the time would come when I could see you again and take you in my arms. If only this misery would have an end. Wenn doch dies Elend erstmal ein Ende hätte. The troops are cold, hungry, frustrated, and desensitized to violence, including the hardships that they are inflicting on the civilian population. The Germans help themselves to the bread, geese, or wine of local peasants with complete impunity. The initial respect for private property and compensating civilians is a thing of the past by November. This low point in relations between the German military and French civilians in the combat zone is made worse by the issue of irregular francs-tireurs. Prussian Major von Kretschmann bitterly writes of the violence to his wife Jen on November 19th. Yesterday, the francs-tireurs intercepted a dragoon officer whose horse they would shot. We got the mayor and six notable inhabitants for it and the town has to pay a tribute of 10 francs per resident. What is the use? The inhabitants are mostly innocent in this. I have no mercy with the society. A peasant who shoots at a soldier is a murderer and, if only for the sake of deterrence, must himself be cruelly punished. For civilians trapped inside Paris, the danger of famine continues to grow. 
Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm notes this week that intercepted letters reveal the increasing food shortage. One letter that makes it through is from 83-year-old Adélaïde de Montgolfier, who writes to her friend Louise Swanton Belloc in England. The wealthy Montgolfiers have stocked up on food, but are beginning to feel the squeeze. I learned with joy that one can extract from horses an excellent oil, which is a wonderful replacement for butter, which is 10 francs a pound. Yesterday's macaroni without butter, milk or cheese, and badly cooked, did not amuse me. Today the kitchen has been saved, tomorrow the country will be. In another letter she adds that she's heard donkey meat is even tastier than veal. De Montgolfier also complains about the constant thunder of the guns, as does writer Edmond de Goncourt. He distracts himself by trying to identify the different French artillery positions by ear. Les canons ont chacun leur son, leur timbre, leur raisonnement. The cannons each have their own sound, their own timbre, their own resonance, their own rumbling, shrill, crisp, or shattering boom. I was able to recognize with certainty the cannon of Mont Valérien, of Issy, of the Canonnière of the Pont du Jour, and the Montemar Battery. As Germans and French suffer in and around Paris, the problem of Spanish succession that helped start the war is solved. For now. The Spanish throne has been vacant since a coup against Queen Isabella II back in 1868. After the controversy of Prince Leopold's Hohenzollern candidacy helped spark the war in 1870, Spanish Prime Minister Juan Prim y Prats looks to the second son of Italian King Victor Emmanuel II, Amadeus of Savoy. Amadeus was a lieutenant general who'd been badly wounded fighting the Austrians at Custoza in 1866. And this week, on November 16, 1870, the Spanish Parliament elects him as the country's new king. The reign of Amadeus I, however, was tumultuous and short. He faces uprising from Carlists, who plunge the country into civil war, and he survives an assassination attempt. Given these insurmountable domestic problems, and never really having established himself as king, Amadeus abdicates on February 10, 1873. One of his 1890 obituaries takes a positive view of his decision. As a laudable example of a regent who threw away the crown rather than consolidated by breaking his word and shedding blood, he will live on in history. Spain then becomes a republic, which sees four presidents and a dictator in less than two years. Finally, on December 30th, 1874, Queen Isabella's son is crowned King Alfonso XII. The succession dispute that had set off the Franco-Prussian War ends with the same Bourbon royal house returning to Madrid. This week, Baden and Hesse join the German Confederation, the siege of Paris makes both soldiers and civilians miserable, and Amadeus I becomes the hapless King of Spain. Even an unhappy Spanish king, however, does not put an end to the war, and the fighting continues next week. The last week of November 1870 is a bloody one on the battlefields of western and northern France. The German First Army is moving west after the fall of Metz, so the Armée du Nord prepares to block it and keep alive the hope of relieving Paris. About 25,000 French troops clash with 30,000 Germans at the Battle of Amiens on the 27th. The French put up fierce resistance, but the Germans force them to retreat and abandon Amiens, which the Germans occupy the next day. The Germans lose 1,300 men and the French about 1,100. In the West, the French High Command debates how to use their large but poor quality forces against the stretched out German lines. There's political pressure to attack, but General Dorel de Paladin is worried about his forces and warns the government. It would be dangerous to trust in the deceptive mirages of figures on paper, 
and take them for reality. In the end, the political imperative wins out and Gambetta issues clear orders to the army. You are today on the road to Paris. Never forget that Paris is waiting for us and honor demands that we should wrest it from the grasp of the barbarians who are threatening it with pillage and fire. So the Armée de la Loire attacks again on November 28th at the Battle of bonne la rolande 200,000 French troops face the 45,000 Germans of the 10th Corps, commanded by General Constantine von Volksretz. Despite the advantage of numbers, the inexperienced French forces committed to the battle fail to break through. German losses are 900 men, and the French lose 1,300 and 1,800 prisoners. German Major Hans von Kretschmann is very critical of the French mobile guards in a letter to his wife, Jen. The mobiles were very mobile, backwards. They ran quite well. Now it will probably soon be over. I think Paris will now realize that no help is possible. The French failure has been described by one historian as a, quote, débâcle des armées de province, a debacle of the provincial armies, a disaster that leaves Paris surrounded and the army demoralized. There's even more bad news for the French this week as well. The besieged fortresses at Thionville and La Ferre surrender, which cuts the Reims-Paris railway, and Garibaldi's forces lose a skirmish near Dijon. The fighting along the Loire has been going on for weeks now and is putting catastrophic strain on the civilians and soldiers from both sides. German troops plunder farms and brutally punish villagers for real or imaginary franc-tireurs. The cold and wet are also a problem for German troops, especially the Bavarians, whose poor quality boots are often falling apart. Many German troops are barely recognizable as soldiers since their tattered uniforms are now mixed with winter clothing that they steal from French civilians. Bavarian Florian Kuhnhauser admits that he's at the end of his rope this week. My strength also left me, and completely exhausted and worn out, I sank down unconscious. I was carried along on a two-wheeled cart for an hour on bumpy roads. He also describes the suffering of the French farmers whom he and his fellow soldiers rob, and later reflects on his actions and criticism from home. Whoever did not take care of himself and his health by seizing food during the grueling days of November was at the mercy of the rough weather. Of course, some readers will say to themselves, we were the purest gang of robbers. Yes, we were. He who has his coffee in the morning, a morning pint at 11, a decent table at noon and coffee again in the afternoon, and is still impatient because the waitress is so bad, he has much to say. For such people, a campaign lasting only one month would be the most effective cure for fatness. While German armies win more victories on the cold and muddy battlefields of France, Bismarck is busy winning political battles at Versailles. Discussions between the German states about a united empire have been dragging on since the summer, but in November, there's finally significant progress. Last week, the smaller Grand Duchies of Baden and Hesse agreed to join the Prussian-controlled North German Confederation, which is renamed the German Confederation. But the larger and more confident kingdoms of Bavaria and Württemberg have been holding out for special privileges called reserve rights. At one point, the Württemberg delegation theatrically leaves Versailles and returns to Stuttgart, and Bavaria's eccentric King Ludwig also drags his feet. Both kingdoms use the contributions of their armies to the war as leverage. The talks are so difficult that Bismarck suffers nervous breakdowns and gallbladder problems. This week, however, the two hesitant royal governments give in to Prussian power and to pressure from their own educated publics in favor of union. 
On November 23rd and 25th, first Bavaria and then Württemberg sign accession agreements known as the November Treaties. Bavaria is allowed to retain its foreign embassies, its own postal system, and sovereignty over its army in peacetime. Württemberg's reserve rights are more modest, and its army will be absorbed into the United Armed Forces. Most of the educated classes in Baden, Hesse and Württemberg react positively to the November treaties. Some Württembergers are envious of Bavaria's extra rights, and some Prussians feel that Bismarck has conceded too much to Bavaria, but overall the tone in the press, the beer halls and the parlors is one of joy and relief. Only socialists and democrats who were involved in the failed revolutions of 1848-49 see this new form of German unity for what it is. A top-down monarchical construct that is achieved with the blood of regular people who have no say in shaping it. Bismarck's new Germany is made from above as a countermodel to the attempt to unite Germany from below in 1848-49. All German states except Austria have now accepted the constitution of the German Confederation, which is to come into effect on January 1st, 1871. Before it does, the parliaments of the southern states and the North German Reichstag still have to approve it. The new Germany will be a federal state presided over by the King of Prussia, and it will be characterized by Prussian economic, political and military dominance. The November treaties have set the stage for a united Germany, but the question of whether it would remain a confederation or be a full-fledged empire is still not settled. This week, Bismarck achieved his main goal of German unity with the November treaties. But for the moment, the German state was still a Bund, or confederation, and not a Kaiserreich, or empire. For Bismarck, only an empire can be the legitimate successor to the Holy Roman Empire, which was ended in 1806. And only an empire can ensure the character of the new state in opposition to the democratic spirit of 1848-49. Not all Germans agree, though. Democrats and leftists are opposed to empire, of course, but many conservatives and monarchists are skeptical as well. One of the skeptics is Bavarian King Ludwig II. According to Bismarck's plan, Ludwig, on behalf of all the German princes, would ask the King of Prussia to become German Emperor. Theoretically, the Prussian King Emperor would simply be the first among equals, but in practice, the empire would end centuries of South German independence. This would amount to a symbolic act of submission, something that Ludwig does not want to do. Allegedly, Bismarck now makes Ludwig an offer that he can't refuse. Ludwig has been on an extravagant building spree and is badly in need of cash. Bismarck supposedly proposes to give Ludwig secret payments from money that Prussia had seized from Hanover after the 1866 war, and Ludwig changes his mind. Or so the story goes. It's never been fully proven by historians. In any case, Bismarck drafts the Kaiserbrief, or imperial letter, for Ludwig to present to King Wilhelm I of Prussia. The letter is pure political theater, with Bismarck's words in Ludwig's mouth. I have therefore turned to the German princes with the proposal that they join me in suggesting to your majesty that the exercise of the presidential rights of the federation be combined with the title of German Emperor. Prussia's leading role on the battlefield is also cemented in the structure of the new state. Southern resistance is finally broken, and Ludwig will soon be free to continue his vanity construction projects like the famous Neuschwanstein Castle. This week, the Germans defeat the French at Amiens and Bonn la Rolande, and Germany is created on paper. For one man in France at least, there is good news. Imprisoned German writer Theodor Fontana swears that he will not say, write, or do anything against France. And in return, the French promise to release him. Though for millions in France, release from suffering is nowhere in sight.
Time is running out on the French armies that have so far failed to free Paris. And so this week, the French launch their biggest sortie out of the city so far. They commit 80 to 150,000 men to the attack on the southeast of the German siege ring. Defending the line are just 15,000 Germans, mostly from the Kingdom of Württemberg. If the French can break through, they hope to reach the town of Meaux and link up with the Armée de la Loire advancing from the west. This would also allow them to cut off the railway that the Germans need to keep their besieging armies supplied, which would force the Germans to break off the siege. French General Auguste Alexandre Ducrot is blunt about his intentions. I shall either return dead or victorious. Je ne rentrerai que mort ou victorieux. The attack is delayed by flooding on the Marne River, but on November 30th, the inexperienced and badly led French troops attack in what becomes the Battle of Villiers Champigny. German command rushes in Saxon units to reinforce the outnumbered Württembergers. Losses are heavy on both sides, and the French capture the first line, but cannot break through the German second line. After a day of rest, both sides resume the offensive on December 2nd. The Germans partially retake Champigny and beat off a French counterattack. A Württemberg officer later describes his experience. My brother was killed right by my side, and nearly all my comrades fell. The slaughter below Villiers Park and the losses were terrible. The commander of our brigade had two horses killed under him. I myself had 200 men under my command, of which only 30 still exist. Of 21 officers in my regiment, 15 are unfit for battle. A few days later, the French accept that the attack has failed and retreat back across the Marne. Combined losses for both sides are about 14,000 men. Württemberg will commemorate the battle every year until 1918 because of the heavy losses, but also to resist Prussian criticism that the southern kingdom was an unreliable ally in the field. Even today, there is a Champigny Street in Stuttgart and a memorial in the small town of Pleidelsheim commemorates 19 and 21-year-old brothers Erich and Axel von Taube, who die in each other's arms at Champigny. The Grande Sortie of the Paris garrison turns out to be a grand désastre and French morale takes another hit. Writer Émile Zola describes the consequences of the defeat in his later novel, La Débâcle, The Collapse. Ah, the dreary and sad days after the abortion of this immense effort. The grande sortie prepared for so long, the irresistible thrust that was to deliver Paris had just failed. The menace of famine had begun. Les menaces de famine commençaient. To add to the tragedy of Champigny, the French plan had no chance of success. French operational communications between Paris and the Loire are limited to carrier pigeons, which are slow and unreliable. So when the high command in Paris launches its attack at Champigny, they don't yet know that the Loire army was beaten last week at bonne la rolande and it will not meet them at Meaux even if they do manage to break out. That said, there's still major fighting on the Loire this week. The French attack from December 2nd to 4th at wangy poupry but the Germans hold them back despite being outnumbered 3 to 1. 22,000 men are killed or wounded on both sides. Further clashes lead to the Germans taking Orléans for the second time on the 5th. Bavarian soldier Florian Kuhnhauser is in continuous combat for 10 days in the ice and snow, grabbing what sleep he can on the frozen ground. We shivered so much from the frost, my whole body trembled. Our feet were quite rigid and numb, the whole body little more than a debilitated skeleton and such soldiers were to go back into battle? Und solche Soldaten sollten wieder in den Kampf gehen? The largest French breakout attempt of the war fails this week, as do their attacks on the Loire. In Versailles, meanwhile, German unity talks are making painful progress for Otto von Bismarck.
By the end of November, the southern German states have signed treaties agreeing to join the north in a new German confederation. Bismarck wants Prussian King Wilhelm I to become emperor of the future state, but they disagree about the title. Bismarck wants Deutscher Kaiser, German emperor, while Wilhelm prefers Kaiser von Deutschland, emperor of Germany. Bismarck makes light of the issue in a letter to his wife Emilie. I am plagued by the princes and their busyness, and also my most gracious king, with all the little difficulties that arise from his princely prejudices and trifles in the very simple Kaiser question. On November 30th, King Ludwig II of Bavaria sends the Kaiser letter to Wilhelm, officially asking him to become Emperor of Germany. The fact that Bismarck has written the letter and may have bribed Ludwig to do it are not mentioned. Wilhelm receives the request on December 3rd, but in reality, the Kaiser question is by no means a trifle. The new empire is to be a confederation of princes under the Prussian king, and so a hereditary imperial throne belonging to the Hohenzollerns is a delicate issue. For one thing, the other kings and grand dukes are anxious to retain as much of their status and formal sovereignty as possible. For Wilhelm, unlike many other Germans, the problem is not that Germany might be Prussianized, but that the purity of Prussian identity and his kingship might be diluted. Wilhelm accepts that he will be emperor, but stubbornly insists on the title Emperor of Germany, which expresses his claim to exclusive leadership of the state. This is unacceptable to the other princes and to Bismarck, and the Prussian chancellor and king argue bitterly. The king even compares the weaker title of German Emperor to the symbolic rank of Charaktermajor given to retired Prussian captains. Bismarck responds with fits of rage or tears or feigns illness to try to change the king's mind. But at the end of this week, the Kaiser question remains unanswered. While Bismarck and Wilhelm I are arguing over titles, writer Theodor Fontana's time as a prisoner of war comes to an end. German writer Theodor Fontana has been in French custody for nearly two months when he learns last week that he will soon be free. What he doesn't know is that Prussian Minister for War Albrecht von Rohn is the one who arranged for an end to his captivity. Von Rohn has three French civilians arrested, which the Germans then offer to set free in exchange for Fontana's release and safe passage back to Prussia. On November 29th, the French allow Fontana to leave the Atlantic fortress island of Oléron on account of the three hostages. He has spent the last weeks recording his conversations with fellow German prisoners, which he will soon turn into a book called Prisoner of War. Fontana is happy to be on his way home, but he also feels sentimental about leaving the other prisoners, his guards, and his Batman Razumovsky. Fontana is free. But since he doesn't know his safe passage has been guaranteed with the imprisonment of three Frenchmen, he's quite anxious about the return trip. His route is a long detour along the Atlantic and Mediterranean coasts to avoid the combat zone and reduce the chance of him running into trouble again. He later writes of his fears. I had no other protection besides a feuille de route in my pocket. In all the cities I had to pass through, public order was hanging by a thread. What could my passport, written indistinctly in a scribbled hand, mean to a red Republican workers' mob running the show in Bordeaux, Toulouse, or Lyon? A la lanterne, string him up from a lamppost. Fontana safely reaches Berlin on December 5th, and just days later starts talks with a publishing house for his book about his adventures in France. The War of 1870-71 deeply affected Fontana, and he makes it a constant theme of his famous social novels in later years. This week, a massive French offensive to free Paris fails, Bismarck and King Wilhelm argue over imperial protocol, and Theodor Fontana's odyssey is finally over. The odyssey of millions of others caught up in the war, on the other hand, continues next week.
At the start of the second week of December 1870, the German siege of Paris remains unbroken. After the French defeat at Loigny, the French High Command decides to divide the Armée de la Loire in two, one part under General Alfred Chanzy and one under General Charles Bourbaki. French morale is at an all-time low after their recent failures, and they expect the Germans will try to march on Tours, which is one of the seats of the Government of National Defense. So their objective now is to simply hold on. The Germans are badly outnumbered, but push westwards on December 8th while reinforcements are sent up. At first, the French are able to hold the line, but Bourbaki's disorganized and hesitant forces are not able to support Chanzy. Chanzy's army is barely holding together, so he orders a retreat towards Le Mans on December 10th. The Germans lose 3,400 men, the French perhaps 10,000, including 5,000 prisoners. Although the French have abandoned the Loire position, Chanzy's determination does impress Interior Minister Gambetta. The general also tries to keep up the morale of his long-suffering men after the retreat. The recent battles were as glorious for you as they were deadly for the enemy, whose prisoners admit to serious losses. Strategic considerations have led you to occupy your current positions. Des considérations stratégiques vous ont ramené sur les positions que vous occupez actuellement. But Chanzy's grandiose words were cold comfort to French troops, as journalist Francisque Sarcy observes near Paris. C'était pitié de les voir. It was pitiful to see them. They wrapped their heads in scarves, folded and refolded their blankets around their bodies, covered their legs in any clothing they could find. And off they went, sordid, hideous, no longer appearing as soldiers to do their duty. At this point, the Germans are also completely exhausted. Bavarian Florian Kuhnhauser fights non-stop for what he calls his 10 worst days. His uniform is in tatters and he is short of food and he's disturbed by what he witnesses. Thousands of wounded were abandoned to bleed to death on the cold battlefield. Who could help them? We could no longer help ourselves. And we had reached the point where we envied the fallen their fate. For the wounded, no amount of begging or pleading helped. Completely abandoned without any care, most of them gasped out their spirit in the cold winter night. Oh, war is terrible, merciless. Oh, is der Krieg schrecklich, unbarmherzig. Kuhnhauser's mood sinks even further when he marches over a day-old battlefield. The sight of this field of corpses was not as gruesome as others, for nature herself was ashamed of the atrocities of mankind and spread a dusting of snow over this terrible battlefield. Almost ghost-like, thousands of human corpses and horse carcasses lay under this light blanket of snow. Kuhnhauser's unit is so depleted it is declared incapable of further operations and sent to Orléans to rest, but he is still plagued by nightmares. On the northern front, the French are also unsuccessful in this week. The Germans take Rouen on December 4th and the port of Dieppe on the 9th, and these victories net the Germans supplies meant for Paris including 150,000 hundredweight of coffee. The one minor French victory comes at the town of Am, where French troops surprise the small German garrison at night and force them to surrender. Fresh German units try to recapture the town, but they're forced to retreat. While fighting rages on the Loire and in the north, hunger intensifies in besieged Paris. With every passing day, Parisians increasingly feel the consequences of the German blockade. Food and fuel are scarce, the city is in the grip of the winter cold, and the mood is also dampened by the failures to lift the siege on November 30th and December 2nd. 
Journalist Francisque Sarcy mocks wealthier Parisians who are reduced to eating whatever they can get. What was amusing is that it was the upper-class bourgeoisie that ate cats, dogs and rats with the bravado of dilettantes. They ate with the tips of their teeth, half complaining, half joking, and not without some hesitation of the fork. Writer Edmond de Goncourt is depressed, and his spirits aren't raised on December 6th when he discovers buffalo, antelope, and kangaroo meat on restaurant menus, since the Paris Zoo animals are now being slaughtered. The same day, he also reports on what his fellow Parisians are talking about. We're not just talking about things that can be eaten, that could be eaten, or that can be found to eat. I've seen dog chops, someone said. They're really tasty. They look just like mutton chops. Famine is on the horizon. La famine est à l'horizon. Despite his depression and hatred of the Republican government, Goncourt still believes that somehow France will be saved in spite of the Republic. Goncourt and Sarcy, however, have it easier than most. In the slums outside the Boulevard de Clichy, an English contemporary observes women and children sitting half-starved on doorsteps in freezing temperatures. They said that because they had neither wood nor coal, it was warmer outside than inside. Paris is starving, and the miserable German troops have defeated the miserable French troops on the Loire again, which puts them too close for comfort for the French government at Tours. The German victory at Beaugency places their forces closer to the French government at Tours. So this week, French authorities decide to move to Bordeaux. Interior Minister Gambetta, a man known for his toughness and conviction, but also his stubbornness and tendency to deny reality, is the only minister to remain. He plans to continue to organize military resistance. Just as the rest of the government is leaving, Gambetta receives an unusual guest on December 6th. Wilhelm Dinesen is a Danish officer and veteran of the German-Danish War of 1864. He's also an adventurer who hates everything German, and he places himself at the disposal of the Third Republic after a dangerous journey to Tours. Gambetta commissions him as a staff officer with the rank of captain, and he joins a French unit in Bourges despite barely speaking any French. Denezen gets caught up in the flight of the government officials, but manages to reach Bourges by train after several detours and a disturbing discussion. On the journey, Denezen meets a French general whose views are too much even for the anti-German Dane. All German men must be killed because they are Germans. All children because they will become Germans. And all women because they can give birth to Germans. This week, the Germans defeat the French at Beaugency, Paris Zoo animals are being eaten, and the French government delegation in Tours escapes to Bordeaux. Soldiers on both sides and French civilians are hungry, cold, and want the interminable suffering to end. But fanatical French Republican leaders are not willing to give up, and German leaders continue to apply maximum pressure in the weeks to come. By mid-December, all German states have agreed to join a united Germany, and the North German legislature has decided the Prussian king who will preside over the new state will be called Deutscher Kaiser, or German Emperor. King Wilhelm is still unhappy with the title German Emperor, since he prefers Emperor of Germany. But before the title can legally be given to Wilhelm I, both Houses of Parliament still have to approve its bestowal, accept the southern German states into the Confederation, and approve the transformation of the Confederation into an empire. A clear majority of parliamentarians vote in favor of the empire, but Danish, Polish, and Hanoverian Welsh MPs vote against it. 
foreshadowing decades of difficult relations with minorities. Social Democratic MP Wilhelm Liebknecht points out another flaw of the coming empire by recalling the king's role in crushing the revolution of 1848-49. There are also a few Germans who oppose Wilhelm as emperor based on old political feuds. On December 11th, an imperial delegation travels to Versailles to present Parliament's decision to the king in person. The group is led by German-Jewish MP and accomplished lawyer Eduard von Simson, who in April 1849 led the delegation of the Frankfurt National Assembly that tried and failed to offer the imperial crown to King Friedrich Wilhelm IV. But the king only receives the parliamentary delegation on the 18th, after the German princes have answered the Bavarian king's request to ask the Prussian king to become emperor. In fact, Wilhelm doesn't even want to deal with the elected representatives, but bows to pressure from Bismarck and promises to accept the title his brother rejected in 1848. It won't be official until a grand proclamation, which will take some time. Writer and painter Ludwig Pietsch is on hand for the imperial delegation, but he gets there late. He ends up stuck in the crowd of German soldiers and French civilians outside the palace and makes some irreverent observations. We Germans, however, as deeply, honestly and joyfully as we might feel the greatness of this moment, could not help but notice with a mixture of amusement and regret of the unintentional humour added to the delegation's departure by the only carriages available to it. Most of them might have been standing at a post office yesterday. Some were equipped with gigantic parcel containers at the rear and on top. As for the horses, most of them had clearly seen several months of army transport service, so their present role as the aurora steeds of Germany's new dawn as a patriot poet friend described it, must have contrasted wondrously with their actual appearance. Some contemporaries see the plain stagecoaches provided to the deputation as an intentional humiliation of the parliamentarians and, unlike Peach, are by no means amused. The Prussian crown prince also reflects on the coming German empire in his diary. My father will probably only enjoy the honour of it for his golden years. But to me and mine arises the task of providing a steady hand for the mighty expansion in a genuinely German sense, and to do so with contemporary, unprejudiced principles. From Bismarck's point of view, however, the question of peace is as important as the future of Germany. He and Chief of the General Staff von Moltke are still arguing about how to end the war as quickly as possible, so Bismarck turns to the king. He suggests cracking down on occupied France in violation of international law, hostage-taking, theft and demanding money. He cynically presents these ideas to the king as an act of humanity to end the war sooner and ultimately reduce suffering, but in the end, these policies are not adopted. While German diplomatic pomp and circumstance fill the palace at Versailles, just a few kilometers away in Paris, the situation is desperate. December 19th marks three months of siege for the French capital, and soldiers and civilians are reaching breaking point. The commander of the Paris National Guard, General Jacques-Louis Clément Thomas, reports on discipline problems on the 16th. The 200th Battalion left Paris today to move into the outpost at Créteil. I received the following dispatch from the Commander-in-Chief of Vincennes. The Chief of the 200th Battalion drunk. At least half the crew drunk. It is impossible to go on duty with them they had to be relieved from their posts. Under the circumstances, the National Guard is a joke and a danger. As for the civilians, they're now reduced to eating whatever they can get, including zoo animals, dogs, cats, and even rats. Reserve officer the Comte de Risson reports. Dog and cat butchers have set up shop. 
Rat patties have also appeared. Young fat dog makes for tolerable eating. As for the rat, the big and fat sewer rat, except for a little musky smell, approximates with a lot of pepper and nutmeg, a not too inferior duck in a crust. Le rat double avec beaucoup de poivre et muscade, sans trop d'infériorité, le canard dans une croûte. It is of course possible that Hérisson is being ironic in his claims about rat meat. His poor compatriots, however, are not penning literary jokes about rat that tastes like duck. They are starving and freezing to death from a lack of fuel. As the Germans talk in Versailles and Parisians starve in the capital, the fighting on the Loire and in the East continues. On December 15th, the Battle of Vendôme began on the Loire front near Le Mans. On the first day, fighting brings no result and is broken off as darkness falls. But the day after, the troops of the German 10th Corps prevail and enter Vendôme. The French lose about 1,000 dead and some supply wagons, while the Germans record just 129 killed. German soldier Albert Böhme writes about his experience to his wife Friederike, who's just given birth to their son. The shells hit next to us and in front of us and behind us, and we went into this terrible mitrailleuse fire. God heard my plea and led me out again, but many stayed behind. Here lay a leg and there an arm. May God have mercy, so this misery and wretchedness may end soon. One sergeant had both legs taken off and one was shot three times. One man had his head torn off by a shell and it couldn't be found again. Dear Friederike, that's how it is in France. Liebe Friederike, so geht es her in Frankreich. In the East, French forces are still resisting in besieged Belfort, while German troops have been in Dijon since the end of October. This week, on December 14th, French troops move into the small town of Nuit Saint-Georges and its important rail station. Four days later, 10,500 Baden troops with 36 guns respond under General Adolf von Glümer. They attack General Camille Cremer's 10,000 French, which include mobile guards and franc tireurs, but have only 20 guns. Around two in the afternoon, the fighting reaches its peak as the Badeners attack a railway embankment near the Metzinbach stream, and they suffer heavy losses from Chaspeau fire. Across the railway line at Nuit, the French and Badeners exchange fire at 800 paces, but the French start to retreat when reinforcements under Prince Wilhelm from Baden arrive. Both the Prince and General Blume are wounded, but the Badeners prevail and take Nuit at 5 p.m. They capture weapons and ammunition, but the victory comes at a high cost. 950 Badeners are dead or wounded. The French lose 1,050 men and 650 prisoners. The battle at Nuit is small, but very important for the Grand Duchy of Baden. After the war, it will be at the center of Baden's commemorations of 1870-71. And even today, a monument to the battle stands in the middle of Freiburg. Another interesting side note from the battle is that the French commander, General Cremer, was captured at Sedan, but like many French officers, breaks his word of honor that he would not fight again after his release. This week, diplomatic and legal maneuvers bring the German Empire close to completion. Starving Parisians dine on rat rather than duck, and the Grand Duchy of Baden receives its trial by fire near Dijon. The Prussian king allows Edward von Simpson and the 1848 revolutionaries some measure of symbolic redemption, but it's still tinged with humiliation. But symbolism and power structures are far from the minds of most in France this week and next week. On December 23rd and 24th, the Battle of Alu takes place near the Somme River in northern France. 
22,000 Germans, along with 108 guns and 2,300 horse, under General Edwin von Manteuffel, defeat the French Army of the North, which fielded twice as many men under General Louis Feder. The French lose 1,000 men and retreat towards the town of Arras. It's yet another triumph for German arms, but another costly victory on a cold, obscure French battlefield is a hard sell for the home front in the German Confederation. Just north of Paris, fighting rages on as well. The French had previously taken and then lost the village of Le Bourget, and now launch another senseless attack to recapture it. This might make sense if the Army of the North were closer to Paris, but once again Parisian commanders don't know Federbe is so far away. After an artillery bombardment from armored railway cars, French volunteers and francs-tireurs advance with mitrailleuse support against the Prussian Guard. Both attackers and defenders are a sight to be seen. Their non-regulation winter clothing like knit caps, sheepskin vests and improvised overcoats actually hinders the fighting. In the end, the Prussians hold on, but the village is destroyed, as a Prussian officer recalls. The whole long street was covered with stones and bricks. One could hardly get over the piles of rubble. There was not a window left whole, not a house without one or two shells in it. One literally waded up to one's ankles in debris and shell splinters. Fortunately for us, at least we were not destined to celebrate Christmas Eve in it as well. As the fighting continues, Christmas 1870 brings little joy. This week, the Germans set about chopping down thousands of trees for Christmas, clearing many of the parks and forests near Paris of conifers. There are Christmas trees in the trenches, in the dugouts, in the hospitals, artillery positions, and on the earthworks. Relatives back home send candles in care packages, and on the 24th, the whole German siege ring around Paris glows with their light. German Catholics and Protestants hold services, sometimes in ruined churches, and the singing can be heard across the front. The field chaplains give mostly patriotic sermons, but most of the men are thinking about home and loved ones, and perhaps about the things they have seen and done in this war that do not fit the Christmas message. One group of German soldiers standing around a Christmas tree near Choisy-le-Roi is killed by French guns bombarding the siege ring. Assimilated German-Jewish soldier Sigismund Samuel also celebrates Christmas with his comrades of the Westphalian Fusilier Regiment No. 37, as he writes to his sister. In each and every one of us, our minds were more inclined to homesickness than usual. Why? I don't know. Christmas as a family celebration has grown on all of us. The Christmas tree, which burns in the richest palace as in the poorest hut, is a symbol of a warm and safe home, and it's difficult for us to do without it. And we did not do without it, not even at the outposts. It was almost touching to see how people picked small fir branches, lit them, and dreamed of home. Samuel also organizes a Christmas Eve celebration for his comrades, which they spend in a cramped, freezing room while dining on pea soup, goose, and omelets. The fact that a Jewish non-commissioned officer organizes Christmas celebrations for his Christian comrades recalls the peaceful celebration of Yom Kippur a few months ago at Metz. These moments show that mutual acceptance might be made possible only by the strains of war, but also that the catastrophes of the 20th century are by no means predetermined in 1870. Franz Plitt, a soldier in the 3rd Kurhessische Infanterie Regiment Nummer 83, spends Christmas on the Loire in a French home where he's quartered. It's so cold that his wine freezes in his canteen, and he's filled with sadness when he attends Mass. After the sermon, the organ struck up again, and the choir began to sing our regimental music. I was overcome by an unspeakable sorrow from all the misery and the experiences, and like me, probably all the officers and enlisted men had a moist eye, 
which had probably not known tears for a long time. French captain Paul Jourzon feels equally introspective this Christmas as he writes to his wife Marie by balloon from Paris. We spent Christmas evening with the Lod family. We witnessed the joy of his son and two of the neighbor's children when they saw the Christmas tree shining with candles and baubles. These children were hardly thinking about Prussians, whom they nearly caused us to forget. Ces enfants ne pensaient guère aux Prussiens, qui nous avaient presque fait oublier. Brunswick soldier Albert Böhme is also thinking about a child at Christmas. It's his newborn son whom he's never met. A letter from his wife Friederike reaches him on Christmas Day. Dear Albert, we've never had such a sad Christmas as this year. We wish that next year it may be better. Dear Albert, on Christmas Day, our little prince is to be christened. Albert replies the very same day. Dear Friederike, it hurts me to see my heart swimming in tears when I think of how you are now and how you're getting along. I only wish that God will grant that I can embrace you all in my arms, which is my only longing and desire, and that I will also meet my little prince, and I would like to know his name. Und wissen möchte ich, wie er heißt. For the Böhme family, as for many in France and the German Confederation, the Christmas celebration is less an occasion for joy than for pain. Parisians also celebrate Christmas as best they can under the siege conditions. Actress Sarah Bernard organizes festivities in her private hospital, and both French and German wounded sing hymns together and share a meal of brioche and sausage. Depressed writer Edmond de Goncourt spends Christmas wandering the city searching for food and observing as starvation stalks the people. On the 25th, he writes in his diary with sadness and with a keen eye for the almost comical details of siege life in the formerly radiant city. It is Christmas. I'm waiting for a soldier to say, actually, Christmas Eve, we had five men frozen under the canvas. What a singular transmutation of shops and what a bizarre transfiguration of shops. A jeweler in the Rue de Clichy now displays in jewelry boxes, fresh eggs wrapped in cotton wool. Famine in Paris has reached the point that zoo animals are being eaten. The zoo's two elephants, Castor and Pollux, are slaughtered and turned into sausage and soup. But the exotic zoo creatures aren't used to feed the poor. Instead, they end up on the menus of the well-to-do. The Christmas Day menu of the Café Voisin includes consommé d'éléphant, civet de kangourou, chameau rôti à l'anglaise, côte d'ours rôti sauce poivrade, and terrine d'antilope aux truffes. The menu also flippantly notes for its wealthy patrons that the 25th of December marks 99 days of siege. Things are much different for the German notables and diplomats at Versailles. It's freezing cold, but they are well housed and well fed. Like many officers and men, the Crown Prince buys Christmas presents at Versailles shops, and he records his experience in his diary on Christmas Eve. The French could not conceal their astonishment at the behavior of these Nordic barbarians. For even while shopping in the shops and meeting in the streets, they could see in our faces that all of us were filled with friendship and the desire to give pleasure to others. The Crown Prince also holds a raffle for his staff and servants. Over punch, gingerbread and nuts and apples, 160 prizes are given out and wounded soldiers are also invited to the party. But he is also in a somber mood. Next to my own at home, I am thinking today especially of the unhappy widows and orphans. For thousands, this Christmas will be a true festival of mourning. It sounds almost like irony to hear the salvation message of Christmas. 
in the days that speak only of death and destruction of enemies. Peace on earth and goodwill to men. Christianity is truly still far from acting according to the meaning of those words. Irish journalist William Howard Russell also celebrates Christmas at Versailles with British journalists and diplomats. The celebration is interrupted by artillery fire, and a German surgeon is forced to leave the celebration and perform several amputations before returning to his Christmas dinner. This week brings more German victories in the north and near Paris, and for Germans and French, civilians and soldiers, Christmas 1870 is a somber one. Writer Theodor Fontane, now far from the front in Berlin after his release from French captivity, is filled with sadness and writes of his despair to his sister Elise. When will this end? This afternoon, ten train cars full of reservists passed us by. They sang. It's for the best that they can sing this indestructible frivolity. Have a happy holiday. Habe frohe Festtage. Christmas 1870 has come and gone, but the war has not. In the last days of 1870, the German leadership at Versailles is on edge, as they are still arguing about whether to bombard besieged Paris or to just let hunger do its work. Prussian chief of the general staff, Helmut von Molke, is against the bombardment and reasons that shelling a city as large as Paris won't bring any military benefit. North German Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck worries that if the war doesn't end soon, neutral states might intervene and stop his plans for annexing Alsace and Lorraine and creating a German empire. He thinks the sooner the shelling begins, the sooner the war will end. And he's not worried about humanitarian concerns or Germany's image abroad. As usual, Bismarck gets his way. Although he wears a uniform and holds an honorary rank, he is not a soldier and he does not accept his general's explanations that bombarding Paris effectively requires more guns and ammunition than the Germans have. He also ignores their warnings that the logistical situation and the weather won't allow for enough shelling to force a surrender. On December 26th, an annoyed Bismarck writes to his wife Joanna. Here, I hope, we will celebrate your birthday with the first achievements of the artillery. It was not God's will that it went according to mine. On December 27th, Moltke gives in and agrees to begin bombarding the French fort on Mont Avron, a 110 meter high hill outside Paris. 76 guns begin to pour down shells, which forces the French to abandon the position on the 29th. Bismarck also wants to shell civilian quarters in Paris, but that is still opposed by the other German leaders, for now. While the German artillerymen serve their guns, French opposition to the government of national defense grows, and Parisians continue to starve. But they starve differently depending on their social class. As 1870 comes to an end, most of Paris is freezing and starving, and its politicians are locked in conflict. Since the hasty revolution and formation of the government of national defense in September, there are some French Republicans who have grown frustrated. The government's incompetent handling of the military situation, culminating in this month's failure to break the Paris siege, now adds serious weight to the domestic opposition. More and more French politicians, like Adolphe Thiers or Jules Grévy, oppose Interior Minister Gambetta's fanatic prosecution of the war, and they begin slowly to form a peace party. The French peace party is also suspicious of President Trochu's government's democratic principles, and some accuse it of sliding into dictatorial tendencies. Liberal Albert de Broglie expresses these fears. Might the government of national defense be primarily a method of keeping power in the hands of the madmen who seized it? 
While French leaders are divided, the people of Paris are united in their suffering. On December 29th, Prussian Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm reports that he's heard that the cavalry horses are being eaten in the capital. But this is an understatement. For working-class Parisians, food and fuel are hardly to be found, and far too expensive at black market prices. Anglo-French diarist Henri Labouchère notes in his diary that table wine is running out, and the poor rely on it to make their staple wine and bread soup. For the wealthy, money can still save them from the worst privations. For the right price, the zoo animals of the Jardin des Plantes can be eaten. Two elephants, Castor and Pollux, were slaughtered some time ago, but provide soup and blood sausage for weeks at the Café Voisin. It turns out the prime cut is the trunk. According to the Comte de Risson, the elephants fetched 27,000 francs. For food and profit, poor Castor suffers terribly, since no one knows how to kill an elephant humanely. Erisson reports that the hungry Frenchman first shot the elephant in the body, but that was just the beginning of its suffering. The animal, accustomed to continuous care, seemed to be convinced that the wound was due to an accident and lent itself with the greatest docility to what its executioners demanded of it. A conical bullet with a steel point was then fired into his brain with a chassepot. Castor fell but it took a third bullet to finish him off. When it comes time to slaughter Pollux, the butchers have learned their lesson and dispatch him quickly with a shot behind the ear. Henri Labouchère, however, does not find elephant meat to his liking. Yesterday, I had a slice of Pollux for dinner. It was tough, coarse, and oily. And I don't recommend English families to eat elephant as long as they can get beef or mutton. Although French cooks can do wonders with very poor materials, when they're called upon because of the fuel shortage to cook an elephant with a spirit lamp, the thing is almost beyond their ingenuity. The grim realities of the siege and the unending war cause many French and Germans to reflect with melancholy and anger as the new year arrives. The Prussian Crown Prince has a disappointing New Year. He wants to proclaim the new empire on January 1st, but his father insists on waiting until the Bavarians formally agree. So the frustrated and angry Crown Prince instead suggests January 18th, which coincides with the Prussian coronation in 1701. Aside from his anger, the Crown Prince also reflects on the year that was and shows a far-sightedness and empathy that few contemporaries share. He yearns for peace, but worries that it is still far off. Perhaps the governments of both countries are to blame for this. They have conjured up spirits which they are now unable to control. It is almost impossible for us today to renounce the possession of Alsace and Lorraine even if we have to tell ourselves that the gain is a precarious one and hardly worth the rivers of blood that have flowed because of it. Bismarck made us great and powerful, but he robbed us of our friends, the sympathies of the world, and our good conscience. Bismarck hat uns groß und mächtig gemacht, aber er raubte uns unsere Freunde, die Sympathien der Welt und unser gutes Gewissen. The German Empire officially comes into existence on January 1st, 1871, with the accession of the South German states into the North German Confederation, subject to Bavarian approval set for January 4th. This makes the empire's status somewhat unclear, and the Crown Prince reports with some irritation that many Germans at Versailles are asking themselves whether the Emperor and the Empire really are established today or not. It seems no one quite knows for sure. Friedrich Wilhelm also sees challenges ahead for the new Reich and hopes that German power should bring peace and culture. But he also worries that their triumph will lead to, quote, blind worship of brute force. 
Just as a new German Empire is created, the ruler of a former empire rings in the new year as well. Napoleon III is still in German captivity in Kassel and provides a surreal scene at his New Year's reception. He presents himself as though he were still the great ruler of an empire and receives military officers and former courtiers wearing a tailcoat and the Grand Order of the Légion d'Honneur. His spirits are brightened by letters from the kings of Italy, Sweden and the Netherlands, as well as a greeting signed by 1,500 of his former officers. But while the high and mighty make or mourn their empires, regular soldiers and their families spend a very uncertain New Year's. Paul Jozon, a captain in the 3rd French Regiment du Génie, confides his sadness to his diary. I'm spending my New Year's Eve rather sadly, among strangers in a hotel room. It's still cold, and the snow is still covering the land. Il continue à faire froid, et la neige couvre toujours la terre. Friederike Böhme, the wife of Albert Böhme of the 92nd Braunschweig Infantry Regiment, expresses the heartfelt longing of many wives in a letter to her husband. She's anxious for him to return and meet their son Karl, who was born after Albert left for the front. Dear Albert, I congratulate you warmly on the new year and wish that we will see each other again soon. I greet and kiss you many thousand times your wife Friederike, and your little son Karl. This week, German guns begin their assault on the Paris forts, the German Empire waits on Bavaria to bring its constitution to life, and French and Germans find little cheer with the coming of the new year. The Prussian Crown Prince and millions of others wonder how long the hunger, the suffering, and the death will go on before peace finally comes. The answer? is no clearer next week. The new year brings new attempts to gain success on the battlefield by both sides. The French High Command turns its attention to the besieged fortress of Belfort in the east, which has been holding out for two months. General Bourbaki's part of the Loire army is now reinforced with Front Tireurs, Garibaldians, and new recruits, and rebaptized l'Armée de l'Est. On January 9th, this motley crew runs into Prussian units of General von Werder's corps at the village of Villiers Excel. Fighting rages between Bourbaki's mixed units and von Werder's mainly older reservists in minus 20 degrees Celsius weather. From 9 a.m. to 3 a.m. the next morning, they fight hand-to-hand -hand in every house and cellar as the village changes hands several times. A furious nine-hour night battle for control of the castle sees the Germans set it on fire, a scene later described by Theodor Fontana. The castle blaze had raged on throughout the night battle. The collapsing rubble buried not only the bodies of the fallen, but also the wounded of both friend and foe. The French eventually force the Prussians to evacuate the town and retreat, but they need to regroup before they can pursue the outnumbered Germans. Staff officer Wilhelm Dinesen, a Dane serving with the French, witnesses the horrors of war. Someone was lying next to me, or rather, he was leaning on his arms with his hands in the snow, as if on a pair of stilts. Both his legs were shot to pieces. His head was mangled. His nose and cheeks were gone. His eyes hung down to his chin. He sat still, motionless. Now and then he murmured, Protégez-moi, mon Dieu. The next morning he rides across the devastated battlefield. The splendid castle had been largely burnt down. The sooty ruins were still smoking. At the top of a few beams hung a few Prussians, black and half-charred. Bodies rested in the pure snow a hundredfold, singly or in heaps, and between them rifles, knapsacks, canteens, and cartridge bags. The warm blood had bored dark holes into the snow. 
puddles and bright streaks in all directions where the wounded had tried to get to safety. The icy cold had frozen limbs contorted in agony. Dinizen also reports that the poorly equipped Frenchmen stripped the dead Prussians of their boots to replace their own tattered footwear. Meanwhile, on the Loire, the Germans hoped to press their advantage following their recent victories with a final push. Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm expects another victory as he confides to his diary on January 5th. Prince Friedrich Karl will be able to thoroughly defeat the Western French army in the next few days near Le Mans, since it is still being formed there and has already been defeated. One of the men who is expected to contribute to the thorough victory is foot soldier Karl Zeitz of the 2nd Thuringian Infantry Regiment, number 32. He's long since run out of patience with the French peasants who don't want German troops to stay in their homes. But on January 5th, he empathizes. Zeitz and his men are soaked and freezing when they arrive at the village of Aponvilliers near Le Mans. But a French family does not want to let them in. The poor people could hardly answer because they were crying and sobbing. I could only roughly gather from their words that they could not leave the front room to us. But it had to be. We were soaked to the skin. We entered a parlor. With a cry, the family sank to their knees. I took off my helmet, deeply moved. I saw the picture of mourning. A bier surrounded by lights stood before us. A young girl, probably aged 17 or 18, lay upon it, still in the most radiant colors, as if she were only asleep. Zeitz insists on he and his men using the room for the night, but also promises to guard the young woman's sleep as if they are mourning her themselves. As the war rages in the provinces and Belfort continues to hold out, French soldiers and civilians in besieged Paris now face the wrath of the German guns. German leaders have finally decided, after much debate, to shell the civilian districts of Paris as well as the forts. On January 5, 1871, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the German gunners start firing 15 to 20 shells into the city every minute. For Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, it's about time. He's full of malice towards the French and is prepared to accept civilian casualties if it means bringing the war to an end. But not all German leaders are in favor. Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm, who objects on political and humanitarian grounds, complains to his diary. Now the wise men in Berlin will probably triumph and expect that tonight the surrender will already take place. But what will they say if after a fortnight everything has still remained the same? The Crown Prince also notes more reports of French guns shelling German dressing stations. There are too many such reports of these types of incidents in 1870-71 to be dismissed as pure propaganda. It's impossible to say today to what extent these attacks were a deliberate breach of the first Geneva Convention of 1864 and what role might have been played by the fog of war. Ironically, at first the bombardment doesn't seem to bother most Parisians that much at all. The elderly Adelaide de Montgolfier even writes to a friend that she'd heard a French soldier say that the shell's bark was worse than their bite. Plus de bruit que de besogne. Writer Edmond de Goncourt notes his surprise in his diary on the 6th. I constantly hear the whistling of shells, like the howling of a great autumn wind. Since yesterday, this seems so natural to the population that no one takes any notice of it. In the garden next to mine, two little children stop playing at each shell burst and shout, It's exploded! Then they start to play again. Captain of the engineers Paul Jozon writes nonchalantly to his wife. The bombardment is much less terrible up close than from afar. 
At night, the shells fall in greater numbers and the inhabitants take refuge in the cellars. It's annoying, but we don't lose many people, five or six a day. Given the immensity of Paris, it would take a month of shelling to have any appreciable effect. Far worse than the German shells is the lack of food. Even the basics are now gone, as Goncourt reports. In the absence of meat, it is not possible to fall back on vegetables. A small turnip sells for eight sous, and one must give seven francs for a liter of onions. But there is no more talk of butter, and even fat has disappeared. Cheese is a memory, and potatoes need protection to be obtained at 20 francs a bushel. Coffee, wine, and bread. This is the food of most of Paris. The unequal suffering in Paris is increasing the tensions and hatred between those who can afford to eat and heat and those who can't, a sign that violent social conflict might just be on the horizon. This week, German guns turned their fire onto starving Paris civilians, and the French Armée de l'Est moves to relieve Belfort. Millions in France and Germany are asking themselves why the war is still going on. Militarily, it is essentially decided, as all French attempts to free Paris have failed, and only extremists like Gambetta still believe in a miraculous French victory. The war must end at some point. The question is, will it be next week? By the second week of January 1871, the French government is getting more and more desperate as every attempt to turn the tide in the war has failed. This week, the newly formed Army of the East continues its move towards the besieged fortress of Belfort, which is under constant bombardment by the Baden 14th Corps. If General Bourbaki's 150,000 men can defeat General von Werder's 50,000 Germans, the siege might be lifted, and the French could then threaten German lines of communication with their armies outside Paris. The Germans are aware of the danger and rush a new southern army to the area, but the French get there first. German troops are defending a mountain pass between the Vosges and Jura mountains, known as the Burgundian Gate which gives access to Alsace and Baden. They move siege artillery away from Belfort to the gate and smash the ice on the Lysen stream to prevent the French from crossing. And they construct a labyrinth of defensive works. A worried von Werder sends an urgent telegram to the German high command. I urgently ask if I must remain for long before Belfort, in the face of superior forces which seek to surround me. I think I can protect Alsace, but not Belfort as well, unless I am to put at risk the existence of my corps. The obligation to maintain the siege of Belfort deprives me of all freedom of movement. But before he receives the reply, which was to stay put and fight, the French attack on January 15th. In minus 14 degrees Celsius weather, the Battle of Belfort, also known as the Battle of Ericourt or the Battle of the Lysen, rages for three days while the garrison and civilians in the fortress listen anxiously to the cannon fire. The exhausted, demoralized and freezing French force the Germans back, but are unable to press their advantage. Thanks to intense rifle and artillery fire from entrenched positions, the Germans hold the line. The French lose about 8,000 men, and the Germans about 2,000. King Wilhelm messages von Werder that his victory is, quote, one of the greatest feats of arms of all times. French medic Daniel Seigneur notes the extremely low morale in the Armée de l'Est after the defeat. There is great agitation in a nameless disorder. Many men were already thinking of deserting, and acts of indiscipline are legion. Uniforms are sometimes abandoned in favor of pilfered civilian clothes, and weapons are thrown on the ground. Bourbaki is forced to withdraw, the siege of Belfort continues, and the fortress will eventually hold out until after the armistice is signed. 
The post-war Third Republic then creates the Belfort myth to glorify its defenders as symbols of national resistance and to help stabilize the state after its eventual defeat. Fortress commander Aristide d'Enfer Rochereau is made into a war hero, partly because of his famous message to the German general who requested the city's surrender back in November 1870. Nous connaissons aussi l'étendue de nos devoirs envers la France et envers la République, et nous sommes décidés à les remplir. We know the extent of our duties to France and to the Republic, and we are decided to fulfill them. In 1880, sculptor Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi creates the Lion of Belfort, an 11-meter-high stone memorial to commemorate the rare military success and Bartholdi is also the sculptor of the Statue of Liberty in New York. The Germans have stopped the demoralized army of the East, and this week, German commanders also sense the chance to crush another demoralized French army in the West. The French Armée de la Loire is still reeling from its defeats in recent weeks as it struggles to take up a new defensive position in front of Le Mans. General Chanzy wants to fight on and even orders a counterattack, but his army is in such a bad state that one corps commander is at a total loss. I really don't know what I'm going to do to make them march. If it is possible, we'll do it. Everyone says it can't be done, but we'll see. Thousands of French troops are already deserting, and the defensive works are far from complete. Chanzy even posts cavalry units behind the front lines to encourage his own men to stay at their posts. German commanders know the time is ripe to crush the demoralized and disorganized French units once and for all, so they go over to the attack. From January 10th to 12th, 75,000 Germans of the 2nd Army crash into the 150,000 inexperienced and badly equipped French troops of the Armée de la Loire at the Battle of Le Mans. Some of the Frenchmen are equipped with muzzle loaders left over from the US Civil War. After three days of fighting in harsh winter conditions and in dense forests, the French army is put to flight. 10,000 men are killed or wounded, and tens of thousands more French troops desert. French military power in the West is broken, and there is no hope of relieving Paris from the Loire. German soldier Karl Zeitz of the 2nd Thuringian Infantry Regiment No. 32 later recalls a touching moment while searching for wounded. He finds three Frenchmen in the forest, takes them prisoner, and learns their story. As night fell, one of them was hit by enemy fire. They feared that their friend might die in their arms, so they laid him in a hollow. Then the two good men crouched down to the left and right of the seriously wounded man, embraced him, and tried to protect him with their body heat. I could not find a more beautiful example of camaraderie and devotion than this. Zeitz helps carry the wounded Frenchman towards German lines but he dies on the way, and they bury him in the forest at midnight. Three soldiers, two French and one German, stood around the body of the man who had remained on the field of honor. Their prayers accompanied their departed comrade, and each placed a few branches on the fallen warrior. I have hardly ever been so moved by a funeral as I was by this one. Seitz also reports on a strange incident during the battle. A German patrol sneaks up on two young and obviously inexperienced French soldiers. They would make an easy kill, but the veteran German soldiers do not want to take the lives of a few young boys. Then one of the Germans puts his rifle aside, makes a huge snowball and throws it at the Frenchman's head. Astonished, the Frenchman turns around. Then. He accepts the strange fight with the happy blood of his nation. A snowball fight. Laughing and joking loudly, Germans and Frenchmen throw snowballs at each other. The noise attracted attention, and other men from both sides rushed to join in the strange fight. 
The snowball fight at Le Mans seems to have been a draw, but the French plans have failed on all fronts and civilians in Paris continue to suffer. This week brings more tragedy in the besieged and starving French capital. Parisian actress Sarah Bernard witnesses a tragedy of war. She sends a boy to fetch some medicine for some German wounded at her military hospital in the Odeon Theatre. As Bernard recalls in her diary, the child has just left her when he's blown apart by a German shell. When we came near the child, his poor entrails were spilled out onto the ground. His whole chest, his poor red and doll-like face, were stripped of their flesh. No more eyes, no more mouth, nothing. Nothing but hair at the end of a bloody long rag, a meter from his head. The poor boy was a senseless victim. Ce pauvre petit était un holocauste bien inutile. Meanwhile, wealthy writer Edmond de Goncourt feels a rare pang of empathy for his poorer countrymen. In his diary entry on January 13th, he wonders at their restraint in the face of injustice. One must give credit to the Parisian population and admire it. The insolent displays of the food merchants awkwardly remind the starving population that the rich can still get poultry game, and other delicacies. And yet the population does not smash the shop windows and doesn't lay a hand on the merchants or the merchandise. It's astonishing. Goncourt doesn't know it yet, but the population's restraint will not last forever. This week, the Germans smash the Armée de la Loire and the Armée de l'Est fails to relieve Belfort. The war is grinding slowly to an end. But before it does, German painter Anton von Werner receives an urgent telegram from the Crown Prince. If the artist can get to Paris next week, he'll have the chance to paint the birth of an empire. The proclamation is planned to take place at the Versailles Palace on January 18th, the 170th anniversary of the coronation of Prussia's first king. But Bismarck and soon-to-be German Emperor King Wilhelm I argue right up until the last minute. Wilhelm doesn't want to be emperor, objects to the wording of his future title, and refuses to take part in the planning of the proclamation ceremony or the new imperial coat of arms. The day before the proclamation, King Wilhelm, the Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm, Bismarck and the Minister of the Royal Household, Alexander von Schleinitz, meet to resolve the conflict. The Crown Prince mediates a three-hour discussion on whether the imperial title should be German Emperor, favoured by Bismarck, or Emperor of Germany, favoured by Wilhelm. The Crown Prince recalls the conversation. Bismarck sought to prove that the expression Kaiser von Deutschland, Emperor of Germany, meant a territorial power which we did not possess over the Reich at all. Whereas Deutscher Kaiser, German Emperor, on the other hand, was the natural consequence of the former Imperator Romanis. The king finally accepts German Emperor, but he's furious. On the topic of the new imperial flag, at least, all agree on keeping the black, white and red of the North German Confederation. This decision is a deliberate rejection of the black, red and gold of the Holy Roman Empire and the failed revolution of 1848-49. When the topic of Prussia's position within the empire becomes heated, the king throws a fit and storms out of the room. The crown prince is so stressed he's attended to by a doctor. Bismarck is stunned by the king's tantrum and cannot understand why the king resists, in Bismarck's view, a perfectly logical position. The morning of the proclamation, Bismarck meets with Grand Duke Friedrich von Baden. As the highest ranking prince at the ceremony, the Grand Duke will announce the proclamation. But Bismarck is shocked to discover that the Grand Duke wants to proclaim Wilhelm Emperor of Germany. With great difficulty, Bismarck convinces the Grand Duke to say German Emperor.
But the Chancellor can't be completely certain what the Grand Duke will actually proclaim when the historic moment comes. While the King, Chancellor and Crown Prince argue in Versailles, painter Anton von Werner receives a royal telegram that sends him into a tizzy. In the Grand Duchy of Baden, German painter Anton von Werner is busily working on his painting Moltke for Paris on January 15th. He takes a break to go ice skating, but is interrupted by the arrival of a messenger from the Crown Prince with an urgent telegram. His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, wishes to inform you that you will experience something worthy of your brush if you can arrive here before January 18th. Von Werner immediately boards a train for France and completes the last leg of the journey to Versailles by stagecoach with a Bavarian Jäger perched on top to protect him from franc -tireur. The artist has no idea what he's been called on to paint, but can barely contain his excitement when he arrives on January 17th. After a few hours sleep, the painter visits the Crown Prince at his villa early on January 18th. There, he receives a special pass, allowing him to visit the, quote, festivities at the palace. But when he arrives there, he still doesn't know that the brush-worthy event is the emperor's proclamation. He passes through the peace room, which is filled with officers. Then he enters the hall of mirrors and is amazed to see six to eight hundred people gathered there. He starts sketching the scene and barely notices the service that introduces the proclamation. Von Werner doesn't sugarcoat his disappointment with the presentation in his memoirs. And now, in the most pompous manner and with extraordinary brevity, the great historical event that signified the achievement of the war went ahead. Now the painter finally realizes that he is to paint the Emperor's proclamation. Years later, he recalls the scene. I turned my most rapt attention to the picturesque appearance of the Grand Duke. I noted down the most necessary things in haste, saw that King Wilhelm said something, and that Count Bismarck read out something longer in a wooden voice, but did not hear what it meant. I only awoke from my absorption when the Grand Duke of Baden called out in a loud voice, Long live His Majesty, Emperor Wilhelm the Victorious. Seine Majestät Kaiser Wilhelm der Siegreiche, er lebe hoch. Von Werner's distraction is understandable, but a clearer picture of the brief and sober proclamation is not quite as glorious as intended. The act of proclamation begins at noon and only takes an hour. The Hall of Mirrors had been used as a military hospital, but none of the attendees seems bothered by the bloodstains on the floors. First, the court preacher leads a short service, followed by an address by King Wilhelm. The king speaks from a carpeted wooden dais in front of the regimental flags of the Third Army, and flanked by the Crown Prince and the Grand Duke of Baden. Wilhelm doesn't know it, but several German nurses who work at the military hospital in Versailles are hiding behind the regimental flags just steps away. Bavarian Zara Hahn's account of events is breathless. He's coming closer. Who? The king, the emperor to be. Now he stands under his flags. Silent silence. For the first time in my life, I hear him speak, the celebrated one, the beloved of his people. Zum ersten Mal in meinem Leben höre ich ihn reden, den Gefeierten, den Geliebten seines Volkes. Bismarck then reads the declaration that von Werner barely hears, and the Grand Duke finally proclaims the Emperor. The sources are contradictory about the exact wording, except that he probably refers to, quote, Emperor Wilhelm to get around the problem of the imperial title. All present then shout hurrah, and the emperor steps down from the dais, accepts somewhat disorganized congratulations, 
and completely ignores Bismarck. Von Werner, who has no clue of the rift between the two men, is irritated. It seemed to me an intended défilé court of the officers present failed, and I then saw the Emperor descend the steps of the Esplanade past Bismarck, whom he did not seem to notice. The Crown Prince, on the other hand, is moved. I let my eyes wander up to the ceiling, where Louis XIV's self-glorifying artworks depicted the division of Germany in huge allegories and boastful inscriptions. I asked myself more than once whether it was really true that we were in Versailles to witness the restoration of the German Empire. So dreamlike did the whole thing seem to me. So traumartig wollte mir das Ganze erscheinen. The newly minted emperor is less enthusiastic as he writes his wife Augusta later that day. I have just returned from the palace after having performed the act of emperor. I cannot tell you how morose I was during these last days, partly because of the lofty responsibility I now have to assume, partly and above all over the pain of seeing the Prussian title pushed aside. Even Bismarck is annoyed as he tells his wife Johanna. This birth of the emperor was a difficult one, and kings have their strange desires in such times, like women before they give away to the world what they cannot keep. As a midwife, I several times felt the urgent need to be as a bomb and to burst so that the whole building would have gone to ruin. Necessary business attacks me little, but the unnecessary ones embitter me. As the ceremony ends, so does the hidden nurse's proximity to power. Zara Han and her colleagues rush to get out of the way unseen and return to the task of treating the wounded whose suffering has made the empire possible. News of the proclamation reaches frontline troops like Reserve Officer Ferdinand Fiebig of the Lower Rhine Fusilier Regiment No. 39 days later. Hurrahs were shouted, and certainly not only on command, but I cannot recall the jubilant enthusiasm that the regimental history reports. On the French side, no one is interested in Wilhelm's proclamation. That very day, writer Edmond de Goncourt notes in his diary that in Paris, weekly bread rations have been reduced to 400 grams per person. The French High Command is still trying to break the siege and save its honor, so it launches another doomed offensive at the Second Battle of Buzenval on January 19th. The French forces are able to briefly push some German units out of their trenches and take the local high ground, but as night falls, they cannot hold their gains and pull back. About 600 Germans and 4,000 Frenchmen are lost for the prestige of France including painter Henri Regnault and Arctic explorer Gustave Lambert. This week, King Wilhelm I of Prussia is proclaimed emperor of a united German empire at Versailles. The new empire also narrowly avoids an embarrassing constitutional crisis, when the Bavarian parliament gives its belated approval for the Reich constitution with a bare two-vote majority. Germany has been unified by this war, which will finally end next week. For after the failure at Buzenval, the French ask for an armistice. The French government of national defense is facing a catastrophic situation in late January 1871. Every attempt to break the siege of Paris has failed, and the Germans step up the bombardment of the city starting January 21st. The shortages of food, fuel, and medicine in Paris have caused mortality rates to skyrocket. More than 19,000 Parisians die in January 1871, nearly four times the pre-siege monthly deaths, although only 107 of these deaths are attributed directly to the bombardment. The political atmosphere is explosive, and the government fears that an uprising like the one that failed back in October 1870 might succeed if it breaks out again, 
In fact, there are already riots in the capital. All these factors have broken the French will to resist, and the government requests an armistice. Many Germans long for peace as well, and the population is tiring of the daily casualty lists in the papers. Writer Gustav Freitag sums up the mood. Restless and undaunted, the soldier marches on, but his bravery is no longer the fresh, warlike fire of August 1870, but the stern, firm grip of the worker who wants to bring things to an end. But when the German drives forward the endless lines of prisoners, and when he marches through the charred ruins of a French village, he looks indifferently on success and destruction. Only rarely is singing heard on the march and in billets. Negotiations for a ceasefire take several days. French Foreign Minister Jules Favre's weak position is made clear by his own troops who break out in a spontaneous can-can when they see him on his way to the peace talks. The Germans stop bombarding Paris on the 26th, and on January 28th, Favre and Bismarck agree to a three-week armistice that will take effect on the 31st. The Germans also start to deliver food to starving Parisians. German writer Friedrich Gerstecker witnesses the desperation firsthand. The people shouted to our soldiers, give us bread. Even the children stuck their heads through the barricade just to be a little closer to the Prussians, who'd been so feared until then, to get a piece of bread. Some of our soldiers, thank God only a few, took advantage of the poor people and sold the long but very light loaves of white bread for two, three, or even four francs. Those who had the money gave it, oh so willingly. But hundreds did not have it. Next to me stood an old soldier who slowly shook his head. To the devil with this war. Hold der Teufel den Krieg. But the Germans maintain the blockade of Paris even after the ceasefire to ensure that the terms are met. The French must clear the city's forts and disarm combatants, leave only 12,000 National Guardsmen under arms to maintain order, pay 200 million francs in war dues, and surrender the garrison's 200,000 chassepots and 2,000 guns. Parisian regiments may keep their standards and officers their swords. For French writer Edmond de Goncourt, the armistice is a disgrace. Ah, une main française a-t-elle pu signer cela? C'est bien la fin des grandeurs de la France. Ah, could a French hand have signed that? This is the end of the greatness of France. For the city's starving workers and poor, on the other hand, the ceasefire is a relief for the time being. The Paris government is surprised that Bismarck spares the city a total surrender. He does this to keep what he sees as a stable French government in office. The armistice even allows for French elections to take place on February 8th, in which residents of German-occupied and soon-to-be-annexed Alsace and Lorraine are allowed to vote. French voters send a majority of monarchist representatives to the Constituent Assembly in Bordeaux, while the radical left does poorly except in Paris. Conservative French voters in the provinces send a clear message to the new government. Sign a peace treaty and end radical political experimentation. The election is not necessarily against the Republic and in favor of restoring the monarchy, but it's a victory for the peace party and a defeat of bellicose politicians like Léon Gambetta. The new president is conservative liberal Adolphe Thiers, who the Germans find more reliable than the outgoing government of national defense, perhaps because he had previously been involved with negotiations with Bismarck at Versailles a few months ago. A ceasefire has silenced the guns in most of France at the end of January, but it does not apply to the East, where the French Armée de l'Est suffers a historic humiliation. The Army of the East has been advancing towards Alsace in the hope of relieving the besieged fortress of Belfort, but General Bourbaki's hesitation after battles at Villers Excel and on the Lysenne put his army in a hopeless situation in the non-armistice zone. 
Journalist Friedrich Engels suspects that this is all part of the German plan. In this unparalleled example, the conqueror, in true Prussian fashion, has extorted every concession which his momentary superiority allows him to. The armistice applies to the West, where Frederick Charles finds that he'd better not go beyond Le Mans. It applies to the North, where Goeben is held up by fortifications. But it does not apply to the Southeast, where Manteuffel's advance holds out the prospect of a second Sedan. French troops are freezing, hungry and sick, and morale is low after their defeats. Since the Germans cut off their escape routes to the west, they're trapped in mountainous terrain along the Swiss border. By January 26th, Bourbaki has lost all hope and attempts suicide. But the bullet grazes his skull and he survives. General Justin Quichin assumes command of the Army of the East in dire circumstances. They hear of the Paris Armistice, but don't know that they're excluded from it. So men and officers are confused when the Prussians continue to close in. After the final firefights cost 500 more French lives, on February 1st, 1871, the 87,000 men of the Army of the East escape into neutral Switzerland. Danish volunteer Wilhelm Dinesen notes the exasperation of a fellow French officer. This is not war, this is a masquerade. I'm going to Switzerland now. The Swiss disarm, in turn, feed and care for the exhausted French soldiers. Many of them are suffering from smallpox, which helps to set off an international outbreak that will kill hundreds of thousands. The flight of the Armée de l'Est is one of the most humiliating moments in French military history. It's commemorated today by the 1881 Bourbaki Panorama Museum in Lucerne and marks an important milestone in the development of the Swiss humanitarian tradition. The end of the Army of the East is also the end of combat in the Franco-Prussian War. In February, delegates extend the armistice and begin negotiations for a preliminary peace. And the Germans finally enter Paris. After more talks, on February 26th, Bismarck and Favre signed the preliminary peace. Germany annexes Alsace and part of Lorraine. France must pay war reparations of 5 billion francs, an enormous sum. German troops will be permitted to march into Paris and stay in France until the reparations are paid, which will turn out to be 1873. Most of the highly symbolic battlefields of 1870 are now in Germany except for Mars La Tour and Belfort. Another symbolic act is the German occupation of Paris on March 1st. 30,000 troops march into the city and the new Kaiser holds a victory parade. But they only stay for two days, since the National Assembly in Bordeaux immediately ratifies the preliminary peace. Even so, proud Parisians like Edmond de Goncourt feel humiliated having enemy troops quartered in their homes. My door opening and giving way to these Germans, this prospect makes me suffer and causes me physical pain. German soldier Karl Zeitz sees the brief occupation of Paris and the victory parade much differently. And now the thunder of the cannons also resounded. The battalions stood as if cast from iron. The emperor sprinted along the fronts, greeting them. In bright joy, in manly pride, the eyes of his soldiers shone towards him. Everyone was filled with a feeling of great pride at being able to carry our victorious arms into the heart of the enemy country. But glory and defeat are a dangerous mix. German painter Ludwig Pietsch is horrified to see the Paris crowds take revenge on French women thought to have talked or flirted with the Germans. They tear off the clothes of those unfortunates after they've beaten them bloody, or tie them together above their heads, brush and whip their naked bodies to the immense amusement of the heroes of freedom in the crowd. 
British journalist William Howard Russell is mistaken for a German and saved from an angry mob by the timely intervention of a French officer. The Treaty of Frankfurt formally ends the Franco-Prussian War on May 10th by confirming the terms of the preliminary peace signed in February. 45,000 Germans and 140,000 Frenchmen are dead. The United German Empire is now the strongest power on the continent, a power born of blood and iron rather than liberal democratic patriotism. Bismarck hopes to preserve these victories through diplomacy, but there's no guarantee that future German leaders will not also turn to blood and iron. France is a republic born of defeat, humiliation, and bitterness. In the decades to come, the peoples of Asia and Africa will pay the price for the restoration of French prestige through empire. But nationalists will also keep the open wound of revanchisme alive for a future reckoning with Germany. Although there will be peace among the powers until the fateful summer of 1914, in spring 1871, there is to be no peace within France. Even before the Frankfurt Treaty is signed, revolutionary zeal and workers' misery explodes in the Commune, Europe's first great socialist experiment that ends in a bloodbath of civil war. France and Germany finally end the Franco-Prussian War with the preliminary peace of February 1871. Most French citizens are relieved that the war is over, despite the controversial peace terms. But a radical minority in Paris is irreconcilable, even though the war has weakened their position. Leftist groups and revolutionary workers are on edge, and even steal weapons when the Germans leave the city on March 3rd and 4th. On March 10, 1871, the freshly elected government of Adolphe Thiers bans some leftist newspapers in Paris, lifts rent controls, and moves from Bordeaux to Versailles. The government know that Versailles and its palace are symbols of the monarchy that the Paris radicals detest, and the situation explodes. On March 18th, regular troops of the Versailles government try to take control of the artillery stationed on Montmartre from the National Guard. The National Guardsmen and local residents riot, and some government troops join the rebels. The revolutionaries seize the commanding officers and execute them. A worried Thiers orders the evacuation of the city, which earns him the criticism of writer and moderate Republican Victor Hugo. Thiers wanted to take back the Belleville cannons, but was tentative when he should have been bold. He's put a spark to the powder keg. He wanted to end the political struggle, but instead, he started a class war. En voulant éteindre la lutte politique, il a allumé la guerre sociale. Paris soon falls under control of the Commune, but it's not the only city to revolt in spring 1871. When the news of Paris spreads, communes rise up in Marseille, Lyon, Saint-Étienne, Le Creusot, Limoges, Narbonne, Toulouse, and Alger. But these are short-lived and don't really coordinate with Paris other than statements of support. Rural France mostly supports the government. Ideologically speaking, the Paris Commune members range from left liberal bourgeois to utopian socialism based more on the theories of socialist anarchist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon than those of Karl Marx. But there are many different and sometimes contradictory ideas amongst the communards. Its leaders include Gustave Florence, Louis-Auguste Blanqui, Charles de Lécluse, and Louise Michel. Many workers support the Commune because they're tired of poverty, suffering and hunger, and resent the dominance of the bourgeoisie who brought on the war with Prussia. The Commune tries to legitimize itself with elections, but these are marked by confusion and uncertainty, and only half of eligible voters participate. Still, the revolutionaries sit in the city hall and refuse to recognize the Versailles government. The two powers each view themselves as the future and the other as a remnant of the past. The communards think that they will bring freedom and justice and end misery, while the Versaillais are the Ancien Régime based on ignorant religion and malicious hierarchy. The Versaillais see themselves as rational and moderate, and the communards as a return to barbarous, violent popular revolt. Victor Hugo is critical of both. 
Bref, cette commune est aussi idiote que l'Assemblée est féroce. In short, this commune is as idiotic as the National Assembly is ferocious. Both sides are crazy, but France, Paris and the Republic will survive. The Commune sets out its program on April 19th in its declaration to the French people. Those who betrayed France and delivered Paris to the foreigner must bear the responsibility for the grief, suffering and misfortunes of which we are victim. Paris is again suffering for all of France and is fighting and sacrificing for intellectual, moral, administrative and economic regeneration, glory and prosperity. The Declaration goes on to list the Commune's goals, including the preservation of the Republic, the guarantee of individual rights and liberties, the guarantee of local autonomy for French communities to control budgets, taxes, policing, the courts, elections, local defence and the National Guard. But not all Parisians share these views. Most conservative and property-owning Parisians are against what they consider a violent political experiment. Wealthy actress Sarah Bernard falsely believes that the Germans are supporting the uprising, but also sees it as a catalyst. These calls to revolt, these anarchist cries, these howls of crowds shouting, down with the thrones, down with the republics, down with the rich, down with the Jews, down with the army, down with everything. These cries woke up the numb. It was terrible, but it was the awakening. It was life after death. Edmond de Goncourt is also fiercely opposed as he complains to his diary on March 19th. The Republic is decidedly a beautiful chimera of great thinking, generous, disinterested brains. It is not practicable with the evil and petty passions of the French rabble. For them, liberty, equality, fraternity, mean only the enslavement or death of the upper classes. Parisians like Bernard and de Goncourt live in fear during the Commune and fully support the Versailles government. De Goncourt is especially critical of the National Guards who've joined the rebels. To him, they were cowards in the face of the Prussians, but have now suddenly recovered their courage. Even today, some see the Commune as an early socialist experiment of a civic republic. But the Commune quickly sinks into a catastrophic mixture of extremism, egotistical and overwhelmed leadership, lack of an economic plan, poor administration and arbitrary terror against the rich and the church. On May 16th, for example, famous painter Gustave Courbet oversees the destruction of Napoleon I's Colonne Vendôme as a symbol of tyranny. But meanwhile, communard efforts to organize a systematic defense of Paris go nowhere. The leader of the war committee has no military experience, and members argue bitterly about nearly every topic. Member Ernest Lefebvre is elected to the commune, but leaves soon after. Ceci est le dilemme. Démissionnaire aujourd'hui, fusillé demain. Resign today, shot tomorrow. That is the dilemma. This commune is crazy, deliberations are in secret, and discussions take place revolver in hand. On the other hand, some of the communard policies can be seen as sensible and progressive. They pass laws against corrupt profiteering, to separate church and state, and for the equality of men and women. Radical teacher Louise Michel is one of the most prominent leaders of the commune, on an equal footing with her male counterparts. There are also efforts to improve working and living conditions for workers and for the poor. Militarily, the Commune relies on the National Guard battalions that have stayed in Paris according to the agreement with the Germans, along with untrained civilian volunteers. For two months, these forces fight against government troops at the gate of the city and the surrounding forts. The Versailles Army's artillery even shells Paris. Meanwhile, German troops are still stationed around the city to enforce the peace terms, and they stand idly by. In fact, the Versailles government even pays the Germans for guarding the perimeter. For Versailles, the Commune's rejection of the social order is a greater threat than the German army. The Thiers administration at Versailles and the revolutionary Commune at Paris City Hall are in a state of virtual civil war 
which comes to a head in one bloody week in May. On May 21st, the French government army, under the command of the same Marshal MacMahon who'd been defeated at Sedan, breaks into the city. There's fighting at hundreds of barricades, but the rebels are completely outmatched. The city burns, ostensibly set alight by communards called pétroleurs by the government and the international press. The Versailles troops massacre up to 35,000 disarmed communards, including women, in what is known as the Semaine Sanglante, the Bloody Week. General the Marquis de Gallifet proves to be a particularly merciless executioner and earns the nickname Le Fusilleur de la Commune, the executioner of the commune. The Comte d'Hérisson is happy to fight against the Red Commune, and he participates in the executions. It was useless to ask this bandit for further explanations. I had him taken away, and justice was done in the pit of the barricade, where all the rebel soldiers who'd been surprised by the sudden arrival of the troops had already been shot. German soldier Franz Plitt is among the German troops on the old siege ring who are witness to the chaos as communards flee the carnage. Dusk was already breaking when suddenly a mob of at least 500 armed insurgents, among them many horrible, depraved figures, women and crying children, came towards us. The people wanted to surrender to us, but as we were not authorized to take prisoners, they had to stand opposite us all night in the pouring rain. We were not allowed to put down our loaded rifles for the whole night. Some of the crowd aroused our deepest sympathy without us being able to help them in the least. The next day, French government troops take the communards opposite Plitt and execute them, including teenagers suspected of having taken part in the fighting. By May 28th, the commune is over, but the trauma of the 72-day revolt will affect those who experience it for decades to come. The government imprisons 40,000 more rebels and deports many of them to overseas colonies like New Caledonia. A graveyard peace reigns among the smoking ruins of France's once proud capital. Writer Edmond de Goncourt is relieved the commune is no more, but the destruction of the still-burning city depresses him. You walk in the smoke, you breathe an air that smells of burning and apartment varnish. And on all sides, you hear the sound of the pumps. In some places, there are still traces, horrible remains of the battle. Here's a dead horse. There, near the cobblestones of a half-demolished barricade, képi in a pool of blood. Des képi dans une mare de sang. Goncourt realizes that the brutality of government troops under MacMahon, the loser of Wörth and Sedan, is an attempt to redeem themselves of their own failures in the war with the blood of the communards. Even so, Goncourt cannot bring himself to explicitly condemn the mass executions. Danish adventurer Wilhelm Dinesen escapes his internment with Bourbaki's army in Switzerland and is also in Paris during the destruction of the commune. He sympathizes with the plight of the popular classes, but doesn't support either side. Dinesen has seen and done cruel things in war in 1864 and 1870, and is changed by the butchery that he sees in Paris. The Civil War shakes him more deeply than the other conflicts, and he writes an account in 1873 as a way of dealing with the trauma. The Franco-Prussian War began in 1870 as a cabinet war between kings became a people's war between nations, and ended in a French civil war between ideologies and classes. Writer Émile Zola later sums up the tragedy in his novel La Débâcle. It was the end of everything, an act of destiny, a mass of disasters such as no nation had ever suffered before. Continual defeats, lost provinces, billions to be paid, the most appalling of civil wars drowned in blood, rubble and death in full quarters, no more money, no more honor, a whole world to be rebuilt. Tout un monde à reconstruire. The commune and its destruction leave a complicated legacy. 
They deepened the suffering of the people of Paris, cost thousands of lives, and destroyed parts of one of the world's great cities. Some see it as another example of the murderous alliance of the bourgeoisie and military aristocrats against the common people and freedom. Others, as an early example of the totalitarian and violent nature of socialist utopias. Ideological symbolism aside, the French military tries to re-establish its honor by massacring the communards, whose naive and ideologically blinded leaders help bring on their own defeat. Parisians in 1871 are indeed faced with rebuilding their whole world.